What's up everybody, I'm Matt Gary, and in this episode of Coding with the Force, we're gonna go over absolutely everything that you need to know about the Apex Common Library, the Apex Mox Library, and the separation of concerns design principle that drives everything behind it so that you can start using these things in your org today. All right, guys. So in this first episode of this series on uh, separation of concerns, the first thing that I want to really go over with you is why and when you should use separation of concerns in Salesforce environments, what separation of concerns is, and I'm going to show you a simple example of separation of concerns in practice. This is going to be very simplified. I'm not going to show you... Um, the Apex Common Frameworks yet, and some of the more complicated concepts. I just want to drive home the really critical points without getting into some of the more confusing technical implementation of this. When I get into the next couple episodes uh, where we talk more in depth about the specific layers, we'll go over all the more complicated aspects of um, separation of concerns and you know whether or not they're worth it so um, all right so first thing on this video's list of things to cover why and when should you actually use separation of concerns should you use it in your Salesforce org um, the answer to that question is pretty simple in my opinion if you are in any capacity writing code in your org, you should be leveraging separation of concerns to some extent. Um, do you necessarily need to be using the Apex Commons framework or something like it? Maybe not. You know, if you're not uh, ever going to blow up into a giant org with lots of different uh, competing projects and, and stuff like that, you know, maybe not. Um, but you should still use the, the underlying concepts of separation of concerns for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. If you are an org that just has configuration, you don't use code at all, there's really not a whole lot of reason to start using separation of concerns definitely start organizing your configuration so that it's easier to work with. But Salesforce actually does a lot of the separation of concerns behind the scenes. Um, they implement this practice in their product. So if you're just using configuration, no need to deal with this. There's really no point, to be honest, at least in my opinion. But with that being said, um, you know, I, I've been in a I think 20, 24, 25 Salesforce instances now, I've never been in one without code. So chances are you should start using this as soon as you can. Um, why should you start using this as soon as you can? The reason that separation of concerns uh, or leveraging the, the design principle separation of concerns is useful is for two major reasons purposes. One, it makes it really, uh, really easy to update your code when you need to in the future. If you have some new business requirement that has to be implemented in your service layer or business layer of logic, if you've leveraged separation of concerns, no problem. Not a problem at all. Literally, couldn't be easier. <laughs> but if you haven't, uh, chances are you're probably going to have to go update code in a whole bunch of different places, and it's going to be a massive pain. Um, the second thing is it reduces uh, the amount of code that you have in your code base. So I've worked in a lot of orgs, uh, and I've come into a lot of bad things. And to be completely honest, I've done plenty of bad things myself when I was a more junior developer. You'll see things like you've got a whole bunch of business layer logic 
duplicated in multiple um, you know lightning web component apex controllers or visual force controllers or whatever else and every single time that you need to update some little you know some little thing right that your business needs changed you have to go update code in 15 different apex controllers because for some reason you've put that business logic in every single one of them instead of just putting it in one class and referencing it everywhere um, so again the two biggest benefits you'll see from this are ease of use changing code and a lot less code in your code base. So worth it. It's way super worth it if you're going to stay in an org for a long time. Um, okay, so now that we know what that is, what exactly, you know, or now, now that we know why and when to use separation of concerns, what exactly is separation of concerns um, basically it's it's like putting boundaries on your application uh, or the logic within your application right so um, for instance in your code you've got uh, you should really have four uh, let me give another example right uh, let me give a very generic example before I get into code related stuff so say for instance um, you are in a house right and you've got four people that live in that house and uh, you know they can all live together but it'd be nice if they had their own boundaries right so every person if you're lucky gets their own room and um, so that one person has a bedroom for them and then you know your mom or your dad or whoever has a room for them and you separate out your different concerns so your brother can deal with the concerns in his room and your sister can deal with the concerns in her room and you can deal with the concerns in your own room right it's kind of thinking like that but in terms of code so in code regardless of whether you're in Salesforce or you are in um, some other application stack you really have four you know you have four layers typically um, and those layers are your presentation layer your business logic layer your data access layer in your database layer but in Salesforce we call them uh, a we, those terms are a little bit different and I'll explain them in just a second uh, and it's because they've been coined different by the environment and most importantly you know Andrew Fawcett um, who kind of uh, I suppose brought all of this to attention in the Salesforce world and has obviously done quite a quite a few um, great things for it so in Salesforce we still have four layers but we call them things that are a little different so you still have the presentation layer um, but then you have the, what's called the service layer the domain layer and the selector layer so let's start with the presentation layer the presentation layer are things like um, your visual force pages with your apex controllers and your lightning web components aura components and if you're going on the more config side, there are things like layouts and um, flows and what have you, right? So basically, if we're talking about code anyway, Visual Force, Aura, Lightning Web Components, maybe if you're unlucky, S controls, and uh, Apex controllers. Then you have your uh, service layer, which is basically where all of your business logic resides, right? Um, and you'll put that into what's referred to as an Apex service class. Um, these could also be things like validation rules or this could be done in workflows too. But so service layer logic is your business layer logic. That's what's important. Um, and then you have your domain based layer or sorry, your domain layer, which is basically, you know, if you have uh, an object and that object always um, 
needs a specified set of actions to occur on it, you would put that in the domain layer. Um, and then additionally, uh, you have your apex triggers within the domain layer as well. So your trigger handlers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then past that, you've got the selector layer. And the selector layer basically acts as a way to query your data, right? Um, so basically, it serves to be an easy way for you to query for data on your various objects, right? It's, it's going to act to kind of simplify that a bit. And then there are other benefits to to separating these things into layers too, but we'll get into that in that layer later. <laughs> um, okay, so again, you've got your, uh, the layers in Salesforce are as follows: presentation layer, that's all the uh, wonderful custom Lightning web components and things you build. Service layer, that's your business logic, all your business specific code that has to execute your domain layer which again that is just uh like your trigger handlers your triggers um and any default logic that always occurs on an object and then your selector layer which just serves to make a very easy way for you to grab data from various objects um whenever you need to Right, so you don't duplicate your querying literally everywhere in your code. Um, all right, so now that we've gone over that, let me just show you a very, very simplified example of separation of concerns. Okay, so for this very simple example, I've created a very, very simple Lightning Web component that sits on the account object and does a couple things. So I'm going to zero this out so we can just see the full effect of this. But basically what this does is it calculates projected opportunity profits based on the opportunities attached to this account. So if I click this button, it generates that 70,500 and then it goes and updates this one opportunity, or sorry, this one account here, based on those uh, numbers that we generated from our opportunity. So, as this code stands at the moment, what we have is a very simple Lightning Web component, just a button and a paragraph tag, and the button calls this controller, this JavaScript controller method, which in turn calls this controller that has this display projected op profits method. Now, for this brief moment in time when I've created this, this is fine. No big deal, right? But now what happens when your trigger needs to be able to call this logic, right? Um, maybe all of a sudden your trigger needs to start calculating these op profits every once in a while. Or maybe you need a batch job overnight that calculates these op profits as well. Um, again, this is all theoretical, but you need to do that. Well, technically, I suppose, <laughs> you could call this controller and you could call this method from within the controller, but I don't really know that this screams out to me anyway that this is where my opportunity or sorry my account service or business logic resides right you know I mean you don't really just want your business logic lying around in here additionally because of the way that the controller would handle this scenario um, we're only passing in one account ID right we're, we're accepting a single account ID which is fine for a Lightning Web component or an Aura component or a Visual Force page, but it's not really fine when you're trying to bulkify things, right? Um, but ideally, you'd want to pass in like a set of account IDs to be able to, you know, calculate it for all the different opportunities, and you'd want this code to be bulkified, etc., 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 right? So basically, what we do. Um, to 
to handle this and make it so that we only have to write this code once uh, in one single place, basically, is grab all this code and we'd create an account service layer over here, which I've already created. So we'd create an account service class. Again, this is a very, very simple implementation. We're not going over um, Apex Commons yet, which will get a little bit more complicated. Um, but just for a basic understanding here, we've got our account service class, which is theoretically going to house our business logic and we're sending it in a set of account IDs instead of just one single ID. Um, and I've already updated this query so that now instead of it just looking for that one ID, it's looking for all the account um, IDs. Now you'd have to update this for loop too so that you only calculated things for the account ID uh, for that specific account right and you'd have to change the way that these total net profits are being calculated there's a lot of things that you would need to change right for this to work in a bulkified manner um, but once you got that in place uh, you'd be able to have this one method for this service uh, or sorry for your account that would be able to calculate these opportunity profits for everywhere in your system not just here in this controller right and that might not seem like a big deal right now if you're just building a brand new Salesforce instance and you only have it you know a couple things in there but I guarantee at some point if you don't do this now you'll likely have to do this in the future where you have to take what you built in some controller that you've made and put it into a service class to bulkify it uh, and, and bulkify it so that anything can potentially access it and deal with uh, and, and get data returned to it. Um, and if you don't structure it in this way, you're going to have, you know, multiple places where you do this exact same logic over and over and over again right you're gonna have a new controller eventually that needs to grab these profits um, you're going to have the batch class like I said before that needs to generate these profits uh, among lots of other things and additionally when you only have one place where these things are calculated it's easier to go update them, right? Now I've just got this one account service where I calculate these things in a bulk fashion. And if I ever need to update it, right, I've just got this one method. It's just this one method now. I can come to it. I know that just this one method in the service class that has all of my business logic in it um, is where to go to update this particular function no matter where I am, whether I'm on a controller, whether I'm in a batch class, whether I'm in a trigger, wherever I might be, I come here to update the logic. And if you're doing integrations with Salesforce, then this becomes even more important, right? Um, would you really want an integration looking to a controller for a Lightning Web component? No. If something was integrating with your instance, you'd, you'd ideally want it to, to connect to something like this business layer, uh, the service layer that could, you know, allow it to calculate opportunity profits or whatever that might be, right? And so now, you know, if we came back to this controller, right, and we use this account service, which I realize this code isn't technically bulkified yet, but you get the picture, right? <laughs> Um, you could just say something as simple as this. You could do return um, uh, account service dot calculate projected opportunity profits. Then you'd say new set IDs and give it the account ID. And that's it. Um, you could also, you know, put this in a try catch block now. Um, 
something like that. Oh my gosh, I gotta fix my gotta fix my autocomplete for this project. <laughs> um, and you could do something uh, very simple to say throw new aura handled exception and uh, whoa. and then have that return to the controller right so pretty like very simple uh, stuff but it just makes your code a lot easier to reuse and I know this is a very simple example and in the in the the videos that are upcoming where I'll go over each individual uh, layer, the domain layer, the service layer, the selector layer. This will get a lot more complicated and we'll go over a lot more advanced topics, but just as a as a very simple introduction here, this is why this is beneficial because then everywhere you just kind of call this one place. It's all in this one centralized location. Um, making updates to this centralized location is simple. And when you start using uh, interfaces and um, other patterns with this code, it actually becomes easier and easier and easier and easier to just replace this code whenever you want to replace it. Um, but anyway, simple example. Uh, so hopefully this has kind of helped you grasp how this can be beneficial if you move to start leveraging it in your code base within your Salesforce org. All right, guys, so welcome to episode two of the Separation of Concerns tutorial series that I'm putting together for you all so that hopefully uh, it is easier for all of you to implement the Separation of Concerns design principle in your respective Salesforce orgs. So in this video, I just wanna kinda go over what the Apex Common Library is. Uh, why you might want to use it and how it fits into the larger picture of separation of concerns. Uh, I'm also probably going to go over a couple of things that is important for you to know that we'll go over in subsequent videos. So, um, first things first, what is the Apex Common Library? Uh, the Apex Common Library is an open source library, so all that really means to simplify it anyway is that you can leverage this library for free uh, you can come here to this page that I'm showing you right now that I'll put in the link in the description and place the code in your org uh, to be able to leverage it but uh, what is it exactly it is a library that provides an excellent groundwork for you to be able to leverage separation of concerns uh, within your Salesforce org, uh, specifically in your code base. So, um, an important thing that I think a lot of people get confused about is that, like I just said, this is just a foundational layer for separation of concerns. You don't like download this library and then you just magically have separation of concerns in your org. You still have to do a lot of, of work, and we'll go over all the work that has to be done in later videos, but um, basically what this does is it sets an, an excellent foundation of um, that allows you to implement separation of concerns in your org. And um, yeah, so it's just an important distinction. I think this library gets a lot of, uh, there's a lot of confusion around what it does um, and I think that's really just primarily because there's not a lot of good publicly available resources explaining this Apex Common Library, how to implement it, all that kind of stuff. The, basically, the only thing that exists is Andrew Fawcett's book, or Andy Fawcett's book, um, which goes over the Apex Common Library pretty in-depth. Um, but it's kind of an expensive book. That being said, I mean, it is a big book and it does have a lot of great information. Additionally, it's very hard to get through. So, you know, I've read basically the entire thing, but it was 
it's not an easy read. <laughs> so um, while it's an excellent contribution and it does make it easy to understand this library, it is pretty much the only way to learn this library currently if you want to learn it. Um, and uh, so I think most of the community is just a little confused, like, cool, this nice library exists to create a foundation for separation of concerns in my org, but what does that mean, and how do I implement it? Well, um, that's what this series is kind of for, so, you know, stick around, and I'll show you all, you know, at least most of the things. Um, as far as why you would want to use it, you would want to use this library because there's really no point in reinventing the wheel, right? If you want to implement separation of concerns in your org, which I just want to tell you right now, you do want to implement separation of concerns in your org. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, even if you don't see that now, you're going to see it eventually if your org doesn't tank and die in a year or something. Um, if you want to implement separation of concerns, there's a lot of stuff you have to take into consideration if you want to be able to do it to the best of your ability, right? Uh, if you went out and did this on your own, chances are you'd probably do okay, um, but this just has so much in it that's pre-built that's quite frankly pretty excellent uh, considering you know, how much thought and effort had to go into <laughs> figuring out, you know, how you can, how you can create these service domain and uh, selector layers in a way that's, you know, basically universally acceptable for any org implementation or managed package implementation that you could think of, right? So it's, you know, basically why reinvent the wheel? Uh, if you want to implement separation of concerns, this library exists. It's excellent. Either use it or another library like it. Um, don't try and, you know, reinvent that foundational layer for separation of concerns implementation. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we covered the what. Uh, we covered the why. What am I on now? The third thing I was going to talk about is how this fits into the larger picture of separation of concerns, but I'm pretty sure that from all the talking earlier, you've probably got the picture, right? Um, so, past that, uh, there are a few things that are important that you understand uh, ahead of time before you try to start implementing this library. Um... There are four object-oriented programming concepts that are very prevalent in this library that are, I suppose, pretty important that you understand if you're not familiar with them. Uh, I will have tutorials on them eventually. I'm not sure they'll be part of this series in particular, but you do need to understand what inheritance is, uh, what polymorphism is, what encapsulation is, and what interfaces are. And I'm not going to go super in-depth with those, but I'll just briefly explain what they are. You know, inheritance is when basically a class in inherits um, publicly accessible methods and variables from a, a parent class, right? So and I have this cases class that extends the FFlib S object domain, which is one of the major classes in that library that you'll need to familiarize yourself with. And basically what I'm doing here is by extending this class, I am inheriting all of its publicly accessible methods and variables uh, within it, right? Um, and that's pretty important. Um, it's important that you understand this this principle because this is how the foundational layer is set up through this 
um, inheritance concept of object-oriented programming. Uh, the second thing that is important for you to understand, right, uh, I guess I've already gone over them, but polymorphism. Uh, and polymorphism basically says, you know, it's, it, basically it's when a class uses overloaded methods or overrides uh, and inherited classes methods, right? So there is a lot of polymorphism that will be taking place when you are building out your your subclasses, right? So this cases class is a subclass of fflib s object domain, um, and within the fflib s object domain there is a method called on apply defaults that I have the ability to override and and give my own implementation of for this cases class. Um, and this is basically polymorphic behavior, right? So for this subclass, I'm saying, okay, forget about your original implementation in this fflibs object domain class, I want to make my own, and I want it to, I want it to run the way that is appropriate for, for this cases class, right? So polymorphism really important to understand. Another uh, pretty important concept to understand is encapsulation. Um, basically, you know, only making available methods that uh, you need to be available to implement your or really that you need to make available for other classes to use it right so uh, say for instance I didn't need this on validate method to be publicly available which in all likelihood maybe I don't uh, I could set this as private and that would encapsulate it so that only this class had access to it uh, right this this cases class had access to it and it's important that that you do this uh, especially in your service layer uh, and well really every layer but especially in your service layer and your um, domain layers because if you don't it's you know, you're opening up your code to be leveraged in ways that it was not intended to be leveraged, right? So understanding encapsulation is super important. Otherwise, you could implement all this stuff and still not really do it appropriately and, you know, in a bit of a dangerous way, I suppose. Uh, and then the other thing that's important is just understanding what interfaces are and how to implement an interface, right? Uh, basically, an interface more or less is a contract that's saying, hey, um, let's see if I have this up. No, I don't, but I don't have anything in here. But say, for instance, I said, um, you know, I declared a, a method in here, like, uh, let's see, list. Get accounts or something along those lines, right? Say, for instance, in this interface, I just add this one method signature in here, right? Well, in this cases class now, you can see it's complaining. It's like, hey, uh, you haven't implemented this, this method. And so to appropriately implement the interface, I need to create this method signature. Do, do, do. Uh, list account get accounts. And now it'll stop complaining, right? Um, because I've now implemented this interface and it's happy about it, although I'm not returning a list of accounts currently in this method, so it's still a little upset. But 
basically, those are the four most important things that you understand, right? Those four object-oriented programming concepts are going to be pretty important uh, for you to have a grasp on. Uh, and there are some other important things that we'll talk about in the other videos that have to do with typing, right? Um, this class is now of type cases interface if I wanted to type it that way, but we'll get into that eventually. You can kind of see this done here. Um, there are also four design patterns that are important for you to understand just so that you don't get lost or confused, I suppose, whenever we go over the different layers. Um, I also eventually will create tutorials on these, although I'm not exactly sure if they fit into this tutorial series. Um, they'll probably be in one where I kind of go over object-oriented design principles and uh, or maybe one with design patterns, we'll see. But there are four um, design patterns, the factory design pattern, the unit of work design pattern, the template method design pattern, and the builder pattern. And the factory design pattern is important because one of the major classes, the FFLib, <clears throat> oh, where is it? Application class uses the factory pattern pretty heavily in it. Uh, you can even see their method declarations or unit of work factory, things along those lines, right? So you can imagine the, the factory pattern is pretty prevalent, um, at least within the FFLib application class, which is one of the four major classes that you should, you know, familiarize yourself with. Um, there's also the unit of work design pattern class, which, of course, is very prevalent and yet uh, in the second of the major classes to familiarize yourself within this library, which is the FFLib SFS object unit of work class. Um, it uses the unit of work design pattern to basically register all of the inserts and updates that you might be doing in a in an Apex transaction uh, or in the same executional context uh, and basically handle all of those at the exact same time. If you're not familiar with what the unit of work pattern is, um, it's pretty... It's very important, I would say, to leverage this library. The third design pattern is the temp template method design pattern, uh, which is prevalent in the third major class uh, in this library, which is the FFLib S object domain. Uh, it uses the template design pattern or template method design pattern uh, pretty heavily in it so if you want to you know look at this class and not get confused by how it operates it is important to understand that design pattern and last but not least the fourth design pattern and the fourth major class to familiarize yourself with in this library uh, is the builder pattern which is well it's used within the fflib s object selector class right um and it's used down in the query factory wherever that is <laughs> in here so there is a um <clears throat> Query factory that you can use to basically build your queries in a, a, a really nice way. And it uses the uh, builder pattern. And uh, yeah, so if you want to look through this this code base here in the S object selector and not be, you know, kind of confused every once in a while, if you take the time to learn what the builder pattern is, then this class will be... Um, you know, not as big of a deal to take a look through and, and get used to. So, um, those are the major things that, you know, if you have familiar familiarity, maybe I said that right, 
uh, with those four design patterns and those four object-oriented concepts, um, you'll be a lot more successful implementing this library in your org. And uh, just to reiterate it, I, I kind of went over it when we were looking through this. There are four major classes that are more important than any other classes in this entire gigantic library that you see here. I guess it's not gigantic, but it's a lot of classes. There are four major classes that you need to familiarize yourself. The FFlib application class, the FFlib S object unit of work class, the FFlib S object domain class, and the FFlib S object selector class. These are the ones that you're going to be working with virtually 100% of the time uh, until you get into mocking. And um, then technically that's a different library. That's the Apex Mocks library. But these are the important ones. If you familiarize yourself with these classes, the methods available within them for you to leverage um, and how they work, then it's going to be pretty easy for you to deal with whatever you need to deal with um, you know, when you're, you're messing around with this library. Oh yeah, one other thing I just want to go over real quick, um, because I think a lot of people are concerned about this and maybe don't understand this or whatever. This Apex Common Library is no longer owned by Financial Force. It's not like maintained by them. They don't really actually have anything to do with it anymore. Uh, the only reason that the FFLib exists in front of Apex Common anymore is purely 110% for backwards compatibility. Um, that's it. The financial Force has nothing to do with this. Um, it's just really an artifact of its origins from Andy Fawcett's time there at Financial Force. So uh, just for those who might be concerned about that, uh, don't be. It's open to the public. It'll always be open to the public. It's not really even associated with Financial Force anymore. It just has this here for backwards compatibility purposes. So for those who are concerned, please uh, be concerned no more. <laughs> All right, guys. So welcome to episode three of the Separation of Concerns tutorial series that I am putting together for the Salesforce ecosystem. So that hopefully using Separation of Concerns um, and the separation of concerns design principle in your org, as well as potentially leveraging the Apex Common Library in your org, is a lot less confusing and easier to do. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, today we're going to go over the factory pattern, or the factory method pattern, and um, you know why you might use it, how it fits into this topic of separation of concerns, and how it fits into the Apex Common Library. So, um, all right, so the first thing that I always do in these videos, as I'm sure you're aware by now, is explain why you would care to learn the factory um, method pattern. You know, what are the benefits of it? The biggest benefit of the factory method pattern is that you do not have to declare, um, <clears throat> you know, a concrete class type, uh, you know, in your code. So wh what do I mean by that? Like, Normally, if I wanted to initialize a class, I would do something like this. Uh, task class equals new task service, <laughs> task service info, right? That's the name of <clears throat> this class over here that we're going to go over in, in a little bit. But anyway, so we've got, you know, n normally you'd have to initialize a class like this, right? But what if there was a way to do this dynamically at runtime? As in, you don't really know what this class is, um, but you want to initialize it depending on your situation at runtime, right? Um, you know, the situation might be that the user is of a specific type or the object is of a specific type or whatever else. Right, I think one of the most common examples that everybody gives for the factory method pattern is, you know, say you're building a video game and you have 
um, some animals that spawn in your video game, right? <clears throat> and you want them to just kind of spawn randomly, okay? Um, you don't want the same animal to just spawn all the time or to spawn in the same place or blah, 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 whatever. So you create an animal type class and then you you have your maybe your dog and your cat class implement that animal class and um, or rather animal interface could be a virtual class one of the two doesn't particularly matter but then at that point they um, your code can randomly choose you know okay uh, I want to spawn a cat or a dog at this moment in time given these situations that really doesn't apply to Salesforce so the one that I always like to use that because I think it's most um, most common I, well it's, a, it's it's the most common like implement implementation thing I can think up of anyway um, almost every single org uses the task object right and the task object can relate to any object in your org. can relate to an account, a contact, a case, uh, some custom object you built. It doesn't particularly matter. And oftentimes, you'll have tasks automatically created for users. You know, a case is created, so then the task is automatically made to contact the customer that made the case or whatever, right? So maybe we want to build a task creation service that at runtime chooses the right task creation method based on an object that you pass it um, and then runs that method and generates tasks for that specific object right uh, and we're gonna go over how to theoretically build that in just a minute um, but basically it allows you to build the factory method pattern allows you to build more abstract classes right um, that can kind of adapt to change really easily all right so now that we've gone over that let's just go over a quick example of you know leveraging the factory method pattern in a Salesforce type scenario right you know how how would we leverage or how would we leverage the factory method pattern in Salesforce like you know makes sense it makes a lot of sense in in video games and things where you randomly spawn stuff or whatever else but how do you change gears from that all too common example to one that is more Salesforce focused and just you know I guess business oriented instead of random generator game stuff all right so like I said before the example I always go with is tasks right tasks often have to be created in different ways for different objects in your system you could have 50 different objects that create tasks automatically you know I don't know maybe not but yeah at least five or six right and maybe you want to put a, um, I don't know, a create task button on your object somewhere, uh, on your object page layouts. Um, and you want that task button to be abstract, right? Abstract in a way that it can, you can just drop it on that page layout, and if somebody clicks that button, it's going to create a task um, in the right way for the specific object type that you're currently on so in my Salesforce instance on the contacts object and the case object I have placed this generic create tasks component um, we can see it on the case uh, case record too there's this generic create task component and if we take a look at the page and click on this, you can see it's the 
It's a lightning web component I built called the abstract task creator. Now, for each of these object types, I would like different things to happen, right? For a contact where I create a case, I want it, you know, to create it with different parameters and stuff than, than when I create tasks on, create tasks automatically on the case object, right? So I really have two options here. I can use the factory method pattern um, or I could create um, basically a big if else statement that goes on and on and on and I have to update every single time that I add this create task to you know a new object type maybe accounts maybe leads maybe opportunities in the future I don't really know who knows um, <clears throat> what my code will be required to do in the future, right? So let's just take a look at the easy route, right? If I didn't use the factory method pattern, so uh, we'll say abstract task creator. Uh, actually, we can just say task service no factory right and basically what would end up happening is you'd have a method that was your you know task creator uh, you know I gotta put the right things in here though for simplicity we'll make it void so we've got our task creator method that we're gonna uh, build here and <clears throat> we're going to have it send in a um, schema.sr right? Yes, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm not crazy. Um, object type. Cool. And then basically what we would end up doing is we'd say, you know, theoretically we'd have a bunch of domain classes or something that um, we could call for each object and so we'd say something like <clears throat> if object type equals equals case dot s object type then call the case domain class um, dot create tasks method right now obviously the case domain class doesn't actually exist for me I guess I do have one um, it's called cases I could just randomly initialize this one and call the create task method right so I could just call this cases dot create tasks and pass it the parameters that it wanted <clears throat> cases is a domain class we'll go over domain classes um, in a few episodes and exactly what they are but more or less a domain class is like a trigger handler that also handles object behavior um, it's uh, domain classes are on an object by object basis right so anyway again back to this example of a task service without a factory so for every single one of these types that you might put it on you know you keep saying something like else if contact s object type then you'd call the contact domain class to create tasks etc etc right so if we had like <clears throat> we had an account s object type then we'd call the accounts domain class and create tasks over and over and over and over right every single time you wanted to put this on another object you'd have to call you'd have to set up something like this and it span who knows how many lines if you ended up putting it on 50 objects you'd do this 50 different times and your code would become enormous but what if we had a way to just like, you know, say, okay, right now we are working with a, an 
a case s object type and let's just dynamically create at runtime the right domain class right and and do that in a single line figure out okay at runtime we are dealing with a contact object type and will dynamically create a domain class that represents you know the contact right so <clears throat> that's kind of what this example here is so basically I've created a task service that is leveraging the factory pattern to reduce my code and <clears throat> if I removed all of the comments in here which I'll just do real quick and then I'll reverse it um, if I removed all the comments in here you can see that uh, and if we did just the exact same amount of stuff let's remove all the other junk so <clears throat> Let's see here. Oh, I still need one of these. That guy. Okay. So if I removed everything else from here, um, just pretend I don't need a unit of work and I'm creating tests. The yeah, like the other one. Um, you can see this is a very small class, right? When compared to to this one, this this one could span forever. This one that leverages the factory method pattern, it, it it won't it won't ever grow. This is it. Yeah, you're gonna build this one time. It's gonna figure out what new instance of a domain class I want to create, and then it's gonna call the create task method on that. And that's that's it. I mean, you're never gonna have to change this ever again. It's pretty um, flexible and. And uh, you know, ready, I guess, for any future permutations that that you could potentially make. So um, let's just take a look at this and figure out how this actually works, right? How, how does this this line right here specifically is the thing that kind of does the majority of the work? But let's figure out what this is and how this works. So the first thing we need to do is take a look at this application class and the domain um, uh, variable within it, right? So we're going to go over this a lot more in the next video, but this application class um, is something that you create when you're doing or when you're using the Apex Common Library. And basically it allows you to create these different factories for your different layers so that you can dynamically create them at runtime based on you know an object type or or something along those lines right so in this application class we have this domain variable that is of type application domain factory and here we pass it the application selector this thing right here but this is less important we won't really go over this so much now what's more important is right here we also pass it this map of s object type to type and basically what this allows us to do is say all right um if we are working with a case object right now we can pass it the case domains constructor class which I also know is a little difficult to follow just yet, but the case domain constructor class is right here. It's an inner class that kind of helps with um, <clears throat> constructing these new instances. But more or less, let's just keep it simple. If I pass into this FFlib application domain factory, the case as object type. I'm going to get back a new instance, a new instance of cases. This guy, this class right here. More or less, that's what this is saying. We don't need to go into any of the details. Just know that 
if I'm um, <clears throat> calling this um, variable and I pass it in the new instance method that is part of this application domain factory. So if we come back over here to the FFLib application class in the domain factory inner class in here, there are these methods that are called new instance where you can send it a set of record IDs or a list of records or some uh, you know other variations of um, uh, parameters to construct a new instance of your domain class. So basically what we're saying here is hey I want a new instance uh, based on my set of record IDs and then what this is going to go out and do more or less is it's gonna go out and figure out hey these record IDs are of type case that I passed in and I need to create a new instance of that cases class. That's basically what it's going to do. More or less, you're going to pass it some record IDs. Those record IDs are going to be of type case or whatever. And then it's going to go find the correct class to initialize based on you know, the, the object type that you passed in or the object type of the records that you passed in. Okay? I know that's a little confusing. The more you go through this video tutorial series, I promise it will be become less and less confusing. But it takes time to kind of grasp this concept. So, um, <clears throat> basically, again, what I'm doing is saying, I want a new instance of my case class to be returned to me based on the record IDs. Oh, actually, sorry. I want a new instance of my do of a domain class to be returned to me based on the record IDs that I pass in here. Okay, those record IDs could be of any object type. I have no idea. It could be of 30, you know, we could put this create task button on 30 different objects. Um, and as long as we continually update this map to say, you know, if we added a new <coughs> count uh, s object type, if we added a new domain class for the for accounts, then you know we could also pass in the account object type to be dynamically generated here with this call, right? So anyway, basically, again, we're asking for a domain that is determined by the record IDs at runtime. And you might be wondering what this FFLib IS object domain class is. If you're using um, Apex Common, uh, all of your domain classes, you're basically trigger handlers with object behavior associated as well. They should extend this FFLibS object domain and it that class implements the FFLibIS object domain. Okay. If you're not familiar with what implementing an interface is or how that benefits you, let me just make it really, really, really simple. If you implement an interface, your class, or, or you extend something that implements an interface, your class um, can now be of that interface type. And the reason that your class can be of that interface type is because an interface forces you contractually to implement the methods in it. So if I implemented the FFLibIS object domain class, I have to, for my class to be able to compile and for me to save it, implement S object type in, in the git rep records um, method. If I don't, I cannot implement this domain. I can't, or sorry, this, um, I can't implement this interface. 
I won't be able to save the class and you know whatever else so that's important because if I implement uh, you know if I implement that class like th this one does here that means that I know I can run these methods right I, they have to be there uh, um, and and more importantly it means that I am definitively of this type right I, I can be declared as this interface type so I know it's a lot of words and this is really confusing if you're not um, familiar with object-oriented programming concepts but what I'll say is if you are confused about how this specific aspect works um, go check out the github articles that I wrote on this stuff because it goes way more in depth I guess on, on some of these topics and feel free to ask me questions too I'm happy to answer them so all right <laughs> so we've got our new domain instance right and now we want to be able to determine whether or not that domain should create tasks okay well we're going to do the same thing here we're going to say if the domain that we randomly generated here is an instance of the task creator interface meaning more or less that it implements the task creator interface like this and if it does we want to call the create tasks method right so again let me just show you task creator interface because I implemented this I have to absolutely have to put this in the class that implements it so let me just show you if I delete this method here and tried to save this uh, well Uh, 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 uh. I haven't saved stuff in a while. Um, let's just ignore that everything in the whole world failed. And all right, so if we bring up the error log that I know you can't see over there right now, uh, down here it says class cases must implement the fflib is i s object unit of work task creator interface create task method um, or you know it can't be deployed that's what that says uh, down there I know it's a little hard to read oh okay there we go cool um, but that's what that says right down here right you've got to implement that method that we just deleted important stuff very critical in learning the benefits of interfaces okay so um, now we've put our create task back in a place we come back over here and if you take a look at this right if we know for sure that we are if the, the object domain also implements the task creator interface we can call the create task method because as we just saw you have to implement that method, right? Absolutely must implement that create task method. If you don't, you can't be of type task creator interface. You can't save it, it won't work. Nothing's gonna work out for you. So we're checking to see, okay, does this object domain that we randomly made um, implement the task creator interface? If it does, then we need to call the task creator create tasks method and that's mostly it right um, because of really two things interfaces which are magical uh, if you don't understand them please take a little bit more time to go understand them because you will benefit from them in in a lot of ways I promise once you figure them out um, because of interfaces which allow you to kind of declare a less concrete um, 
types, right? Uh, every single domain is of type. Every single domain I make, at least for the Apex Common Library, is going to be uh, of FFlib IS object domain uh, type because it's implement that this class implements that interface. So it's easy for me to declare that here <clears throat> using that interface type. I grab my domain, check to see if my domain implements the task creator interface. If it does, call the create task method and get my job done. Uh, pretty cool stuff, right? Uh, and again, this is all very dynamic. So, you know, in the future, if I ever wanted to extend this, to accounts like I, like we were talking about I would just create a new account domain class have it extend fflib s object domain have it implement the task creator interface <clears throat> and then implement this create task method right and have it do its own thing for for that specific object type <clears throat> so let's just real quick see how this works. Uh, I guess I didn't show you the abstract tr abstract task creator controller. Um, basically all it's going to end up doing is calling the create task method and um, and that's it pretty much. So let's just uh, figure that out. So we're going to call the this I'm not going to go over all of this how this works yet this will we'll cover this more in the service <laughs> class method or um, video but this task service dot create task through the use of the factory pattern basically just eventually calls this method so let's go see if I created a new ta uh, task on cases I want it to end up being uh, end up with a status of new uh, the subject should be origin plus subject who ID should be the contact ID and the activity date should be today so let's just check that out um, I don't remember what I query for exactly I think all open cases or new ones so let's just hit the create task button and you can see it did do that um, phone hi so that's the uh, case origin plus the whatever else I put in there case subject um, and the contact ID looks like it put related contact stuff in there if there was something so it looks like our task creation for the case object worked right and if we go actually back over here to our contacts if we take a look at if we take a look at the contacts domain wherever that is we want the subject for the or the task status to be new the subject to be contact name so if we create the tasks we can see that the subject is the the um, contact name, etc. Right? Uh, <laughs> I think that my list that I built very quick is pulling in everything, including contact or case stuff that's assigned to me for the day. So, um, you know, should have done a little better on the list. But anyway, the uh, core stuff is there. Looks like we created those tasks appropriately and and all that magical stuff. So, uh, yeah, that is it. Um, I know this is a very confusing topic, but as you can see, you know, if you take the time to really sit down and understand the benefits of the factory method pattern, it can just 
drastically improve your code base, right? This is such a small amount of code that anywhere can call, right? Any Anywhere can call, and it will execute in different ways based on, you know, what object is being passed to it. Whereas if I didn't do that, right, I have to declare all these if-else statements and all this gigantic branching logic um, they could get pretty massive otherwise, right? So, factory method pattern. Extremely beneficial in reducing code. Excellent at allowing you to have your code change dynamically during the course of its operation, right? Um, so, Take the time to learn it. <laughs> Hopefully this maybe helped a little bit. I know it's very confusing. It, it was not something that took me a, a short amount of time to comprehend. But hopefully this, you know, kind of helps you figure out how to frame this in the context of Salesforce specifically and then, you know, what the benefits of, of using the factory method pattern are. Um, yeah, so if you're confused at all, uh, I do have a GitHub wiki that goes over this stuff in a, in a lot more detail. And, um, you know, I have the same thing on my blog as well, Same, basically the same stuff, just, you know, people who prefer to read a blog instead of a wiki. I don't know who they are. <laughs> but uh, just in case, you know, I've got it in both places. So you can check out the description in the video to, um, I guess, read more about it. And, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's it. Hopefully this helped a little. <laughs> I really hope anyway. All right, guys, so welcome to the fourth episode of this Separation of Concerns and Apex Common tutorial series that I am putting together to hopefully make both of these things a little easier to implement in your Salesforce org and a little less confusing as well hopefully I don't know <laughs> some people think these make things easier some people don't think they work at all but uh, you get to figure that out for yourself I guess <laughs> all right anyway um, so the uh, FFlib application class what is this why do we care about it and um, you know, where does it fit into the Apex Common library? So this is um, really the first episode in this series that focuses directly on the code in the Apex Common library. And I really wanted to add this to the series primarily because the Apex Common library is the, like I said in the second episode, probably the best foundation you can have to implement separation of concerns in your org. Um, but also because there's not a lot of documentation, unfortunately, on all of the classes and their methods and how to leverage them in, you know, in the Apex Common repo or really anywhere else on the Internet. You know, you're just kind of expected to learn it for yourself. And while that's wonderful, I guess, um, everything kind of needs a guide. <laughs> So it's kind of a shame that there's not like a real one in existence aside from Andrew Fawcett's uh, book, which is very informative but hard to read. Anyway, um, okay, so let's go over this FFLib application class because it's, it's very important. If you decide that you want to use the Apex Common framework, or library rather, um, this application class is, is kind of like the backbone to it all. Uh, you don't I say that you don't actually necessarily have to use this, but it's it's really in your best interest to do so. It um, makes it easier to use mocking uh, in unit tests. It also makes it so that your code has a lot more flexibility for future permutations of it. All right. So let's go over it. Figure out what it is. All that kind of stuff. So basically, the FFLib application class allows you to use the factory pattern, which we 
went over in the last episode if you haven't watched it and uh it does that by implementing these or, or rather you know like creating these um different factories for your different layers in inside this application class so inside the ffloop application class you have a unit of work factory class and you can see this is a class it's not a method it's a class that has a bunch of methods within it and there's also a public uh, inner class for the for a service factory also one for the selector layer and there's also a factory um, class in here for the domain layer so you can see there's a factory for every layer which is important because Chances are, whether you know it or not, at some point in the future, it will be beneficial to you to, you know, basically be able to leverage the factory pattern to make your code a lot more flexible. So, um, how exactly does the FFLib application class work? You know, how do we, how do we set it up, basically, so that we can use it for our, you know, our needs for our specific Salesforce instance. Well, the first thing you'll need to set up is this application class. And uh, we'll just set up a new one together so it's maybe less confusing. I'll just pull this one off over to the side to make sure I can reference it and don't say anything crazy or real dumb while I build this. <laughs> Because you never know. I might. Um, all right, so normally what you call this is, you, you normally call this class that you're going to create to leverage the power of the FFLib application class application. Or if you have a bunch of kind of modular applications in your org, say, for instance, you have like a whole opportunities opportunity quote whatever application in your org you might make it something like um, I don't know sales application right because on the other hand you might have in your org a whole service application or something right there might be a whole service division that has their own code that you care about there might be a whole a sales cloud aspect that has code that only they care about and uh, sometimes it's beneficial to break those into two separate applications but for our purposes we're just gonna call this application and I'm gonna put two on this because I just like you just saw I've already made a regular application class for this org so okie dokie there we go um, let's figure out how to use this so we've got this application class, and we want to create uh, we want to create the factories for our different layers. Our even though it's not technically a layer, it really kind of is. It kind of fits into the database layer, which is the unit of work. We'll want we'll want a unit of work factory, a selector layer factory, service layer factory, and a domain layer factory. Okay. And again, the reason that you want to do this is because even if you can't see it right now, you might not be able to, especially if your org is brand new. Even if you can't see it right now, this makes will make your code a lot more flexible for future implementations of it. There is a lot of power in using the factory pattern in this uh, FFLib application class. So, even if you can't see it at this moment in time, it's not like a lot of overhead necessarily to implement this. So, try and put this in place as early as you can because it's going to be hard to go back in time later when you figure out, oh, maybe I do need this. Um, if your Salesforce instance continues to grow, you probably will.
So again, let's all right. Let's get back to it. So we want to create a, um, a a factory basically for e each of our layers in our org, our unit of work, service, selector, domain. So uh, basically, what we do is we create four variables that that um, basically represent those layers, right? So we'll do a public, static, final. Uh, unit of work. Oh, actually, I need to declare the type fflib underscore application dot unit of work factory. Um, and if you've never seen this IDE that I'm in, it's called IntelliJ, I, uh, and I'm using the Illuminated Cloud 2 plugin. I've got a tutorial showing you how to set it up, so I'll link it in the description. You can go check it out. All right, so public static final FFLib application unit of work factory. Um, and we'll call this the unit of work and make this equal to a new FFLib application oh, dot unit of work factory. Now, this method here, unit of work factory, takes in a list of object types. So in the FFLib application class, the unit of work factories, really I said method, but I mean constructor. The unit of work factories constructor takes in a list of S object types. And that's important. So we're going to need to create a new list of S uh, object type and pass it in a bunch of S object types. Now, it's important the order that you pass in these S object types. And the reason it's important is because that's basically their order of insertion. So if you need to create, you know, typically you need to create an account before you create a contact. You create a contact before you create, um, I don't know, a case maybe. They need to be in order of insertion or update or whatever. So um, you would say something like account dot s object type case dot yeah, contact dot s object type case dot s object type. And <laughs> my dog's up there just barking away. And um, once you've got these all in the correct order, you're good to go. And in another class, you can initialize this unit of work. Now, you might be thinking uh, real quick, you might be <laughs> you might be thinking, oh, OK, well, th that's cool that I can do this. But, you know, what if I need a different order here from time to time? Uh, there's a way to do t to deal with that. And we'll go over that later. Um, so, actually, you know what? We can just take a look at it now. In here, there is a new instance method that we'll go over in a bit that allows you to send in a new list of S object types so that you can change the order of those um, object types, you know, on a whim, basically. If, uh, oh, if, this doesn't, if this order doesn't work for you, in certain scenarios, uh, you can always change it up. So, don't worry. There's lots of flexibility there. Don't don't freak out yet. <laughs> the next thing that we'll want to do is create our application factory, or sorry, our service factory. So we'll create another public static final fflib application dot service factory, and we'll just call this service. Call this new F fflib application. Service factory. All right, now let's go see what the service factory constructor expects of us. It expects us to pass in a map of type type to be able to create new instances of things appropriately. So, what does that mean? Uh, we don't, you know, at least in the context of this video, we haven't created any 
tasks, task um, classes, right? Or well, task class, service classes. Um, but ideally, you know, what we would do, I've got some examples set up. I, I don't want to build a whole service layer class in this video. But basically, you've got, uh, what you'll end up making is this task implement, or basically a service implementation class and a service interface for each of your services in your org, right? And what you'll end up doing is in your application factory, once you have this set up, and we'll go over the service um, class setup aspect of this in a different video. Uh, but basically what you'll end up doing is you'll say new map type type and um, effectively what you'll end up doing is saying task service interface maps to oops dot class maps to uh, task service impl dot class and um, so what this allows you to do is is call this um, or reference this variable called the new instance method for ooh, for your um, service factory this guy right here and pass it a service interface type to get your service implementation class right so we are let me zoom in on this a little bit I've been doing this without being zoomed not great uh, so this allows you to pass your task service interface in and receive your implementation class. And whenever we go over the service layer, we'll see how this is useful. Um, this is a little less obvious for, um, yeah, it's a little less obvious usage-wise when you look at this at first, but um, when we go over the service layer aspect of this later, we'll go over how how you can really, um, you know, benefit from this if you want to, or need to. All right, the next one that we're going to do is the public static final fflib application dot uh, selector factory, and we'll call this selector, this vari variable selector, and we'll make it a new instance of yet again fflib application dot selector factory and yet again let's go check out what the fflib applications selector factory inner class constructor requires us to pass it so it's looking for an s object type to a class type to a map to be sent to the constructor so that it can dynamically generate classes based on the S object type that you pass to it. So let's set that up. We'll say new map S object type S object type to type. And then we'll basically set up the same kind of thing. So I've got a couple of selectors pre-built for us. And we'll go over this a little bit in a minute as well. So we've got a case selector dot class. So basically what this will allow you to do is by calling this uh, variable or referencing this variable and calling the new instance for the selector factory, um, you can pass in the S object type and it will return to you this case selector class, which is this guy here, uh, a, a selector layer class that I have built prior to recording this to make this all a little bit easier, maybe. Okay, uh, the last thing that we need here is our final layer, which is our domain layer. So we'll create one last variable um, that is of 
the FFLib applications inner class domain factory. And let's just check out for the last time what the domain factory constructor requires of us. And it requires us to send in a selector factory and a map of S object type to type. So S object type to class type. So we'll go on ahead and send in our selector factory, which is our selector, this guy right here that we just made, that bad boy. And uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. And uh, then we'll create our map and uh, take it from there. So <clears throat> what we'll end up with is apparently something this doesn't like. Uh, it'll go away. Um, we'll say case dot s object type will map to the cases dot type or class rather. And that should be it. Um, unless I really did mess something up. But I don't think I did. Oh, that's why it's probably crying. Vacation to dot selector. And, uh, yeah. Oh, one other thing. No, I did that. New map S object type to type. This should be constructor dot class though. All right, and we should be able to save this, and hopefully it'll save, or it'll tell me why I'm crazy. It, it's telling me that. Constructor not defined. What have I done? FFLib application domain factory application two dot selector. All right, we've got our selector in there. We got a new map of s object. Oh, ah, that's all it is. Should be s object type. That's important. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> Now that's saved. Okay, cool. So we have set up now our application factory, basically, that will allow us to call these, um, you know, the, these variables within it and initialize new versions uh, or new instances of these classes that we've mapped here. So the, the important thing to note here is that this is kind of your hub to go to update a lot of things in the future. So say for instance eventually you need to start creating tasks then you would want to come back in here and for your unit of work factory do s object you know add the add the task s object type or maybe you need to start inserting opportunities at some point you're gonna have to come back in here and add that to your unit of work factory or else if you use your unit of work anyway to insert things and we're going to go over the unit of work a whole bunch in the next section. Um, so don't freak out if you don't know what this is. We're going to go over all these things. So if you're confused on any of these layers, please, you know, don't don't worry about it too much. We're going to go over each one of them as time goes on through these tutorial videos. So um, <clears throat> anyway, you'll have to go update things as as your application evolves. So. You know, if you had another, uh, a new service class, you'd go back in here and, you know, add another mapping for the service class. Maybe it's like opportunity, or more generic, like sales service uh, class maps to, uh, it would be sales service interface maps to, sales service impl dot class 
So every time you create a new service for this application, then you're going to come back in here and, and add that to the map. Same kind of thing here. So for instance, I have another selector called, uh, or for the contact object, so I could do contact s object type maps to contact selector dot class and same thing for domain every single time that you create a new domain for an object you're going to want to come back in here and create the mapping for it so I've also got a contacts um, domain class okie dokie And that's really it. And then basically, so I'm going to delete this because that doesn't actually exist. Um, so basically, every single time you add some new functionality, you need to come. You're going to need to come back in here and, you know, add these mappings. And the reason that you need to add these mappings is because if you go over again to the FFLib application class, every single one of these has this new instance method, you know, or a variety of new instance methods. And more or less what happens in these, you know, you don't have to worry about this um, too much. But more or less what happens in these, uh, let's go up to the easiest one to uh, kind of look at, is we get returned to us a new instance of the class that we've mapped. So, for instance, this is the selector factory's new instance method where I can pass in an S object type. And based on that S object type, I will get returned a class, right? I'm going to get the class type from this map that I've created. So let's bring these closer together. Um, I've got this selector. I've created this, uh, sorry, this selector factory. I've created this new map that I have passed to it. And in the map, I'm saying if I pass an S object type of case to it, I need you to return to me the case selector class. Same thing if I pass you a contact object type, I need you to return to me a contact selector class. And back here in the new instance method, I pass it an S object type. And then from this map right here, which we can look up here is a protected map um, of S object type to class type. Basically what we're saying is let's get the class for the S object type that was passed to me and return a new instance of that class to you know who's ever, whoever's calling this method, right? And um, that's super important because that's where most of the power resides, right? And you can you can just pass in like you know an S object type to a generic a generic method that you create in like a service layer or something, and and have it you know dynamically generate selector classes or domain classes, um, you know, at runtime for you. So you can create really generic code, especially for your service layers that um, you know allows you to run allows it to be really really flexible and determine you know how it should run how that service layer uh, method should run at the time it's running not ahead of time um, anyway so we've got these things set up so how, how would we actually use them uh, how, how do we actually use these in context of, of our code right so um, I've got this task service implementation class that I just want to go over and it's using the application class that we didn't just build together an application class that I made uh, quite a while back now but basically it's using this application class and this is virtually the same as what we just built but it's using this class to create new instances of our selector, our domain, our unit of work, um, all that kind of stuff. So let's just kind of 
walk through this and, and see how it works. Um, so I've got this task service implementation class, right? And within here, it's got this create tasks method. And uh, we want this create task method to be able to call, be, be able to be called from anywhere. You know, it could be called from an account object. It could be called from uh, a controller in a class. It could be called from a batch batch class on a, cer a certain object or group of objects. I don't know. And you know, maybe every single night we want to create tasks for a bunch of different objects. Well. Basically, what this allows us to do is dynamically, you know, basically we've abstracted this through the the application class and the factory <coughs> factory pattern enough that we can just call this one method everywhere, and I mean everywhere, and it will generate the right task um, creation callout based on the object type that you pass in here and the record IDs. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, all right, so this task service implementation class um, can be called literally by anywhere. I've got it being called from this abstract task creator controller that can be you know, leveraged by a Lightning Web Component. But you could also call this from, like I said earlier, a batch class, uh, a trigger, uh, wherever. Um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but let's just check it out, right? So this uh, is basically saying, OK, I want to generate an, a, a domain class uh, by calling my application domain variable in um, leveraging the new instance method on the fflib application domain uh, domain factory class so let's um, I know this is kind of confusing <laughs> it's really not a great super easy way that I can think of that, to make this much easier but let me um, let me kind of explain this step by step let me bring this class back over here so we've got our application domain. That's this class. It's calling the application domain um, variable here, right? And that application domain variable is of type fflib application domain factory. So because it, this variable is of type fflib application domain factory, the domain factory has a method called new instance where you can pass it record IDs to generate a new instance of a class, right? So, you know, we can just take a look at this. Basically what happens, more or less, I'm not going to take you through the whole ride, you know, down code, code lane here. <laughs> but basically what happens is you pass your domain factory a set of IDs and once it goes through the whole code tree it's essentially going to return you a new instance of your um, <clears throat> sorry your domain class based on the ID type that you sent to it Right, these the set of IDs they should only be of one object type, ideally, um, and then it's going to return to you based on the type of records that your IDs represent. Uh, well, where'd you go? It's going to return to you a new domain instance based on that, right? So if those IDs are a case F's object type, it's going to create a cases domain class. If those IDs are a contact S object type, it's going to create a contact set uh, domain class. So um, right here, we are dynamically generating a domain class based on the IDs object type. Right? We know nothing else at this moment in time. This is not a concrete class. Um, we can basically generate any 
any domain instance that we need at the time that this code runs, right? Same situation here. We are generating a new selector layer class based on the object type that we pass to it, right? And it works in the same way where if I pass it a case s object type, so this is our selector variable that we're looking at, if we pass it a case s object type, we should get a case selector returned to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, um, not a concrete type. We're saying, all right, hey, at runtime, based on the object type I'm passing to you, please create a new selector layer class for me. Same kind of setup with the unit of work, although the unit of work um, instance is, is a little different. Um, <clears throat> really, the new instance methods for unit of work allow you to just change how the unit of work operates on the fly. So like I briefly mentioned this before, but if you needed to, you could change um, this here. So you could pass in a new grouping of object types if you needed to, um, just in case your order of insertion or updates are different than, than they are when you declared them in your application class over here. So unit you know, of work, it's more, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same kind of benefit, right? You've got the ability to generate new unit of works. Um, which, you know, if you don't know what a unit of work is, basically it's just a way to handle your DML operations, your inserts, your updates, your blah, 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 whatever. And again, we'll go over that in the next video. Um, okay, so we're dynamically generating all these things at runtime, right? You, your code, it doesn't, it's not creating a concrete class type of anything. We're dynamically generating all these different domain domains uh, or domain selector unit of work layers at runtime based on what's passed in. Uh, and then we're doing a couple other things uh, where we basically say, okay, if our object selector implements, this basically means if it implements the task selector interface, so our case selector implements the task selector interface, then we um, <clears throat> can call the we can call the method select records for tasks. Again, if you don't know um, if you don't know how interfaces work, you've really got to take some time to go l look into that. Uh, basically, basically the one of the biggest benefits of of interfaces is that multiple classes hundreds, theoretically, of classes could implement an interface, right? And when you enter, and when you implement an interface, it requires you contractually to implement the methods in that interface. So for that, for this particular like task creator interface, um, it forces me to create this, an implementation of this method here, right? Um, and then because your class now is of type task creator interface, you can, you know, kind of in an abstract way initialize all these, you know, figure out whether a class is of this type, initialize it, and then call these um, methods, right? Because you have to implement create tasks if you implement this task creator interface, right? Um, so, again, if you don't interfaces uh, the concept of interfaces polymorphism things along those lines and object-oriented programming you really got to understand those um, I didn't put these in this tutorial series because I feel like enough people know them but I you know I might be wrong so if enough people complain about the fact that I don't have videos covering those things I might go back and and cover them, but um, take the time to understand what they are. There's a lot of benefit in interfaces uh, in virtual classes and things along those lines. And they're very important in, in the context of these conversations that we are having here. Um, okay, so back to it. 
Um, we're figuring out, okay, our object selector that we have dynamically generated at runtime is of task selector interface. If it is, call the task selector select records for tasks and return that to this list. If it's not, call the select s object by ID method that all selector layers using the Apex Common library have. And if our object domain, this guy up here, is an instance of the, or it implements the task creator in interface, then let's call the, uh, sorry, let's call the create task method that we have to uh, implement in that class to basically allow it to compile, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, as you can probably imagine here, even if this code seems a little confusing to you, through the use of this fflib application class, you get a lot of, you know, dynamic runtime generation for things. You basically are using the factory pattern, which we discussed in the, the video prior to this one. And there's a lot of, as you can see, a lot of benefit to that. Um, because just like I stated in the last video, um, if you didn't use the factory pattern in the FFlib application factory class and, uh, to, to kind of like determine what domain classes and selector classes you needed at runtime, if you wanted to implement the same concept of task creator, you'd have to send it in, uh, do something like this where you create a task creator method in your service factory and you send it the S object type and then based on the the object type you passed if it was equal to a specific type then you create or then you'd call the uh, create task method on the respective domain classes so that's what these represent here and you can imagine you know if you just got one or two of these no big deal uh, but over time you might find that you need this task creator to work in 30, 40 different scenarios. And this could grow astronomically, whereas the um, this one, it, it just won't, it won't grow. This is basically as abstract as you can make something. It, you'll never need to update this class, um, at least in the context of which domain class you call and which selector layer you call, things along those lines. So um, there's a whole lot of benefit to leveraging the application class in the um, Apex Common Library and, and, and truly, you know, using it as intended. So quite a bit of benefit. Uh, you can make your service layers pretty abstract and, and be able to work in, you know, a a variety of scenarios so all right um, that is it I think <laughs> hopefully that has helped uh, you all out there kind of grasp what this application FFlib application class is kind of all about um, because I know it's a little confusing it's kind of confusing for me in the beginning uh, if this doesn't uh, definitely make sure to check out either the GitHub wiki that goes over this more considerably more in depth, every single method in this class, um, sorry, in this class, uh, how to construct an application class, all those kind of things. It's all there in the uh, GitHub wiki or the blog article that I've written for this. So feel free to check them out. And uh, yeah, next episode, we're going to go over the unit of work pattern. So uh, stick around. There's more exciting, wonderful stuff to come. <laughs> All right, guys. So welcome to the fifth episode of this uh, tutorial series I'm making over the separation of concerns, design principle, and uh, the Apex Common Library. And, uh, you know, kind of how they work together. And 
making it a lot easier in Salesforce instances to hopefully get separation of concerns implemented, and if you want to, use the Apex Common Library to do that. That part's optional, though. Um, all right, so what we're going to go over in this episode is the unit of work um, pattern. You know, what is it? Why would you care to use it? All of those things. So as far as, uh, I guess we'll just get started the way that I always get started, right? Why would you care to learn about the unit of work pattern? Well, there's two reasons, really. The first one is the unit of work pattern um, it, basically, its whole purpose is to kind of like encapsulate all of your DML operations or all of your database transactions into one unit of work and execute them all at the exact same time. So, uh, the benefits of that are number one, uh, you're doing really as few transactions as possible. Uh, for DML statements, which is good because there are limits around those things and the uh, better we can deal with that stuff, the better things are overall. Uh, and, you know, additionally, there's... Uh, think about all of the places in your code where you insert stuff. Right, you, you insert records or update them or delete them or whatever else. There could be thousands of places in your code base that are doing that. And it's very possible that unless you're using something like a unit of work pattern, something close to it anyway, um, to handle those transactions, that they're all being handled in different ways. You know, maybe sometimes when you insert, you're doing um, error handling, and sometimes you're not. Uh, maybe sometimes when you do updates, you log errors, and sometimes you don't. Well, that's not exactly ideal, right? You know, another thing is maybe you sometimes you use transaction management, and sometimes you don't. That's, uh, you know, the save point rollbacks and stuff like that. It's not exactly ideal if every single place in your code has different transactional management, right, or different error handling or whatever else. Um, that makes it really hard to upkeep because you've got to go to those three, 400 places in your code base and change them every single time that you want to change something, you know, around those things, error handling, whatever else. Um so ideally, you kind of use this pattern to more or less encapsulate all of that and to, you know, basically make it consistent throughout your org. So those are the two main reasons, uh, or two, two biggest benefits, I guess, you get from using the unit of work design pattern. Number one, you do all your transactions at once. Um, so you kind of like make a list of the things that you want to insert or update along the way. And then you do all of those transactions at the exact same time. The second thing is you get a whole lot of consistency with your the, the way that you're doing those DML transactions, those database inserts, updates, deletes, etc. Um, which in turn reduces code, and, uh, among other things, right? Uh, the last thing is that it helps with mocking. You kind of need a unit of work type setup to be able to mock things in test classes. And we'll get to that uh, aspect of things quite a bit later in this series, but we'll get there. Just know that it's important to have this layer, I guess, to be able to do mocking uh, well. So now that we've gone over the, you know, what and why, I guess, of the unit of work pattern, why you'd want to use it, what its benefits are, um, let's kind of take a look at a couple of examples.
examples. So here's a really simple example of a class that has no unit of work. And you can see, you know, that in this, basically we've got a couple methods, one that inserts cases, one that updates cases. And in the insert case method, we actually insert our case and we, you know, basically if, if something goes wrong here, we actually have try catch to catch the error and potentially log an error if I had an error logging framework set up and throw an exception. But down here where we update cases, we use the database update method and, you know, just if something fails, it's fine, right? Number one, we don't have any try-catch um, block set in place, and we're accepting of the fact that some of these cases will update and some of them won't. That's what this all-or-nothing false parameter is. So we've got a lot of inconsistency here just, like, immediately, right off the bat, right? We've got two different implementations of how we would like to handle our DML transactions, and that's not great. Um, over time, you know, your code base is going to grow. If you don't have a unit of work, you're going to have hundreds of permutations of this throughout the code. And the more that that happens, the, the worse the situation is, you know, like, what if I have another class that inserts opportunities and it logs an error in a totally different way? or it throws exceptions in a, in a weird way that everywhere else doesn't. Or, you know, what if I set save points in, in some classes and I don't in others? Another thing that's, that's really beneficial about the unit of work design pattern is that you get to, like I said before, ideally in your unit of work, you are basically logging every database transaction you'd like to make before you truly make them all. So what that means is, you know, say for instance in this update cases method, I want to update these cases and then I want to, I also want to do a database dot insert and I want to insert a bunch of, I don't know, contacts for cases, right? Obviously, I haven't actually made these contacts or anything, but just pretend for a moment that, you know, somewhere in here, I've created contacts for these cases. Actually, I probably have done that before this update. Okay, so pretend I've written code to create contacts for these cases and I'm updating these cases here and then I'm inserting the contacts for the cases here or really this would also be in reverse oh, it pays to think it in advance so basically <laughs> so basically we're inserting all of our contacts for cases and then we're going to update our cases right um, and link those contacts to the cases that's theoretically if I wrote the code, that's what I'd be doing. So what happens if, you know, this is successful, but this fails? There's nothing that's going to undo this right now, right? It's There's, there's nothing, right? Because this can partially succeed, and this, if it's successful, is just going to roll on. So there's no way to, to roll... You know, there is a way, but right now in the code, there's nothing that's rolling back that transaction. There's nothing that's saying, hey, um, my update down here failed. Please roll back my code, right? And then in reality, you probably would want to do that. So the fact that the unit of work pattern grabs all of those transactions and, and kind of aggregates them into one place before, and then when you commit the work, it commits every single one of those, or does every single one of those DML statements in the same, at the same time, basically. It makes it easier for that transactional management to, to, to be done, I suppose. 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, so basically, you get two major benefits, which we've kind of illustrated here. One, all of your DML transactions, error logging, exception handling, all get to live in one place that you can maintain and deal with in that one place over time. This can save you literally hundreds, if not thousands of lines, of, eh, probably hundreds, but if you're a huge org, potentially thousands of lines of code over time. The other thing is it makes it easier to handle the transactions um, in the case that something fails to insert and you want to roll back, right? Um, because you're doing all the transactions in the same kind of in, in the same moment, it's easier to, to roll them back in, in time. So um, let's just look, we're going to go over this more in detail in the next episode, but let's just look at the Apex Common unit of work and how it handles these things. So uh, real quick, I, I know I've looked at this example quite a bit, but in this task service implementation class, uh, we've got this unit of work that we've set up here. And <clears throat> this unit of work is basically an instance of this FFLib S object unit of work. Again, we'll go over this class a bit more in the next episode, but over here we're setting up our unit of work. We are um, passing that unit of work here to our create tasks method in our domain class. Then over here in our domain class, we're taking that unit of work that was passed and uh, registering a new uh, list. <laughs> I don't really know why I return this unit of work. I don't actually have to, but you know, I guess when you're up working on these things long enough, you make silly mistakes. Anyway, um, so basically it registers this new unit of work. And then when we get back here to the task service um, implementation class, we commit the unit of work, right? So um, let's just see, you know, when you call this commit work what is actually occurring in the class. So if we look for the commit work method down here, you can see it's handling a, a, a bunch of stuff. Number one, it's setting a save point. Number two, it's calling this do commit work, which does quite a few things. And in the event that um, do commit work fails for one reason or another, then we are going to catch that problem and roll back our, our um, basically our database transactions, right? So if you've never used a save point rollback, basically it just says, hey, I'm gonna set this save point at this moment of time before my transactions take place in the event that things go south I can use database rollback and pass in my save point to roll back to that earlier state in time. Um, that way you don't have contacts that exist without the cases that were supposed to exist with them. So again in here it calls this do commit work class and, and in the do commit work class it does a bunch of steps but more or less what it ends up doing um, if we break it down to the simplest aspects, is it ends up going through your list of objects and doing the inserts, the updates, anything else you want to do uh, or, or need to do all in this one transaction, right? So you get a lot of stuff encapsulated in this one class. Uh, and you, you only have to come to this one unit of work class to update them if you need to. Um, so 
There are also other things you can do to make this class operate in a different fashion. Uh, but we'll go over that in the next episode. I don't want to get too far down the line here. Um, so, as you can see, um, kind of, I hope, without a unit of work, you can have a lot of inconsistencies with how you handle DML transactions. With a unit of work class, um, again, it doesn't have to be Apex Common. There are other unit of work um, libraries out there or frameworks for Apex. Um, but a unit of work uh, class in general helps to encapsulate all that logic into one place and make sure that your transaction management and your you know whatever else is done in the way that you want it to be air handling things like that that all those things are done in the way that you want it to be done right uh, for everything so there's consistency for every single transaction you make in your system um, okay hopefully that wasn't too confusing <laughs> Key points, reduces code, makes DML transactions consistent, make sure your, you know, uh, rollbacks are consistent as well um, because you're doing all the transactions at the same time. So, all right, I think that is it. I hope. <laughs> In the next episode, um, we're going to go over this class that we were looking at, the FFLib S object unit of work class, how it works, and you know how you can leverage it to be a unit of work for you if you want it to be. All right, guys, that's it. I will see you next time. All right, guys, so... In this sixth episode of the Apex Common Separation of Concerns tutorial series that I'm putting together to hopefully make this all easier for everybody to use in the future, I wanted to go over the FFLib S Object Unit of Work class because this one is really important. If you are um, using the Apex Common library to implement separation of concerns, this, um, this will act as your unit of work. So basically this this class implements the unit of work pattern which we discussed in the previous video so if you don't know what that is go check out the other video and you'll get a little up to speed if that's confusing at all. Uh, but basically this gives us a way to kind of it gives us a way to basically unify our transactions across our Salesforce code base, right? Um, and again, I go into that a lot in the other video, so I'm not going to waste any more time here on it. So the first thing that we're going to do is just see how we implement the FFLib S object uh, unit of work class and how we actually, you know, leverage it in some code. And then. Um, once I've done that, I'll go over some of the methods in this class that I may not have actually gone over in the example. Um, yeah, that's about it. If you want to know why you would care to do this, because I always end up talking about that in these videos, it's because of two things. Number one, you get to implement the unit of work design pattern by leveraging this class. It's a great foundation that basically puts all the pieces together that you you need to be able to leverage that pattern. And that pattern makes it so that you can you know, unify uh, your code base as in all of your code will have the same kind of error handling, transaction management, um, you know, DML transactions, etc. It'll all work the same. It'll all be consistent. And whether you realize that now or not, it's super important. The second thing is, when we get to Apex Mocks, 
or just mocking in general eventually, you'll see that having something like this, even if you don't use Apex Common, um, is important. You cannot do DML mocking without something like this. Um, technically, you don't have to use this class, nor do you have to use Apex Common, nor do you even technically have to do a unit of work pattern to achieve um, what we'll do in the test mocking eventually, but you need something like this set up or else there's no way to do mocking. And we'll go over that way in the future here uh, when we get to episode 15 or 16, I think, where we go over unit tests and all that magical stuff. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> now that we've gone over, you know, all the junk, <laughs> Let's uh, do an example of this. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do an example of actually leveraging this class. So back in episode four, we created this application class. If you haven't watched the FFLib uh, application class video, go on back, <laughs> check that out, and uh, come back. But basically, we've created this application class. And in this application class, we've created a unit of work factory. And um, basically, what this ends up doing is when we call the application class and grab our unit of work, we are basically retrieving an instance of the FFLib S object unit of work with our object types passed in and this IDML if you use a custom IDML, which I, I will show you what that is later. Um, this is actually what you'd be instantiating up here typically, although there are other overloads. And again, we go over that a bit in the fourth episode of the series, and you can get all the information you want over every single one of these methods in the uh, GitHub wiki that I created. It, it literally goes over each one of these methods and how to utilize it. Okay, so important stuff. We're using this application class, and this application class calls this unit of work factory, which when you call the new instance method on this unit of work factory class, it will return to you a new FFLib S object unit of work. Important to know how that works. So the next parts aren't super confusing. All right, so we're just gonna make some random uh, unit of work example and write some glorious code together. <laughs> Actually, it's not gonna be very glorious, but it'll get the point across maybe. No promises, I have no idea. Okay, so we're just gonna make a Public void. Um, eh, we'll just call it object creator for lack of a better method name off the top of my head. And the first thing that we're going to do is create an fflib this object unit of work. Actually, it'll be. Eh, am I crazy? Just want to make sure I'm not crazy here. It's been a minute since I've done this. Yeah. Um, is object unit of work unit of work actually I would rather it be that so it's more clear if you don't know the IDE that I'm working in right now it's IntelliJ I have a whole tutorial over how to set IntelliJ up for Salesforce using the Illuminated Cloud 2 plugin uh, definitely go check it out if you're a little lost now it's not all that different from from Visual Studio Code but honestly if you use it you'll realize how much better it it is <laughs> at least in my opinion okay so we're gonna make a new fflib s object unit of work call that uh, or basically retrieve that variable from the application class 
and call the new instance method that we looked at just a moment ago to create our new instance of our uh, of a unit of work, right? Okay, cool. So we've got this unit of work um, variable here, and now we want to create some records, right? So we'll say list of cases. We'll call this new cases. Just say um, case and I don't know. I'll give it a subject equal to high status equal to new. And uh, I think that's actually all I need. Uh, we'll come back to this, though, because I want to register a relationship to the contact record that we're going to make. So actually, let's uh, create those contacts. Um, I can actually simplify this. I'd rather simplify this. Boom. Cool, 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 cool. Is it going to be upset about this? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got our new list of cases. Um, let's create a list of contacts. New contacts equals new list of contact. And where the last name equals tacos and the first name equals chocolate chocolate tacos cool all right so basically we're going to do the following we're going to take our unit of work now that we've got our new contacts that we want to register to be created and we'll say unit of work dot register new oh allergies are killing me today and um, <clears throat> we'll register these new contacts right in our unit of work now what this is doing is this is basically saving in memory our new contacts we're not committing them to the database yet we're just saving them in this unit of work for later when we commit everything at the exact same time. Now, um, the next thing I want to do is do unit of work, <coughs> register new, and add my cool, new cases. And I'm not going to pretend like I remember this one because I haven't used it in a bit. There's a method in here called um, register relationship. And <clears throat> we need to basically register this relationship between the whoa, 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 whoa. relationship between the um, contact or sorry the yeah, the contact and the cases. So we'll say register relationship s object record uh, this will be for simplicity's sake uh, new cases zero the related to field will be the um, case dot contact ID and the s object that it's related to uh, will be the new contacts zero right 
And of course I need to actually call that from my unit of work. That's important. Cool. So now, um, this is fairly important, right? Um, we've got our contact that's registered, our unit of, or our, sorry, our, our new cases that are registered, and then we have a relationship uh, between the two that is registered. And again, all this stuff is in memory, right? It's not, nothing has actually happened yet. Um, we're just storing all this in a, in basically a JSON object that will all be committed here in a moment. So the next thing that we'd want to do now that we've got all this stuff registered, set up, whatever, is we do unit work, commit work. And what this will end up doing is actually taking our contact cases and this relationship set up and committing it all to the actual database when this uh, is hit here. All right, so um, normally you'd want to wrap this in a try catch just in case something goes wrong and then you can, you know, return errors as needed. I'm just going to make this a general exception to make this a little bit easier to get through. Okay, so one last thing I just want to double check because I made this other application class pretty quick. Looks like I did something wrong. So let's bring that up here and check out what crazy thing I did. Variable does not exist contacts for cases. Contacts Oh, that's for <laughs> that's for an example I did in another video. Let's just move on past that and save this again. Okay, cool. That worked. Um, all right. So pending, I didn't mess any of this up. What we should see, uh, and I will send myself back. So we'll say system at debug contact zero dot ID. That way we can uh, go into the system and check this out. This is the new, oh, actually I want the case. Make sure that everything got set up right. All right, <clears throat> so we've got everything registered with our unit of work. We're committing it. And then after we commit it, we check out the case ID to, you know, hopefully go see that all this work was actually done, including the relationship setup. So we're going to run some anonymous Apex here just to test this guy out. Well, that kind of sounded uh, Canadian with that out or something. I mean, I'm not, but <laughs> I don't know. Watching too much how I met your mother. Okay. All right. So we're going to run this class called the object creator. See what happens. I might have screwed up the code. I don't know. Uh, okay. All right. So I did screw up the code, but it's not for the reason that I thought. Um, at least it's not for the reason that I rambled on for about five minutes for. So I just decided to cut the video and come back to what the actual problem was. Um, as I stated back in episode four, it is very important what order you put these uh, object types in when you're setting up your your unit of work factory here. I previously had them uh, in this order because I just built this pretty fast as an example. But considering I wanted my contact to go in first, so that I could register a relationship between the case and the contact, this is bad. 
I need contact to come above case so that it knows it should insert the contact before the case. So if we reverse this, this code should work perfectly fine. <laughs> but be careful, whenever you set up this unit of work factory, make sure these are in, or in insertion or update order, right? If you're wanting the contact to be updated before the case or the account to be updated before the contact, which you know what, I'm just gonna go on ahead and update this because I have a feeling at some point in a future video, that's gonna kill me. And you need to make sure that these are in the right order. Okay, so now that I've got them in the right order in this unit of work factory, again, cover this a lot more in episode four, so head back a couple episodes and check it out if you're confused by this. Um, now, now, if I run this uh, class, uh, we've got a success, which is great. So we can go check out our case in Salesforce and see that it got made. Okay, cool. It got made and it has a relationship to good old chocolate tacos. So everything worked, um, which is great. And, uh, you know, we did all of that in a single unit of work, right? We registered all of this stuff and then we committed it all at one time. Whereas if you didn't use the unit of work, right, you didn't, you didn't do this, you, you'd have to, you know, basically insert your contact, then insert your cases, um, and then register a relationship and update your case. Or I guess you wouldn't have to do that. You could just insert your contact and then insert your cases with the contact ID you just inserted. Either way, you've got to do a couple things. It's not all bundled up together in this unit of work. Now, technically in the background, the unit of work does all those things too. But because it's all bundled together, you know, again, I've gone over this in the video before, it makes it easier for transaction management and a lot of other things. So that's basically what's happening. Now there's a whole bunch of other methods that you can use on the unit of work class. Um, but actually real quick before we get into that, the goal here is for you to be able to, in the executional transaction that you're, you're currently in, to just use one unit of work and pass this unit of work to the other methods that need to mess with that unit of work, that need to register new things or register existing things or register updates to things, among other stuff, right? So don't, you know, make a new unit of work for every method or something. Uh, pass this between the methods. And if you don't know, this is an object, so this is passed by reference. There's no need to pass it and return it. Just pass the reference of unit of work to your next method, update it there, and it'll come back with all those updates um, without you passing it back. Uh, a lot of people get confused about that. Uh, if it's an object, it gets passed to a method by reference. If it's a primitive, it's by value. It's a very important distinction that I'm probably getting way off topic on. Cool. So again, one unit of work for the entire executional context, ideally. Try not to make a whole bunch of them. And then, you know, this becomes less useful, I'll say. Okay, cool. So let's go over the other methods in this class now that we kind of have an understanding of how it works, right? Um, so we've already been over, you know, the register new method. Basically that registers new, re new records that have yet to be, uh, that don't exist yet in your database. Oh man, I'm gonna sneeze. Wait, okay, it's gone. All right. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of other stuff in here. For instance, there's this register work method. And this register work method is literally a way to do a callback. So, uh, or yeah, it's, it's basically a way to register a callback method. 
So basically what this does is if you register an I do work class, then you basically are registering a callback method that gets executed after your work is committed. And we'll see if I have time to go over that in this video. I don't want to make it super long. I do definitely go over that a bunch in the um, wiki pages and on my blog. So if you want more information on how to use ID work and what, what this register work method does, definitely check that out. Um, there's the register email method. Uh, if, you are if you need to register an outbound email, this will allow you to register those outbound emails for your unit of work. So single email messages. Uh, if you actually want to permanently delete records, then you can use this register empty recycle bin method. Uh, it's got several overloads for different things. Register new, we've already gone over in our example. Register relationship, again, went over that in the example, but basically, right, you're going to send it the record that you want a relationship to be made on, the field that you need that relationship to be made on on your record, and then the object that it should be related to. There's also the ability to register relationships for email messages. So if you want the email message to be attached to, say, a contact or a case, then make sure to register that relationship here. Um, <clears throat> this one is a, uh, is a way to register an external ID on a field. So there's a register relationship for external ID fields. Register dirty. This is one that I think people get confused on. If you're wanting to update records, use the register dirty method. I don't know why it's called register dirty. Maybe in Java or other languages this is common. Uh, I really kind of wish they would rename this to register update or updates, but it is what it is. Register dirty is registering updates. And there's a bunch of overloads for this method right lots of them uh, uh well i don't know if there's lots of them but there's at least yeah there's quite a few <laughs> but um you know you have options to only update specific fields like only worry about uh, doing the update for specific fields on there um you can actually register a parent relationship directly there there's also a register new that allows you to do that a lot of different variations of this you can do register upsert i personally do not like using upsert uh like ever but ever every once in a while you need to do that so you know it's there for you uh there's also register deleted which will allow you to delete records <laughs> register permanently deleted which will allow you to, uh, you know, actually permanently delete things. Basically, it just calls the empty re recycle bin in the, in the register deleted methods. And uh, then there's, you know, quite a few other ones that are less commonly used, platform event related um, uh, registers, uh, among other things. So quite a few methods in here. Uh, that you might want to take a look at. It's always worth taking a look at what commit work actually does. It's uh, pretty cool, but yeah. Anyway, let's see. Should I go over IDML and I do work? Ooh, I have a feeling this episode is really long. I have, uh, I don't want to go too far into those things. If you guys really, really want to see that in a video format, uh, definitely let me know and I can make it, but I feel like that's a lot. It's, it, they're features that are less commonly used, but, um, well, IDML every once in a while, I've used that. But the both of those things are covered in both my blog and in the GitHub Wiki article that I've written for this class specifically. So. If you want to know how to leverage those things and what they are, there is a in-depth explanation and example code on how to get those things done. Uh, basically what the IDML class does, which I don't think we went over, uh, is 
it allows you to do basically have a new implementation of this simple DML class here. So this is what actually gets called whenever your uh, <coughs> actual system updates are being made. So, or your DML transactions are being done really, is what I should say. So if you're doing an insert, this is, it's literally just eventually gonna call this method here. Or if you're doing an update, it's eventually gonna call this one, delete that one. Uh, you know, if you wanna publish an event, it's gonna call that empty recycle bin, this one. So if you if you don't like this implementation, which, you know, that's perfectly fine. If you don't want, if you don't wanna use this one, you can leverage this interface that's within the FFLib S object unit of work. And so basically you'll create a class that implements the IDML interface and you create um, basically a new implementation here. So you'll, you'll um, <coughs> create an implementation for each one of these methods and basically have your own way to do inserts, updates, whatever else, right? So if you want to add error logs um, or you want to do all or none transactions, potentially things like that, then you know, you'd know you create a class that implements this IDML interface and then implements each one of these methods. And then back here where you do new instance, right? There is a and by the way, that hotkey I keep using, it's called, it's control B. It takes you to the actual like method that that is referencing, right? When I'm highlighted over here, it takes you to the method that this is, that I was hovering on. There is one in here that allows you to create a new instance using a new IDML, um, you know, uh, class, basically. So, you know, if you want to override that, you have options. You don't have to use, you know, what they've pre-built for you. I mean, this is pretty simplistic, right? Lots of places need something more robust than, than what you see here. So just so you know, that that's a thing that you can override and have your own implementations for all the insert updates, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, yeah, not gonna do an example, but there is an example uh, out there that I've built for you guys if you wanna check it out. All right, guys, so welcome to the seventh episode of this Apex Common Separation of Concerns tutorial series. In this episode, we're going to go over the service layer, what it is, the difference between it and the domain layer, why you'd want to implement it, all those kind of things. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I'll first explain, just like with every other video, basically, <laughs> why you would care to learn about the service layer and why you'd care to implement it in your org. Um, the reason that you'd want to implement a service layer is because you want a, ideally anyway, you would want kind of a, a place to store your business logic, right? The service layer is the layer in your org that holds your business logic for the different application areas in your org. Think about it this way. Uh, a lot of the times what I end up seeing is you've got a controller and in that controller you've got for some reason a lot of business logic. Um, so you know your lightning web com component calls that controller, that controller within it actually runs some business logic and does whatever you need to do and then maybe inserts records or whatever. That's fine in the beginning, right? You know, if it's if it's a brand new org and you do that once, um, maybe it's no big deal. But in the future, you might need that exact same business logic to be run somewhere else, right? It can be, um, you know, anything. I don't know, maybe you have an opportunity service in your org that builds complex opportunities uh, for your salespeople. Um, if you put all that logic into a controller, then you have to call a controller, which isn't 
you know, typically controllers aren't necessarily bulkified. They can't handle a bunch of different scenarios, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so you're either calling a controller, which is less than idea, ideal, or you're rebuilding that business logic in a bunch of different controllers or places, batch classes, who knows, in your org. And really you don't want your business logic to live in multiple places because over time it gets hard to maintain, right? Say you have the same business logic in <clears throat> 15 different controllers. Well, that's not great. If the business logic changes, which it does all too often, you've now got to go to 15 different controllers and update that. Well, the way to offset that is through the use of a service layer, right? So you bring the service layer into your org and you kind of just have this centralized business logic repository for each of your, you know, I guess service, uh, application service areas in your org. So <clears throat> now your 15 controllers can all just call to this service layer class instead of you having to update every single one individually, every single controller individually. It makes things a lot easier in the long run. So as far as why you want a service layer, <clears throat> it's because you really ideally would like a centralized hub kind of for your uh, for your business logic for your for your different applications in your system. <clears throat> so um, now that we kind of know why you want a service layer in your org ideally, a lot of people get confused between what the service layer is supposed to be and what the domain layer is supposed to be. And I think this is a lot less confusing than people make it out to be. I just like to think about it this way because <clears throat> I think this is easier for people to understand. The domain layer is like <clears throat> a fancy trigger handler. Okay? It's on a the domain layer is on an object by object basis. It represents the behavior of a single object in your system, a single table, you know, if you weren't in Salesforce. So the domain layer encompasses both your trigger actions and object specific behaviors. <clears throat> so, what do I mean by object specific behaviors? behaviors, maybe your objects create tasks in a specific way, right? Um, so you'd have a task creation method or something on your object. And that's an object specific behavior. <clears throat> um, the service layer is different. The service layer is where it's typically a cross object situation, right? You've got a, well, we'll just do the one that's right in front of us. I know I keep referencing it throughout this series, but I really think this is an easy one to grasp your mind around, in my opinion. Um, say you have the need to create tasks from a variety of places across a variety of objects, right? You could make a task service, okay? And the task service, like the one in front of us, could be called from anywhere to create tasks for any object, right? So, this service, the act of creating a task, is um, is basically a cross-object service, right? So this service could be used by technically hundreds of objects in the system if I wanted to. Now, does this eventually call a domain layer to create the tasks based on the object-specific behavior for creating tasks? 
yes. Um, down here we eventually call uh, using our object domain the create task method on the actual domain. But uh, I know this class is confusing. Hopefully if you've been following through the series it's maybe a little less confusing. But as you can see this this method in this task service class can deal with any object type. It's a cross object setup. Okay? So that's that's one of the biggest aspects of the service class. Um, it's not typically, although it can be, but typically, um, well over, at least in my experience, like 80% of the time. Uh, it's a cross-object uh, class. So, you know, it's a, it's a class that can handle multiple objects uh, for a specific, like, service application area in your org. <clears throat> Maybe you again have some complex opportunity um, opportunity creation logic where it goes out and creates <clears throat> um, automatic in certain scenarios it automatically creates quote quotes quote line items or whatever else right and a bunch of different scenarios can trigger that well you might still have some object specific domain layer stuff on your opportunities object but that service because it's kind of um, cross object oriented would uh, sorry that class because it's cross object oriented would be become a service layer class right um, I know it's kind of confusing but let's just keep it simple Domains represent individual object behavior and their triggers. Um, service layers represent uh, basically <laughs> they represent business logic but on a broader level than on an in individual object by object basis, right? It's, it's typically a cross object scenario uh, a service is normally a bit more abstract sometimes you can send in lots of different objects like you can see here in the task this task service I've built so um, they're two very different things uh, even though people seem to get them very mixed up and confused and con they're concerned why why do you need one uh, or why do you need both why can't you just use one so Hopefully that clears it up a little. I know it's a confusing concept, but the more that you you start building these things out, the easier it is to kind of see the difference between a service and a domain layer um, class. All right, so what's the next important stuff I should go over? I guess we should go over the fact that unlike a domain layer and a selector layer and the unit of work, the service layer th there's there's nothing pre-built for the service layer nothing ever could be pre-built for a service layer uh, class right this this service layer class it represents your business's specific logic right there's there's no way that anybody could build a you know, library or framework to help you with that, really. Um, now, that, I mean, there's a handful of things that that the Apex Common uh, Library does to make, well, the service factory in particular useful. But I guess what I mean is this task service implementation class, that's what IMPULSE stands for, it doesn't extend anything like like this domain class this case is domain class right uh, in the you know uh, apex common library all of your other domains are going to 
extend, or sorry, all of your other layers are going to extend another class. And that's just not the case for the service layer. That there's nothing, there's no pre-built functionality you could build for this because every single org is going to have different services and every service is going to be unique. Um, even if 30 or 400 different orgs had task service implementations for a service layer, their business logic would be completely different, more than likely. So there's nothing you can do to like, you know, prep or make this any easier. Um, and we'll go over you know, how, how to leverage the um, FFlib application service factory in the next the next video a little bit. But outside of this service factory, which only kind of comes into play with the service layer, um, you know, there's nothing else that's that's prepped here. There's a couple other things that are worth going over. Um, service layers should always use with sharing. You know, don't use inherited sharing. Don't use without sharing. Um, these should always operate in in user context. This is business logic. You want your business logic to operate with your business sharing setup, right? You, you don't you don't typically want this to operate without sharing. And the off chance that you do want this to operate without sharing, basically what you'll want to do is create a private inner class in here. So you'd make a private, I don't know, task service impl, um, I don't know, system sharing or something like that class. And um, <clears throat> let's see, without sharing. And did I do something wrong? Am I crazy? <laughs> uh, without sharing. Oh, 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 wow, Matt. That, um, just pretend I didn't do that. Um, okay, so you basically create a you know, uh, an inner class in here that you could call to to run your elevated methods in your different situations. So if you wanted, if you actually had a real need, like say for instance, you needed to, I, I don't know, you needed to find the distance between um, an account a user has access to and all of the other accounts in the system, like what's the next closest account or something and return it to them. Um, on a map or whatever, then you could build a method in here that allows them to elevate their sharing temporarily. So it'd be, you know, like, uh, oops, yeah, public void uh, get all accounts or something. And uh, then from your from your class in here, you'd basically just call, you know, task service impl system sharing. No, maybe dot get all accounts, right? And in that way, you could, you know, in your specific business logic scenarios where you needed elevated sharing, you could do that. And you can do it in a really safe way. Um, you know, you're not allowing other people to call this class. You are only allowing your logic to execute code in this class if you need it to, right? So if you ever need elevated sharing, like for a real reason, uh, for instance, that example that I just gave was a real example. There was a, um, mapping application that I built a mapping service for and I needed to be able to grab all accounts for the map to be able to display them on this on this map um, so that's how you would do that right now now no other place can call this except for your code 
you know, in whatever logical sense it needs to call it. Um, <clears throat> let's see, something else. Oh, right. Um, your service layer class, typically, I would say um, over 90% of the time, probably nearly 100% of the time, in, in my opinion. I mean, it's not perfect, but you know, somewhere around there is pretty much the only place where you should be committing work. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you didn't watch the unit of work videos and you're here, um, basically when you call this commit work, you are doing a DML transaction uh, of some sort. So basically, the only places that place that you should be doing DML transactions are in the or is in the um, service layer. Now, occasionally you actually have a use case for this in the domain layer, but that's really it. Don't start doing these transactions in controllers. Don't start doing them anywhere else. In your service layer, you should be committing your work almost all the time. No, nowhere else, ideally. Um, again, that's not perfect, but but uh, yeah, that's that's it. Those are the two major things. Um, there's a handful of other things that I go over in the wiki article, like class naming conventions and method names and method parameters. Oh, another important thing to note about the service layer is. As you can see, this is, um, well, it's kind of bulkified. Uh, all, all of your methods in the service layer should for sure, um, unless there is a very good reason and justification not to do it, be bulkified. Um, and that's just because you don't know what's going to be calling the service layer in the future. Uh, right now, it could just be a controller that's passing one record ID to it. But in the future, it could be a batch class that's passing, you know, 3,000 record IDs to it that it needs to, to handle. So make sure that your methods uh, that you create encourage, uh, well, number one, are bulkified, but um, allow for uh, operations with, with lots of records, right? Because who knows what could be calling this? Uh, could be a domain layer class. It could be a batch class. It could be a service class, or sorry, a uh, controller class. You just don't know. Um, and it's best to prep for that in the future. Um, OK, I think that's pretty much all the important stuff about the service layer. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me in the comments, all that kind of stuff. I will do my best to answer them um, as fast as I can. All right, guys, so welcome to episode eight of this uh, Separation of Concerns and Apex Common Tutorial series that I'm putting together to hopefully help everyone out there figure out how to use this um, and uh, make it a little easier for people to start adapting in their own orgs because this is really important stuff and will you know make your org really easy to deal with in the future, really extensible, adaptable to change, all that kind of stuff. So um, in this episode, we're going to go over how to implement a service layer class that works well with the um, Apex Common Library. Uh, and I'm going to start this a little different than the normal ones, where I tell you why you want to do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll get to that. But one thing I want to point out is that the um, Apex Common Framework, and really any other framework in existence, doesn't set a groundwork for you for a service class. Um, there's nothing to, you know, there's no class to extend, there's no methods that you, you know, like pull from or, or whatever. You, there's no groundwork here. And the reason that there's no groundwork is because service layer classes are business um, business logic, right? And every business's logic is different. Uh, so every org's logic will be different. There will not be similar methods that you can just, you know, grab from another class, at least that a library could provide you, right? So 
there's nothing, there's no base layer here, but there is in the FFLib application class, which we go over in episode four of this series. If you haven't looked at it, you should probably check it out because it is extremely important for the rest of the series that you understand how this particular thing works. In the um, FFLib application class, there is a service factory class. And basically what it does is give you an idea um, and really a setup that's great for managed packages if you're if you're doing managed packages but it gives you an idea of how to dynamically initialize or instantiate um, classes use service classes using the factory pattern so we're gonna figure out how how you set up those classes to work with you know the factory pattern uh, the, or the service factory that's been set up for apex common um, now, as far as why you would want to set things up this way, this is going to, let me see how I can phrase this. In lots of orgs, eventually what happens is you start to grow. You grow and you grow and you grow. And, you know, you have one successful implementation and then other business groups start to see, oh, this is cool, I should join too. And you know, another business group says, oh, yeah, th this is awesome. I like the way that these two are doing it. I, I should join, too. And then what happens is if you don't build your code in a nice dynamic, you know, in some kind of dynamic way, you're going to get classes that just become out of control, right? You, you know, you might have a B2C accounts, and you might have B2B accounts, and you might have... I don't know, marketing accounts, whatever else. You could have tons of different account types in the system uh, for your different business groups, and they could all need different logic based on you know, the record type for the account or whatever else. So what happens is if you don't have a way to you know, figure out how to break out that logic into separate classes that you can kind of like dynamically determine which to run at runtime, you get these huge classes. Uh, either that or you get these huge if-else statements eventually in all of your methods. And we really don't want that because it becomes harder and harder to maintain over time, especially if you're working for a larger business and you know your Salesforce instance really takes off. So... Um, as far as why this is great, it really helps you separate out your concerns and make your code really nice and neat and organized. Um, it also makes it so that you can call your service class from, you know, uh, an Apex controller or a batch class or whatever else, and it's uh, it's never going to know the difference. Like you're not going to have to do anything special, I guess. To or change that call out because you've added new logic for group A, B, or C or something. <clears throat> so um, enough talking about this, I guess. Let's build this together and figure out how this, you know, factory pattern setup for your service classes actually works. Okay, guys, so today what we're going to be building to kind of figure out how this whole service layer factory implementation works is a um, a way to allow us to call a different service implementation class based on the record type of a case. So basically what I've done um, is you know, set up several case record types for my cases. So I've got a B2B sales case, a B2C service case. I actually think I've changed this since then. Yeah, B2C sales case and a marketing sales case. And basically, these record types, for our purposes, represent the different business groups that are involved in our help desk, right? So for this, imagine that we have a help desk. That help desk has three different teams, and their processes are all 
pretty different, right? And ideally, we don't want to merge all their code, their implementation code, into the same place. Um, theoretically, they all use entitlements, and we're going to figure out a way to call a help desk service implementation that is unique for each of these um, at runtime based on a case records record type ID. Okay? Um, it's going to be pretty cool, so stick with me. I promise uh, it, it's a little complicated, but I'm going to go over every single step, and um, hopefully it'll be less complicated. So um, the first thing that we are going to do is find our service factory in the FFLib application class. Now, if you've not watched episode four of this tutorial series, you really should. Um, it goes over the FFLib application class in depth, and um, it is pretty critical you understand this class to some extent before you, you know, you go too deep into this series. At least with the Apex Common um, tutorials that I'm going to do. So. Um, right now, the only thing that this service factory can um, map on is basically a class type to a class type. Generalizing a bit, but that's basically what we're, we're doing here. We're saying, I want to map this from class type A to class type B. Um, and this is actually a great setup, a pretty useful setup, I guess I should say, if you are a um, managed package provider. So. Um, I'm not going to go over that because I think 90 plus percent of the people that I'm talking to right now are not managed package providers, but um, just know that, that this can come in a lot of handy, especially if you want your, your customers to be able to implement their own code, you know, dynamically. It can be pretty cool what you can do with this. So um, anyway, on to what we were supposed to be talking about before I got off on a little side note there. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is create a couple new maps. Now, you could extend this class and do some other fancy stuff, but I'm trying to keep this a little simpler um, for this video. Uh, so we're going to create a new map that maps by string to type. And this is going to be our um, basically our services by record type map. Right? So basically what, I, what I'm saying is uh, we are going to get a, let's make this even more, service class by record type. So we're going to get a service class returned to us right, by the record type that we pass in here. And the other thing that I'm going to go on ahead and do, although we don't necessarily, you know what, I'm just going to skip it. You would, you would want to set up, if we're going to do mocking, <coughs> You'd want to set up a uh, mock for this too. I guess it won't take me much time, so we can go on ahead and do that. It would be mock service class by record type. Okay. And we will create a new constructor to set this up. So we'll say public service factory. Again, this is a new constructor for our inner class service factory right here and it's going to take a map of uh, yeah string by class type and we'll call this service class class by record type and then we'll say this dot service class dot record type equals service class dot record and we will initialize our mock service class record type. That should be mapped though. <laughs> okay, so um, what have we done here? Basically, we are giving ourselves a way to initialize the service factory with a map of a string that represents our record type to um, a, a uh, class, a service or a service class implementation class. 
And uh, that's really it. So the next thing we'll need to do is create another new instance method. So these um, new instance methods that come by default, they're not going to, uh, well, really cut it for us here. We need to do this after the constructor. So what we'll do is we'll create a new um, new instance method, and we'll call this uh, new instance by record type to make this, you know, very straightforward. And we'll pass in the record type to it. Now, the first thing we'll want to do ooh, is figure out if we have got a mock instance or mocking in the future. Uh, service class dot record type uh, dot contains key record type and we'll return that uh, mock instance, right? So basically what we're saying is, okay, if we've set a mock um, for this, then we'll return it. Uh, this is less important to the conversation, but it is important, you know, if you're going to use mocking to set something up like this. And you, we're not, I'm not going to go over it, but you would also need to set up a, a set mock method for it, right, where you put stuff into the map that we're setting up here. So let's not try to focus too much on the mock part. Um, the next thing that we'll do is we'll say type service impl equals um, services or service class by record type dot get the record type and then we'll say something like service or sorry if um, service impl um, equals equals null then we'll throw a um, developer exception I'll explain that in a second. And if it's not, then we'll go on ahead and return our service impl. If I can spell. And uh, that's pretty much it. So basically what we're doing here is we're figuring out, all right, are we in a test, right? Do we need to return a mock class? Um, again, don't dwell on this too much. We'll go over this in episodes 15 through 17 of this series. Um, and then what we're doing is we're saying, all right, uh, let's check to see if our record type exists in our map. Uh, and if we do indeed get something back from our map, or sorry, if we don't get something back from our map, uh, throw a exception that says no implementation is registered for the record type uh, so that we know that there's something wrong with the application class that we've set up, which we'll build here in a sec. And then, um, you know, if everything goes well and we've passed through this if statement uh, un unharmed here, then we'll return a new instance of our service method or our service class that we care about. Okay, so we've set that up. We've set up our new, I guess, setup for the FFLib application service factory. The next thing that we need to do is create an application class. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that together real quick, super simple. I'm not going to make it overly complicated. Um, we'll say uh, service desk application. Yep, 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 yep. And basically, what we're going to set up is a way to get our service classes. So we'll say public static final fflib application dot um, what am I doing? service factory and we'll call it service equals new fflib application service factory and then we'll need to do the following. We'll create a new map of string to type 
and set up our mappings for that. And I've got these over here, so I'm just going to copy them over so I don't have to type all this out. Um, but basically, you are going to put in the names of your record type, right? And um, then what classes they equate to. And we're going to create these, uh, create new versions of these classes here in a sec. But um, just so you know how this this works, you're going to right pass in that map of record type and class type, record type to class type into your service factory, which will then, you know, run this constructor that we just made and set up our map that we care about, right? So uh, back here in this, um, I've created these things already, but we should create them together so that you understand what these are right what these help desk b2b service info class blah 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 whatever um but before well let's just create them together first so like i said before we're assuming that the b2b team ha kind of has their own separate processes for things b2c kind of has their own separate processes and the this um service desk application that we've built in our salesforce org and um, basically what we need to do is figure out a way to dynamically call the right code based on the case at runtime. So we need different classes for each of these you know, business units, basically. So let's go on ahead and create them. I'm going to name them a bit different, and then I'm going to come back here and update them. So we're going to create a class and we'll call this service desk uh, b2b service impl cool and we'll just copy this name and create a few more so we'll say service desk B to C service impl and impl stands for implementation but implementation is kind of a long word and so it often gets abbreviated to impl and then we'll have a mark yeah, well, marketing service implementation class now I think I briefly stated this earlier, but let's pretend that every single one of these service desk implementations or, you know, let's pretend that our B2B service desk, our B2C service desk, and our marketing service desk all use entitlements or case milestones, whatever. Um, so they all, they all need to have some code that, I don't know, maybe starts the milestone process and stops or starts the entitlement process and and stops the entitlement process um, in different scenarios. Um, so, yeah, but every single one of these groups have different, completely, you know, unique implementations for this. So how do we handle this? Um, here's what we can do. We know that they all need a similar method, right? They all need this similar start milestone, stop milestone method. Every single one of them is going to have this done. Um, so what we can do to make our code even more abstract here and use the factory pattern really well is um, create an interface. And we'll call this, oh, sorry, got some bad allergies, I guess. We'll call this service desk interface. So this is a generic interface that we can use across all these implementation classes. And you know, once I press enter 30 times, uh, we'll change this to an interface and we'll give it a couple methods. Uh, we'll say maybe that we want a list of cases um, returned to us or something and we'll call this uh, start 
entitlement process and maybe pass it a case CS. Now I know normally you're supposed to, oh, what am I doing here? Bulkify these, but bear with me. It'll be bulkified, but in a different, different manner. Um, and then we'll have another one called stop entitlement. Entitlement. Okay, I'm good so far. Stop entitlement process, and we'll pass it a case. Um, okay, cool. So we've got this interface. Now, if you're not super familiar with what interfaces are, um, don't, I guess, freak out too much. Um, basically, all they are are a contract between this interface and the class that implements it that says, hey, class, you've got to implement these methods. And at a base level, that might not seem great, like, who cares? But if you have 15 different classes that implement these methods in different ways, what you can do is kind of declare them in this abstract way. You can say service desk interface equals whatever class implements it. And then because you know it's of type service desk interface, you can call these processes. But let me show you it in just a second. You'll, you'll see how like incredibly useful this is. Um, you can do the same kind of thing with virtual classes too, but I'm trying not to get overly complicated because <laughs> this is a challenging concept. Okay, so we've created our service desk interface. We've created our implementation, our three implementation classes. So now the next thing we need to do is say implements um, service desk interface, right? And I'm going to grab these method declarations and make this a little easier because for some reason IntelliJ has been a little weird on me recently and not auto-completed these methods like it normally does. And uh, yeah, so now we're going to implement these two methods that we uh, have in our service desk interface. Now, if I had tried to create this class and save it um, without these methods in place, uh, it'll actually tell me you can't. It'll say, nope, you implemented this interface. You have got to implement these methods, right? Um, and I'm going to make this super easy because I don't want to go over like the whole setting up entitlement processes, blah, blah, blah. That's not really the point of this, this um, tutorial. So I'm just going to keep this simple and make system debugs that say, um, I called the the um, B to B start entitlement process and then I'm going to add the case or sorry record type name um, and then I'm just going to return an empty list of cases. Should have just made this a little easier on myself. Not had to return anything, but it is what it is. Um, and we'll do the same thing here. And change this to the stop process. And basically what I'm going to do uh, is just implement these in all the other classes and update the um, debugs so that we can see when we set this up in just a second how this how this works and, and that it does indeed call the different classes based on the record type that we pass to it. Um, so let's say service desk interface and we'll say this one called the B2C implementation and last but not least we're going to set up the same thing for the marketing one and Slap this bad boy in here. <laughs> I'm getting, uh, getting too uh, cheeky with you guys, maybe. Okay, cool. So we've set up all these different implementation classes. I am going to uh, try to save things now. It's going to freak out. 
So it's going to try to save everything at the same time and probably just break. Um, wow, it actually succeeded. It normally doesn't. You know, it normally freaks out and says, you know, you've got to save the interface first and then everything else. I'm actually not even sure I'm willing to believe that it did that. But I'm gonna just I'm just gonna save it all. Let's see how it goes. Service desk application. And last but not least, this one. Okay. So we've got all these implementation classes. Cool. But right now. If I was a controller, uh, if, I, if I was building an Apex controller, I would still kind of have to, well, let's just figure out a way to call this with no notion of the implementation specific class. Uh, it's kind of confusing maybe but bear with me um, we're going to create basically a middleman class to further abstract this so that a calling class never has to care or think about the implementation class ever so let's go over this um, and I will uh, Put my phone on silent for a second so it stops buzzing and uh, let's create our actual well let's create our middleman class I, I guess that's what i like to call it because that's kind of what i think of it as um we're just going to call this the uh service desk service yeah whatever happens to be a service desk it has a service class it is what it is okay um, uh, alright so what should we do from here alright so basically what we're gonna end up doing is the first method that we're gonna create in here is a private static um, service desk interface returning service method and it's going to take a string of record type. And what it's going to end up doing is returning a service desk interface. Service, what do we call it? Desk application service new instance by record type. And pass in the record type. I'm going to explain this, but give me a second to write one of the methods first, because it'll make a little more sense in context. So the next thing that we're going to do is do a basically implement both of these methods. So let me find the interface to make this a little easier. Now you notice we're not actually implementing these methods or implementing the interface in this one. Um, you don't want to here. And again, I will explain this a bit after we set it up together. Okay, um, so <clears throat> we actually want these instead to take a list of cases instead of individual cases so that we can kind of bulkify this implementation here and um, I'm just gonna grab this code and we'll talk through it actually I'll just write it it's fine it's not a lot of code so we'll say a list case case list equals new list of cases And what we'll do is loop through 
our cases that we just added in here or uh, sent into our method up here we'll loop through these and I'm not definitely not typing all this out again um, so basically we will using the um, schema class grab our record types name so if you've never used this pretty handy you can just figure out your record type IDs name um, I mean I guess you technically don't even need to do that here now that I'm thinking about it uh, let's let's simplify this down even more <laughs> um, case list dot add all service case or cs dot record type dot name and uh, oh, and call the stop entitlement process class and pass it this case all right and last but not least we'll do return case list okay cool all right so what is going on here let's break it down um, basically we're sending in a list of cases we've got to figure out on a case-by-case -case basis what record type we're dealing with right so that we can initialize the right service implementation class based on the uh, current cases record type right so here we go this is where it all comes together um, so let's break this down I'm gonna go ahead and just copy this up here to make this a little easier this is just gonna call the start entitlement process okay so let's break this down piece by piece because this is where all the stuff that we built merges itself together in this what I call middleman class so this middleman class that your controllers or your batch classes or whatever else is actually calling is number one bulkified and number two um, it uh, it has no context to the individual implementations right it doesn't the calling class doesn't know that I'm calling the marketing service implementation or B2C service implementation or anything like that so you've separated all of that out now right so you've abstracted it all even more to the point where your calling classes they're never gonna change they're just gonna call this service middleman that is going to figure things out for it and call the right code at runtime for it. Now here's where um, the magic, in my opinion, kind of starts to happen. We've got this service method here that returns us a type service desk interface, which if you remember is the interface that we implemented in all of these impl classes, right? Important stuff and it's going to call our service desk application and grab the service um, variable that we set up and it's going to call in the fflib application uh, class that new instance by record type method that we set up right so if we hit control b this is going to take us to the method that we set up right at the beginning of this that says all right you know based on the record type you passed me let's create a new instance uh, or return a new instance of you know whatever implementation class and so up here what we're doing is we're saying hey service service method I want to pass you this record type and have a service desk interface class returned to me or a class that implements the service desk interface returned to me and because I know due to the impl the, the contract of the interface that the stop entitlement process 
method exists on it, I can call the stop entitlement process method, right? So every class that implements that interface is going to be forced to implement these methods. So the code is smart enough to know, hey, you're of type service desk interface, cool. You can call stop entitlement process. And now what happens is when you, you put it all together, what we're going to end up seeing is by calling this service method and passing the record type name, we are going to call the service or we're going to grab the service desk applications service uh, variable. And because that service variable is of type fflib application, we can call the new instance by record type. And when we pass in that record type, the map that we set up here, map that we set up here, right, is going to return to us based on our record type name, the help desk B2B service implementation class or the B2C implementation class. If we're that record type, marketing, whatever, right? Pretty cool stuff. So let's save this and I think I've got some code although it calls a different class yeah okay still got it over here and we need to call instead the service desk service underscore desk service dot start entitlement process and the stop entitlement process and we're just gonna run this and see what happens hopefully it works but you know I could have screwed something up we went pretty quick looks like I screwed something up so let's go see what it is. Ah, right, maybe. We never went back to the application and updated this. That's important. So um, let's update this to the implementation classes that we actually ended up doing. B2B service desk in impl service desk B2C and service desk marketing impulse. Yep. And we'll give it another go and see if it works maybe if I'm lucky. Nope, nope, nope. Which one is this? All right, so um, I figured out what the problem was. It was uh, pretty easy to resolve. <laughs> Honestly, probably shouldn't even cut this, but whatever it is, what it is. Basically, I couldn't get the uh, record type name from directly from the case. Uh, even if I inserted it and requeried for it, for some reason, it just won't give it to me. So, uh, I suppose there's a reason that I made this to begin with, <laughs> but it's been a while since I made it, and I guess I forgot about it. Um, so anyway, now that we are grabbing the record type name uh, via the schema object. Uh, using the record type ID on the case, problem solved. No issue anymore. So that's the only thing I've changed. You can see in these two methods, instead of going uh, case.recordType.name, I'm now grabbing the actual record type name using the schema class. And um, that's it. So that's the only code change I've made. Let's go on ahead and see if this Apex Anonymous code will run and do what we think it will do, which is call a different implementation class based on the record type that we're passing it in at that moment in time. So let's check it out. And it does look to have done that, which is great, thankfully. <laughs> um, so as you can see over here in the Apex Anonymous window, I'm creating a B2B case, then a B2C case, then a marketing case, and over here, you can see that we are looking and seeing, all right, the current record type is 
case sales process, and it did successfully call the B2B start entitlement process. And um, same thing going on here. We passed in a B2C sales case. It started the B2C entitlement process, marketing case, marketing process, B2B, uh, and then we also call the stop process down here. And so then the next thing you see is B2B sales uh, stop entitlement process, stop B2C one, stop marketing one. So great, dynamically, at runtime, based on our record type, we generated the right class to call the method on, which is just, in my opinion, an incredible thing. It's like one of the coolest things that you can implement in code. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, I, I love to code, so there's a lot of really amazing things that you can do the further you kind of dive into to software development in general. But this is just uh, pretty awesome, right? And what it does is it really helps you modularize out everything. Um, you don't, you know, have to shove any everything in one giant class for all of these different business units, you can really, you know, separate out your methods uh, or, or your logic really well for each business unit implementation, right? And then on top of that, you know, your calling classes don't, they'll never even have to know anything about these implementation classes, uh, potentially. So um, there's just an enormous amount of flexibility in here, as I think you can see if you've followed along through this whole thing. And, um, you know, it it's going to make, even though this is hard to learn and get used to, it's going to make your life easier if you implement this and your org grows and grows and grows and grows because if you don't do something like this, you're going to just start smashing logic together until it's huge and has a bunch of spanning if statements that just confuse everyone eventually. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's all I've got to say about it, I suppose. It's very powerful, as you can see. You can really start separating out your, your services in really meaningful ways. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, I think, is it for this episode. All right, guys, so welcome to this ninth episode of the Separation of Concerns in Apex Common Tutorial Series. In this episode, we're going to go over the template method design pattern and, uh, you know, what it is, why it's useful, how it fits into separation of concerns, and how it fits into the uh, Apex Common library. So, uh, the first thing that we'll go over is what it is. Uh, the template method design pattern is a behavioral design pattern. Um, if you want more information on what a behavioral design pattern is, I'm not going to go over it in this video, but in the um, wiki that I have, it goes over it. You know, there's an article that I link that goes over what behavioral design patterns are, so you can get a little more information on that there. But basically what the template method pattern is, is um, a pattern that allows you to create a... I like to describe it as a genericized skeleton class. So it allows you to define all of the generic code. Um, and it's a class that a subclass can extend and add functionality to to make it work in the way that that class needs it to work. That's a little confusing. Um, and it's hard to explain what that is without showing you an example of it. And I think the most popular example that the vast majority of people are going to at least have some level of, you know, uh, of an introductory to is a trigger handler. If you've ever used a trigger handler framework, chances are it uses the template method pattern. And let me show you what I mean by that. This is one of the more popular trigger handler frameworks, the, the, the one by uh, Kevin O'Hara and it defines as you can see in this class that another class can extend 
it defines a lot of functionality, right? Like there's tons and tons and tons of stuff in here. Uh, it's a, I guess there's not tons and tons of stuff, but you know, it's a couple hundred line class that does a lot of things for you. That being said, it's pretty much gonna do nothing for you if you don't override and implement some of these uh, uh, empty methods here, right? So it provides to you a template this, this trigger handler class provides to you a template, right, that gives you lots of uh, functionality just pre-built into it. But it expects you in the trigger handlers that you make to override these empty methods and do something with it. So for instance, if I took this popular trigger handler and I made a case trigger handler, so I've got this case trigger handler, that extends that trigger handler class and it extends it because it's a virtual class that we have the ability to extend and then we override our before insert method which you can see down here is one of our uh, methods that you know we need to implement to be able to have context specific you know uh, functionality or really object specific functionality in, in this uh, situation. So as you can see it's very useful and the reason why this pattern is useful is because say for instance I didn't have a trigger handler framework but I wanted to do all these kind of things right I wanted I wanted to have this functionality to be able to stop my trigger. If you didn't know, this, this trigger framework gives you the ability to stop your uh, triggers, restart your triggers, um, you know, determine how many times your trigger is called, all, a bunch of other things, right? Um, but if I wanted to give that functionality to every trigger handler class and I didn't have this, you know, trigger handler that follows that template method pattern, well, I'd just end up implementing it in every single class, right? Every single trigger handler class I made, I'd implement all of this functionality potentially, which, I mean, that's not great, right? It's, it's not great at all. <laughs> so um, instead, right, I've, I've got this ability now to inherit all of this awesome functionality from this trigger handler framework on any trigger handler I want, and I don't have to rewrite all this code every single time. Instead, I've just got to have it extend the trigger handler class and uh, it just will inherently gain all of that, you know, all, all of that uh, code that can be abstract, right? And does not have to be uh, object or context specific. So, right, you can see that this this really has a lot of utility in that you don't have to repeat yourself as often in your code if you start leveraging this template method pattern in places where you can you know say have 75 80 maybe even 90 percent of your code be abstract and work in a variety of situations and um, maybe only 10 percent of it needs to have an object specific uh, or you know situation specific code uh, so, anyway, that's uh, basically what it is. You've got a skeleton class. This is, in my, this is what I refer to as the skeleton class, the trigger handler. And then um, you've got your basically empty methods in here that are expected to be overridden um, in your object-specific or context-specific class so that you actually get the, the true benefit out of you know this template that you've built um, I think that there's a lot of other videos out there that explain this in terms of like Photoshop templates and artwork templates and stuff like that uh, but I really wanted to express this I guess in code terms that I think more developers might grasp uh, there's a lot of other videos out there that do explain this in other terms, so this is still a little confusing. I'll link a couple of them that I like in uh, in the description below so that you can get some more information about it. Um, as far as, you know, how does this fit into the Apex Common Library? 
Uh, that aspect is pretty simple. It is used heavily by the FFlib, I mean, the FFlib SI object domain class utilizes the template method pattern in the same way that pretty much all trigger handlers do. Um, we're going to get into the S object domain class in a couple episodes, episode 11, I believe. But effectively what this is, is it, it, it's more than this, but it's, it's like a trigger uh, handler. It's got a lot of the same functionality as a trigger handler. There's quite a bit more to it than that, but um, at its core anyway, that's what it is. So it manages uh, or, you know, it leverages that uh, the template method pattern to allow you to do um, a lot of that trigger related stuff, right? So it's, it's, in my opinion, at least a little important that you understand this pattern so that you're not like super confused. Why do you have to do it this way? Why was it designed this way? All that kind of stuff. That's kind of why I wanted to briefly go over that in this tutorial series. But just so you know, that is where it's leveraged in this FFlib S object domain class. And we'll see that late in, in the next couple episodes. Um, as far as where does this fit into separation of concerns, it's not like it's directly tied to it, but it certainly helps with it. And the fact that, it, you know, in the, it, it allows you to separate your abstract code from your implementation specific code, right? So you, you follow things like the dry principle and the solid principles, which is, you know, dry just stands for don't repeat yourself, you know. <laughs> and this allows you, this template method pattern allows you in a lot of situations to not repeat yourself. Uh, which is great. You know, it saves you a lot of code. It saves you saves you from implementing the same thing over and over, potentially in different ways, uh, for no reason. So uh, it's beneficial there, and that you can separate out your abstractions from your from your context specific code, and um, you know, still benefit from all that abstract code in your context specific classes. So that's kind of where it um, fits into the whole separation of concerns conversation I guess to an extent um, but other than that I think that's most of what we need to cover for this uh, I don't want to go into too much depth here it's not ultra critical that you understand this in and out but it is important that you understand how it kind of works or why this pattern exists and how it fits into things so again if you want more information definitely check out the wiki that I've created for this tutorial series. It has a bit more information in there. Uh, and I'll link a couple of videos to uh, in the description of this video that I think are good examples of template method patterns, but might not be specific to Salesforce and, you know, I guess a development situation. So anyway, guys, that is it for this episode. All right, guys, so welcome to this 10th episode of the Separation of Concerns and Apex Common tutorial series. In this episode, we're gonna go over the domain layer. Um, what it is, when you should create a domain layer class, how it differs from the service layer, among other things. So, let's get to it. <laughs> um, what is a domain layer class? This is something I think most people are very confused about. Honestly, I think that this layer is uh, the layer that, for some reason, people get very confused about more than, more than any of the other ones. Um, so let me explain. A domain layer class is an object-specific class. Uh, and what I mean by that is it represents a single object in your system whereas service classes typically don't. You know, every once in a while you might have a service class that in a way kind of represents a single object, but typically it doesn't. Um, it represents, you know, cross-object functionality. Maybe you've got like a sales application or something, and there's like a, I don't know, automatic opportunity finder or creator or I don't I don't know opportunity profit calculator whatever that might span across a lot of objects it could be opportunity opportunity line item um, quote quote line items things like that 
that service could span across a whole bunch of objects, right? But your domain layer class represents a single object and only that single object, right? And um, if you've ever made, this is a simplification, I'll explain this a little more in detail in a second, but if you've ever made a trigger handler uh, class in your Salesforce instance, you've kind of already made a domain layer class. Trigger handlers are in a way a domain layer class. They represent, you know, object specific actions that must be taken, you know, on the insert, update, delete, undelete, etc. Right? So domain layer classes are really trigger handler classes with the addition of object specific behavior and this is where I think people get the most confused is what is object specific behavior right like well, what does that mean and I know I continue to use this example but I really think that this example is the best one in Salesforce for the vast majority of people to grasp so let's go over it <laughs> in Salesforce in the many implementations I've done Almost everyone uses the task object. And it seems, at least in my case, that almost every object has a different automatic creation of tasks. They want different things filled out for the subject. They want different um, fields on the task object to be filled out, filled out based on the object. So in this domain layer class that represents the case object down here I have a create tasks method that creates tasks in a case specific way so if you have something like this and that could be a, a lot of a lot of things uh, you know I I don't know but for this example we're using tasks lots of objects have in your system probably create tasks and they probably create them in different ways when you're implementing a domain layer you would probably you would really want to put that on your domain layer you'd create a domain layer class have a create tasks method here and um, then you know how for your cases you know you have an easy way to just grab the way to create tasks for cases Great, right? You know exactly where that object specific behavior resides. And that's in your domain layer class, right? And now you always know, okay, if I need to create tasks in a way that's specific for cases, I can come here and get this logic and get it done. Great, right? This, I think, is the most confusing thing. Domain layer classes also, um, at least if you're using the Apex Common Library, um, and really probably should in all instances in my in my personal opinion should also include in, in, <laughs> include include your um, trigger setup so if you um, you know need on on before basically before insert or before update or whatever else th that should really probably reside in this class too and that way you have all of that kind of truly object specific logic housed in the same place and you know where to go to get that stuff if you need it. Um, it makes it really nice and organized and all that other stuff. So, okay, domain layer classes, we figured out what they are. At their absolute minimal amount, they are trigger handlers. At their maximum amount, they're trigger handlers plus object specific behavior. And technically, they could be one or the other. Maybe your cases object doesn't actually need a trigger, but you'd like to have your create tasks method stored somewhere that makes sense. Make a domain layer and store that object specific behavior there. Maybe your case object doesn't need object specific behavior yet, but it does need a trigger. Well, um, that's fine. Put your trigger methodology in your domain layer class and, and work on it, right? Cool. 
That's what the domain layer is, more or less. It's an object-specific implementation that represents both a trigger and object-specific behavior. Um, I don't want to go any further than that because I don't think we need to. Um, the other things that we should, um, I guess, go over is your options for domain layer classes um, as far as frameworks are concerned. Now, unlike the service layer, which we went over before, there's no frameworks that you could ever use for the service layer because it's business-specific logic that's specific to your business, so there's no way anybody could ever provide that to you. There is a way to provide, of course, like default logic, I suppose, at least for a trigger handler. Um, so there's a bunch of different options that you can go with here. My personal favorite, having taken the time to look at a lot of frameworks to get this layer in place, is the Apex Common Library. I've spent way too much time, hundreds of hours, investigating um, several, uh, well, several, five or six frameworks, and... Um, across all these different layers and uh, the best one in my opinion is Apex Common one and it has nothing to do <laughs> it's just I've spent a lot of time with it and that's my my feelings I know everybody has a different opinion but you can of course use the Apex Common library and they have the ability to go with the um, you know they provide you this s object domain class to get a lot of this work done uh, like preset up for you anyway. You can also go with something along the lines, uh, you know, if you if you don't want to go with the Apex Common Library, which I fully understand, everybody's different. Um, if you want to implement a domain layer and you don't want to reinvent the wheel, uh, there are some other libraries. The Apex Trigger Actions Framework is a a pretty good one. The SFDC trigger framework is a very simple but very effective one so if you're not like super comfortable even after this tutorial series going through and using the Apex Common library which by the way we will have a tutorial over the Apex Common uh, how to implement this layer in the Apex Common library so in the next episode but if you if you want to start somewhere this is probably the best place to start it's very simple um, very straightforward. I do have a tutorial going over this one specifically, so I'll link that one as well. I have my tutorial for that anyway. Um, and then there is the My Triggers framework, which is also a pretty good one um, that's been around for some time. It's got some pretty decent support for it. So uh, those are my, I guess, four choices. If you're going to implement the domain layer and you want to start somewhere um, that's where I would start these different libraries Apex Common Library Trigger Actions Framework um, SFDC Trigger Framework and the My Triggers Framework are all great places to start and try try it out um, the SFDC Trigger Framework is by far the, the simplest one and it'll get you on the right path um, if you want to but like I said, in the next tutorial, we're going to go over the uh, how to implement the domain layer using the Apex Common Library. So hopefully it'll be a lot easier to, uh, you know, do. And it's not as confusing. Um, all right. I think we've gone over everything we need to go over in this. If you want some more information on, um, at least my opinion, on what the best naming conventions are for domain layer classes and transaction management and things along those lines you can go check out the github wiki it's got a few a, a little bit more information about that stuff i'll link it in the video and uh yeah thanks for uh <laughs> sticking around this long hopefully this has made it a little easier to figure out what the domain layer actually is because i think it's a little easier when somebody explains it to you but it's very it is very confusing when you're trying to figure it out
And, uh, yeah. Alright guys, so welcome to the 11th episode of the Separation of Concerns in Apex Common Tutorial Series. Uh, if you stuck with me this far, congratulations. <laughs> you're pretty close to, to, to done. Um, but, you know, if you're just here just to look at the domain layer, that's cool too. So, let's go over this. Um, what we're going to do today is build a uh, an implementation uh, of a domain layer using the basically we're going to build a domain layer class really uh, using the uh, fflib s object domain class which uh, is on the screen right now so basically we're going to create a domain layer class using the apex common library now why would you choose to um you know, implement your domain layers using the Apex Common Library as opposed to the other ones. Uh, to be honest, when I started this video series, I wasn't um, I wasn't one hundred and ten percent sold on Apex Commons or a the Apex Common Library. Uh, I'd heard a number of bad things, heard good things, heard bad things. It was up in the air. I've spent now, <laughs> because of this series, hundreds of hours with not just this library but other libraries and I can tell you from experimenting with a bunch of different ones um, this in my opinion is is such a well-built library I'm honestly surprised when things like this exist it's it's just it's just really well designed um, and not to mention that but in, in comparison to other libraries um, it's got tons more support so you know it's it's always going to be updated um pretty quick i would imagine to to you know work with whatever new features salesforce puts out which is frequently obviously so uh, as far as why you might want to use the apex common library to implement a domain layer that's why if you want to know why to implement a domain layer go back to the video before this one where i you know, explain what a domain layer is and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that's my take on it anyway. Having spent an enormous amount of time recently over the last several months investigating all this stuff and uh, working with a bunch of different libraries. There are great libraries out there, but this is, uh, in my opinion, it's something pretty special. We're very lucky it exists. <laughs> all right, there's my pitch for Apex Common and why you should use it. Let's move on and make and make a uh, domain layer class. Um, so we are going to make a domain layer class on the account object, and um, I'm going to show you how to, um, you know, implement the trigger aspects of the uh, domain layer and and then just other things about it. But let's, uh, yeah, let's get right to it. So the first thing that we're going to make is an accounts trigger. So we are, or actually, um, I'm going to make an accounts trigger handler, or really an accounts domain class. Uh, but I'm trying to make this as easily accessible as I can. Uh, we're going to make an accounts domain class. Um, now, if you didn't know, the way it is suggested anyway by many people and you can have your own take on this if you want it's not like it's the end of the world um, when you name your domains they should be a plural version of your object now you can change that up it's not like that's set in stone but um, if you wanted to follow those rules then our domain layer class for the account object would be accounts right cool so we've got our accounts class. And the first thing that we need to do is set up um, basically what I refer to at least as our, our template for our domain layer class. Because if you're using the Apex Common Library, you need to set up these things um, no matter what object you're working with at that given time. So the first thing that we'll need to do is implement the fflib S, uh, S object <laughs> domain and um, 
After that, there's a couple methods that we need to implement, despite them not being, it doesn't force you, or actually, oh my gosh, I don't want to implement this, sorry. Extends the FFLibS object domain. Very different, very different. You implement an interface, you extend a virtual class. The FFLibS object domain is a virtual class. Oh, brain, just got to help me out here maybe. Um, now there's two methods that you need to implement even though it's not required that you implement them because we're just extending another class. It doesn't force you to implement anything. Uh, we need to uh, create a constructor. So this is important even though it's not, um, you know, it's not going to force you to do this. You do need to do this or else it won't uh, work as you anticipated. You anticipate it working. And this needs to call super and pass our account records. Now, I'll explain why we need to do this in, a, in just a second, but let's get through the rest of this stuff. The one other method that we need to implement here is a constructor. So we're going to call it public class. Uh, it's really, sorry, you need to implement an inner class called constructor. Uh, it's, this is actually not a method, rather an um, inner class. And this is, uh, I believe, due to the fact that there's no actual, um, yeah, no, I'm right. Um, FFLib S object domain I can I constructible. There we go. Okay, and the reason that you want to do this is because uh, Apex, at least as of this date, you know, uh, May 1st, 2021, does not have real reflection. Um, so the way that this constructor works, it helps, it helps um, basically, it's basically like pseudo reflection. Um, if you're not familiar with what reflection is, I'll stick something in the comment or in the um, description of this video where you can, you know, check out what that actual mean or actually is. I do not want to bog down this video with a technical explanation of that though. So I'm not going to get into it. And accounts. All right. Cool. So, um, you do need to implement these. No matter, uh, you know, what it is. Oh, wow. Uh, got this wrong here. This should just be S object. So, you do need to implement this. Uh, you need to create, rather, this inner class called constructor that implements the FFLib S object domain I constructible class. And then this inner class needs to have this construct method that basically just returns um, an instance of this class, more or less. So, um, yes, if you're using the FFLib, or, you know, the Apex Common Library, you need to have these two things. And uh, you need to have these two things because this class is looking for them to exist. Whenever you put this in a trigger handler, it's looking for this, this guy here. Uh, or whenever you use this in a trigger, uh, which we'll go over in a bit, it's going to look for, for this guy. Um, and then if you're, if you are going to initialize this class outside of the context, context of a trigger, um, even in the context of a trigger, it's important, but both of these, um, you really need this because what this ends up doing is in the FFLibS object domain class, there is this records here right? There's this records variable that we're taking a look at. And um, this records variable is uh, super important. It's basically what's going to end up being your trigger.new or your, basically your records that you can work with in the context of your, your domain class that you're making right now. Um, so very important that you pass those along to the super class. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to have much to work with. Okay, so now that we know what we need at a base level, let's check out some of the other 
um, methods that we can work with in the domain class. Um, Actually, the first thing that I want to do is show you how if you wanted to use this in a trigger, your domain class, sometimes you don't need your domain to be used in a trigger. You just want it to house object-specific behavior, which we went over in the last video. So if that's confusing, please go back and, and check it out. Um, but sometimes you just uh, you, you actually want this domain class to be executed in a trigger. So let's just figure out real quick how we would set up a trigger to call this class. All right. So we're going to not create an Apex class, but we are going to um, create an Apex trigger. And uh, to make sure that I don't tell you something wrong, I'm going to, oh my goodness, if I can click trigger instead of class, that would be great. There we go. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I'm going to name my trigger the same thing. That's typically what I end up doing. And, um, you know, if you've never used IntelliJ before in Illuminated Cloud 2, that's what I'm in. But, uh, and that's why I'm getting this nice little UI. If you're using Visual Studio Code, you won't get this, but that's fine. We'll explain it in a second. So, uh, say for instance, you wanted a trigger with that ran on before and after insert. We've got our trigger called accounts on the account object, and we want to call our domain class from this trigger in a trigger context, right? Well, this is how we're going to do it. It's very simple. It's one line, and that is it. We're going to say fflib s object domain trigger handler, and then we're going to call the accounts dot class. And that is it. Um, inside of the FFLibS object domain class, I just clicked the in IntelliJ. You can click uh, Control B to go right to this implementation in the in the class that we, you know, just made that class call or that method call from. Um, you can take a look at the trigger handler class. Basically, you know, it's got it's got all this stuff. That you want. I'm not going to go over each of those, but you can kind of see how um, in here the it it uses that like pseudo reflection that I was talking about before with the constructor class to determine how to how to do things. So that's why that constructor that inner constructor class is important. Um, it does look for that in this trigger handler method in the FFLibS object domain class, which is what we're checking out at the moment. All right, so we've got our account trigger. This is it. That's that's all we need. Um, just as one call, and then this will execute our um, accounts domain class to do trigger-related work. But now the question is, how do I set up this domain class to do any of that trigger work? right because <laughs> right now it's not I mean it's not really doing anything except for it's got this nice little constructor deal here that it works with and the uh, actual regular constructor here so um, let's figure that out the first couple methods we're gonna look at are kind of interesting I guess uh, there's a whole bunch of methods because like we went over in episode nine, I believe the template method pattern, that's basically what this FFLibS object domain class uses. And it is expecting us to take a bunch of empty methods that we can override in the FFLibS object domain class and create our own object specific variant of that method. So uh, let me show you what I mean. There are a couple of uh, methods called, uh, let's see, public, <clears throat> uh, whoa, 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 da, 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 da. yeah, okay, I'm not wrong. Public override void on apply defaults. So this is one of the uh, first methods that you might consider using that exists in the FFLibS object domain class. And if we go into the FFLibS object domain class, again, I'm 
pressing control B here, and we look at the on apply defaults method, we can see this is an empty method. And um, we can also see from the comments here that this on apply defaults is called by the handle before insert method. So basically, what this is going to do if you decide to override it is apply default characteris characteristics to every record that is inserted into the system for you. So say, for instance, we wanted all of our um, <clears throat> accounts to, I, I don't know. We, this is this is not what you would do, by the way. Uh, I, it doesn't matter. Let me just go through it. Say we want all of our accounts to have a specific field filled out. Um, we would do a little bit of this. And we would say uh, account dot. Mm, oh, I don't know. We'll say description equals cool account or something. Maybe we want all of the descriptions of our accounts to be something particular. I don't know what that is. Maybe it has their name in it. I don't know. Could be anything, right? Um, now, you basically what this is going to end up doing is on the insert of an account, the description field is now going to get automatically filled out. So this on apply defaults gets called in, in trigger context the instant or you know in the before insert context of a trigger so you might be wondering uh, what this records variable is for and I know that we kind of went over this before um, but let me just reiterate this point oh and uh, before I get too far I realize I have casted this wrong Ooh, this should be a list of accounts so this records variable like we talked about before is is what well <laughs> let's go over it this way when you're in trigger context, right, the records variable, which if I go to this, is not housed in our accounts class, but rather the fflib s object domain class that it extends. So this records variable in the fflib s object domain class uh, basically equates to trigger.new um, in all trigger contexts except for after delete because if you didn't know and after delete there is no trigger dot new because you've deleted the records <laughs> so in after delete the records variable gets set to uh, basically trigger dot old so um, <clears throat> okay so we've got this on apply defaults method that we just went over it's going to get called by the uh, uh, before insert um, method when basically the before insert context of our trigger when it runs. Um, we can also go over a couple of other ones. So there's a, another one that's called uh, on validate. So we've got on validate here. And basically what this one is going to do, this on validate method, uh, it's, I mean, technically you can do whatever you want in it, right? But um, its purpose is to house validations for your um, domain class. Uh, and there are two versions of on validate. There is the one that we just wrote, which runs on um, after insert, I believe. Um, or maybe it's before insert. We can go take a look at that. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. And then there's another one that is um, for after, uh, or sorry, for update. Um, transactions and um, it has the it's got a, a different method signature even though it does the same thing because this um, actually ends up passing in trigger context back to you the um, trigger dot old map so this existing records that you can see I've um, Put in here this basically equates to trigger.old um, so you typically need that when you're doing updates in one way or another all right so let me just go double check that my uh, remembering of this is right where does unvalidate get called it uh, does get called after insert and after update and um, yeah 
So cool, 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 cool. And we'll just put some validation in here just to show you how this would be done. Now you might be asking yourself uh, or asking or thinking to yourself maybe, uh, why would you need an onValidate method when there are validation rules? And that's a fair question. But some validations are um, too difficult for validation rules, right? Uh, if you've not done a lot of, oh wait, what am I doing here? If you've not done a lot of Salesforce development, maybe you haven't run into those scenarios, but it can certainly get to that point um, where you've got validations that are way too complicated for a validation rule. We don't really have that right here. Um, uh, if I need to, I'm, so I'm going to throw a validation if the type isn't filled out just so that we can see that this does indeed run if account type you know maybe if I can have my brain work while I talk then we'll do account dot add error type must be filled out okay um, yeah the other thing is maybe you've got uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this this um, topic but even though they don't outright like market it a whole bunch Salesforce actually recommends that you only use like one type of uh, what, what would you call it one type of like um, basically you need to choose whether or not you want to use configuration or or um, code at a certain point like you shouldn't use triggers with process builders and flows you should pick one technology and stick with it and that's because there's just you can get yourself into a lot of challenging situations so at a certain point you might decide okay I don't want the validation rules anymore I just want to house them in here because I've got 90 percent of my validations in my trigger um, or I just I have to put validations in my trigger so let's put them in here anyway uh, there's a there's a bunch of reasons why you at least several reasons why you might want to put um, validations within the trigger itself all right so I'm gonna go on and delete this method for the moment um, but just know that if you want uh, validations to occur on after update you would put them here and ideally if you needed the same validations in both places right you'd create a, another smaller method to be called so you don't you know <laughs> You don't have the same code uh, written a bunch of times. Um, all right, so let's remove this. And I just want to go over one more thing. Public override void on for update. And that's easier to understand okay um, so I just wanted to go over these these um, other methods here uh, or, or really the trigger context methods that are kind of like straightforward I guess <laughs> so in our uh, accounts trigger we're running before insert after insert before update and you might be thinking to yourself well how do I know what code is gonna run in those scenarios you know, aside from the um, situations that we kind of described, these ones are automatically run in. Uh, how uh, do you, you know, I guess, define the on before update call, among other things, right? Um, if we head over to SS uh, or FFLibS object domain, we can see that there are these there are many class or methods that we can override right it's using that template method pattern that we went over a couple of episodes ago and this on before update or on before insert etc etc um, eventually gets called by this handle before update which eventually gets called in this trigger handler um, 
method that we call from our trigger, if you remember back here, right? Eventually all that stuff gets called and, you know, it basically says if it's, uh, where, where did we go here? If it's before and it's an update, then do handle before update and send it the trigger.old map, right? So um, the way this eventually works is, you know, without getting super into the weeds here, is you override these on before update, on before insert, on after insert, etc., etc. methods. There's one for every trigger context you can think of and you do whatever it is you want to do there. So we can add something in here where we say um, something like for, oh, and also just so you're aware, this old records, I know I've said this before, but I'm just going to keep saying it. This ends up being trigger.old, right? Trigger.old map specifically. So we could say for, um, Count uh, and I'm mostly building this just so you can see it works and it's simple, uh, not for any other reason. And uh, we'll just say hmm, if old records dot get count ID dot type is not equal to count dot type and it's uh, crying about this because as you can see I might have to cast this a different way actually uh, as you can see the uh, this is a map of S object, so it's not going to like that, that I'm trying to get an object specific record. So you would say something like account, count, uh, old account equals that. And then you'd say old account dot type. Okay. So basically, what's happening is because this is abstract, right, and it's supposed to be able to work on any object domain. Um, the way that this method inherently works is that you have a map of ID S object old record or you know in, in your trigger.old. So when you get in here you have to cast these things right to what they truly are. You have to cast your records to a list of accounts. You have to cast your you know I guess um, record that you get from your map as an account and um, so those things are important to know. If you don't do that, then it's going to complain and say records is not an instance of an account because it's an S object, blah, blah, blah. If you don't know what casting is, definitely check that out. It is a very important concept to understand. So we're, we'll just say if old account dot type is not equal to the current, you know, our new account type, then we will set it. We'll set it to... Um, We'll set something else on it. We'll say account description equals type changed or something like that, right? And uh, in just a minute here, I'll go over um, this and I'll show you it running and that all these things do indeed work. Um, but first, I have to figure out, you know, what exactly I screwed up. Oh, it's not in here. I guess I messed up was messing with some other class <laughs> okay cool so this one's fine um, <clears throat> let's go over just a handful of other uh, things Whoa. that are important so number one if you didn't know for every single one of these videos there is a very in-depth wiki that goes over a wiki article in this um, github repo here which I will link in the description but um, th there's tons and tons of information in here how to access all of your trigger variables for your domain class um, how uh, all the different available methods that uh, you can leverage from the fflibs object domain class there's you know 
the on apply defaults and on validate methods that we talked about, but more than that, there's on before insert, on after delete, all those other things. And on top of that, there's a couple of other useful methods like get changed records, which is really awesome. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have time to go over that, but basically it'll return you a list of records that have had their fields changed and none of none of the other records that you don't care about. So it's pretty cool allowing you to sift things out. Um, <clears throat> man, I guess somebody decided to vacuum in the middle of this video, so if you can hear it, sorry. <laughs> you can only control so much. Um, okay, so the other thing that's useful in here is a couple of stu things called um, configure in the configuration inner class in this fflib s object domain class. So um, you can turn on and off a couple of things in the configuration called uh, trick. You can turn on and off trigger state, and you can turn on and off CRUD security. Um, this is important because say you want some variables to be retained between your before portion of the trigger and the after portion of the trigger that won't just naturally happen if you want that to happen you need to use this configuration dot enable trigger state and that's not like challenging at all to do if you needed to do that you could just in your constructor say well if you didn't know this super has to be on the first line or else it'll cry um, but you could say configuration dot enable trigger state and there you go you've got what you need you do need to be careful with enabling trigger state though it can cause uh, recursive behavior and the other thing is if you don't want like crud security to be enforced then um, you can well, where, where is it enforce trigger crud security there you go um, you can turn this on and off so you can enable and disable it there's another one that's disable tr trigger crud security if you don't know what crud security is that's your create read update delete security stuff um, for objects so if you want that to be disabled for one reason or another that's important uh, and then there's a bunch of other really useful things in here that allow you to turn your trigger off when you want to turn the, a portion of your trigger off. So if you, well, if you uh, wanted to, you know, say for instance, enable or disable the before insert method in your trigger, you could do that. Same thing for update, delete, um, undelete, things along those lines. You could also just disable all of your trigger all at once. Um, and then enable it all at once, or enable all before co uh, context of your trigger, or disable all of them as well. So that can be really useful, especially if you're in other triggers and you have to make an update to say the account uh, in a different object. So if I was in the account trigger and I was making updates to the case object, I'd probably want to turn the trigger off for that moment in time so it doesn't refire for no reason. And uh, these are extremely useful in that way. So, um, yeah, lots and lots and lots of other useful things that are in here. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Now, um, you might be wondering, okay, where does the trigger, or, or sorry, in, in the domain class, where does the um, behavior piece come in? Is there anything pre-built for that? And outside of the on apply defaults and on validate, there's nothing that's pre-built for, you know, your object's behavior. I mean, as you can see, most of the stuff that's specific to how your object should, you know, operate in certain scenarios, you have to build yourself. But in the last video, for instance, I gave the example of creating tasks. Obviously, there can't be anything pre-built for that. You just have to make a method to you know check that out um, or or to be able to build that you know uh, behavior I suppose so before we just demo that this works let me show you how two different ways you would call this domain class outside of the trigger context so we know how to call it in trigger context we've been over this um, but let me go over actually 
two things, two things that I want to go over really quick. Um, well, actually, we'll just we'll just do this. <laughs> I don't want to overcomplicate things. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do, I will show you how you would just initialize this accounts class if you weren't using the application factory that we went over. I can't remember episodes four and five, I think, or three and four, something like that. Um, if you don't use application factory, that's fine. You're losing a lot of really awesome things that you get with um, Apex Common, but I also understand if you're not comfortable with it, it is what it is. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is um, just how to initialize this in a normal way. <laughs> you would say accounts new accounts, just like normal, but you need to pass it in a list of records, right? So I'd be like a list of accounts. Oh, if I can spell accounts. Okay, so so I could initialize my domain this way for sure, right? Easy, super easy. I mean, that's pretty straightforward if you've ever initialized a class. Nothing special there. If I wanted to initialize this with my application class, though, the first thing that I'd need to do is go down to where my domain factory is in this application class that I built. So I've got my domain factory variable, and I've already done this, but you need to map your account s object type to your new accounts domain class, right? Cool. Once we've done that, now we can, you know, when we call this domain dot new instance, we can get from the account s object type a new account. Um, uh, a new instance basically of our accounts domain class that we set up. So if we came back here and we said um, uh, fflib, uh, well, no, it's not going to do that for me. fflib is object domain equals account domain. new instance and um, I can just I can send it in a couple different things I think I can send it in object type if I want to initialize it um, or a set of record IDs and uh, basically this is gonna get give you back based on your record IDs your appropriate domain so it's gonna figure out like these record IDs are of type account or a case or whatever else and then it's going to give me back the correct domain right you can kind of see this down here where it's a bit more abstract right I'm just calling this object domain and um, what I could do after that is I think I have something maybe not but what you could do if you're doing this in a more abstract way is then just figure out you know is it an instance of the accounts class so you would say something like if account domain is an instance instance oh my goodness <laughs> instance of accounts Wow, it really auto-completed some weird stuff for me. Then I would cast this account domain, you know, if I needed something specific on it. Okay. I'm maybe going to make it through this. I don't know. Just like that, right? So if I really needed to do something specific to the accounts um, domain in this kind of more abstract method here, then I could figure out, okay, this this domain is actually of type accounts, and then I can call the account specific methods on it, right? 
um, if I had any, which I guess I don't at the moment. But just so you know, this is how you would at least initialize a domain using the factory class. Cool. If that's confusing, go back a few episodes to the application factory setup and and hopefully it explains it more there. All right, so let's figure out if this uh, code actually works, right? Let's just prove that this setup is working like we want it to. And um, yeah, hopefully it does. We'll see. You never know. I mean, I'm prone to uh, screwing things up when I do these videos where I actually code in them. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll figure it out together. Uh, let's make a new account and initialize it without a type and see if it gives us that validation. So just as a refresher, I guess, um, we've got this on validate where if type equals null, we should get an error, add error that says type must be filled out. So let's give that a shot. It does say type must be filled out, which is great. And then the uh, second thing we have is that when we create a new account, it should be filled out with a description of cool account. So now that we've got a type, let's see if we get a description. And we do. Now there's one other thing we should test just to make sure that everything is working like we think it is. And that's if the old account type is not equal to the new account type, then let's change the description to type changed. So let's give that a shot. We'll change this type to customer direct. Hit save. And it did indeed update the description to type changed. So it looks like everything is working. And it looks like everything I've told you is, you know, true for the moment. Um, that being said, if there is anything at all that is not, uh, that has confused you, this should this wiki should help clarify any of that stuff. It uh, it gives a description of all of the very or all of the methods uh, that you can leverage. If you click on these links, it will actually take you to the source code where you can see, um, you know how this stuff actually works. Also, if you're confused at all about that factory thing that I was talking about. Uh, you can see there's a section on the FFlib application class and how it works, right? How that, um, you know, dynamic factory instantiation works and, and this whole, how this whole instance of situation works too. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of information there that'll help kind of bolster these videos, I hope. Um, Anyway, uh, that is it for this video. Looks like in the next one we're going to get into the builder pattern um, and uh, start our way through the selector layer, which is probably the simplest layer, but it's, um, it's an important one. So uh, that is it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, guys. So today in this 12th episode of the separation of concerns in apex common tutorial series we're going to go over the builder pattern what it is why you might use it and how it fits into this whole conversation of separation of concerns in the apex common library so um what is the builder pattern uh, the builder pattern is a creational design pattern uh, if you don't know what a creational design pattern is i'll put a link in the description so that you can go you know get a little bit more information about that um, but it allows you basically to to build complex objects one at a time, or one, one piece or part or step or whatever at a time. So the, uh, the example that I like to give, which we will build out here in just a little bit, is the is building a computer, right? You're building a desktop computer. Um, when you build that, there's lots of different pieces that you could select, right? And, you know, depending on what you're building, you could have a dozen plus parts. And it could be in a bunch of different variations. So say, for instance, you've got a website where customers pick out pieces for their computer. Um, you know, 
you've got a few options. Uh, the two most common ones, I guess, would be whenever they've picked out the pieces to their computer, they could hit like the enter button or something or build a computer button, I don't know. Some theoretical button that then goes and um, calls a constructor for a computer class that then constructs a computer. It's not a good option, I'll show you why in a bit. Or you could use something like the builder pattern where each time they select something, it uses the builder pattern to add a new part to that computer, which is a little a little easier to uh, deal with in my opinion, but we'll go over that in a second. Um, as far as why the builder pattern is useful, um, it's useful because it will um, do two things. Number one, it will reduce your overall code, uh, mostly because of what's referred to as telescoping tele telescoping constructors. I think that's how you pronounce that. Teles whatever. You'll see in a second. I I, I don't know. It's a whatever. Anyway, so it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna reduce the amount of code that you have. The um, uh, other thing that it'll allow you to do is make your code a little bit more flexible. Um, then you would maybe get stuck with otherwise if you didn't use the builder pattern. Um, so, and uh, the last thing, I guess, is, uh, right, how does it fit into separation of concerns? Before we get into a, a quick example, um, how does it fit into separation of concerns in the Apex Common Library? Well, it fits into the Apex Common Library because of this uh, FFLib query factory class, right? And <clears throat> this class is used heavily by the FFLib S object selector class. But basically, which I'm not going to show you an example just yet, um, but when we get into the selector, how to implement the selector layer using Apex Common, I will uh, show you, you know, how this FFLib query factory comes into play, I guess. It's used very heavily in it. Um, so, uh, and this class uses the factory pattern quite a lot, right? You can kind of see that if you run through the methods and you can see that the methods all return an instance of this class, right? So, um, as far as separation of concerns, again, you know, it's not necessarily directly associated with it, but it will reduce your code. It will separate out um, a bit your different concerns in this class, right? It's going to allow you to set different portions in different places as opposed to setting everything in one big constructor. So you get a lot more control over each piece of the thing that you're building. Um, but yeah, uh, let's just go over this example. I don't want to take too much time on it because this series is very long. Um, but I have built out an example of what this would look like in the um, wiki that I've put together, which you should definitely go check out. Um, it's just in this GitHub repo. I've got a wiki that goes over all of these concepts very in-depth. But let's just go over this. So if we were building a computer, right, and we were building this computer without a um, without using the, the builder pattern, uh, basically what we'd end up doing is calling a bunch of constructors to build out a computer uh, for us. So you can see in this public computer creator class um, that I've just got a bunch of different constructors in here that allow me to create computers with a variety of different things. So if we actually let me just grab this and explain this more in IntelliJ. So if we created this new class <clears throat> called, uh, whatever I called it, computer creator. Uh, 
Guess it doesn't think I have comp GPU, but whatever it is, what it is. So let's just take a look at this. If I wanted to uh, basically set up a bunch of different variants of computers using this non-builder class setup, uh, I have two options. Uh, the first one is what I've got set up here, right? Where basically I allow people to send in all, I force people really to send in all of the different computer parts, even if they're null, right? So um, this, um, this isn't really ideal, right? If I'm forcing people to send in every single part for their computer, even if they don't want speakers on their desktop, that's not super great. And it will result in a bunch of calls to this computer creator class that have nulls. Not to mention, right, if I wanted now, say, say I've got 10 different um, places that are calling this computer creator class and, and, and constructing it like this. But what happens now if I decide I want to add, um, I don't know, I will say a Wi-Fi card or something. I don't know, I've got Wi-Fi card, but whatever, you get it. I want to add a new piece, so we'll say new uh, computer part comp part, right? Now because I've only got this one constructor, I've got to go back and update everywhere that is using this um, to use the new or to add the, this new parameter computer part right I have to pass in null here or maybe I'll pass in another computer part whatever else the only other option that I have here if I didn't want to force them to put in every single thing every single time is to copy this constructor and make it so that I had different variants for every single one right and you could have you know potentially hundreds of these depending on the different pieces for your complex object that you're building right I could have one where I just pass in the motherboard because all they wanted to do is buy a motherboard or maybe motherboard and fan or maybe fan and network card or whatever else right so um, you can see how the telescoping constructor um, that's how I'm supposed to say it. Why, why did I have such a difficult time earlier? No, anyway, the telescoping constructor <laughs> situation can get out of, out of hand. You could have hundreds of these constructors that just, you know, go over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Not ideal, horrible situation uh, to get yourself into. It can get really unruly really, really fast. So the other option that you have is to use what's called the builder pattern. So if we use the builder pattern for the computer creator class instead of this whole constructor methodology here, let's see what would happen instead. So um, we've got now this computer creator class, but instead it's using the builder pattern where if we want to set a CPU for our, our computer, we set the selected CPU and return this. We set the, the GPU for it and then we return the computer creator, etc, etc, all the way down. Now, I must not... Oh, comp speakers? It doesn't matter. Um, it's not super important that I get this to actually work, I don't think. Although I am very... Oh, it's because it's of type speaker instead of speakers. Okay, so um, anyway, now what I would do if I was calling this class from somewhere else is something like this. I would say, you know, public void uh, create computer. And instead of uh, basically, you know, constructing it with one of those huge constructors that we just looked at. Instead, what we'd end up doing is say new computer creator dot 
set CPU, and then I'd pass it in a CPU. So it'd be like new CPU and what whatever else I needed in there. Obviously, these classes aren't real at the moment. I just did this really quick as an example. But then you'd say, you know, after that, set fan, etc. And if that's all I wanted to set, right, um, then that's all I'd need to set. I don't have to have a bunch of telescoping constructors over and over again. Um, and uh, you can see how that can drastically reduce your code and simplify things a bit, uh, quite, a, quite a bit. So you can have these complex option, or objects that you build one piece at a time, and they have these small methods that allow you to set each piece of the object, right? Um, <clears throat> and then when you're done, you know, you return that to the customer. So you could imagine, right, maybe in a controller class for a lightning web component or something, you have a computer creator variable. And maybe at some point, uh, a user gets to select a CPU for their computer, you'd set the CPU, maybe at some point they set the fan, you'd set the fan on the computer creator, on and on and on. So extremely simplified code in comparison to the other one where we could just get crazy out of hand, right? Um, so yeah, builder pattern, super useful. Uh, if you want more information on the builder pattern, how it works, any of that kind of stuff, uh, definitely head over to this wiki here that I've put together. Um, there's some useful links. There's a lot more information probably. And I'll link a couple videos that I like that talk about the um, builder pattern that you can take a look at too if you want more information about it past the you know quick introduction to it that I've done in this video. All right, guys. Um, hopefully, that has helped a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I never know if they do, but I hope they do. Um, and uh, in the next episode, we're actually going to start on uh, going through the selector layer. So episode 13, we're going to look at the selector layer. And episode 14, we'll go over how to implement it with the Apex Common Library. So... Uh, stick around and we'll do all those fun things too all right uh that is it i will talk to you guys later all right so welcome to the 13th episode of this separation of concerns and apex common tutorial series and in this episode we are going to go over the selector layer what it is when you should create one why you should use one all that kind of wonderful stuff along with your options for frameworks that at least I think are decent to implement, um, you know, the selector layer with. So what is the selector layer? The selector layer is something that's, um, I guess, kind of unique to, to Salesforce. It's, it's unique in that it's different than other tech stacks because of the way that Salesforce handled things. So no normally this would be called, I think, um, like the uh, data mapper layer something along those lines if you're in a typical tech stack but because of the way that salesforce handles objects uh for or handles the way that we are able to query for objects is a little different and in salesforce we call it the selector layer i'm not going to get into the differences it's not super important but that just know that because of the way that we're able to like query in line for things and deal with stuff and it being quite a bit different than other tech stacks we called the selector layer instead of a data mapper layer, which is what you would normally hear this called or or referred to as. So um, the selector layer is basically literally for selecting records. Uh, it's for your queries that you would do to your um, <clears throat> to your objects in, in Salesforce, right? It's a place to, to house all of that information. Now, the question is, I think that the most people have is why, why Matt? <laughs> why would you choose to make a selector layer? What's the point in that? Well, if you think about it, 
if you really think about it, you probably have hundreds, and if your org is big enough, maybe thousands of queries in your your Salesforce org. There are two reasons that it's beneficial to place all this all those queries into object specific selector classes. Um, the first one is uh, it's going to assist you greatly when it comes to unit tests. It's gonna it's gonna help a whole bunch <laughs> uh, if you want to do uh, mocking for unit tests, which we'll go over that in episodes 15, 16, and 17. So bear with me, and we'll we'll get more into that later. But if you're querying in line everywhere and you're not using a selector, basically what I can tell you is you're gonna you're gonna miss out on a lot of the the speed benefits anyway of unit testing, along with some other things. Um, but there's one unit tests. The second one, which is which is uh, very important, is that you get a lot of consistency in your queries, right? Um, it's very possible that you need all of these fields, for instance, to really be queried for on every 99% um, of your your queries for the case object. So this, what I'm showing you in front of me is a, an example of a case selector using the Apex Common library, which we'll go over this more in the next episode. But you, basically what you'll get is a lot more consistency in your queries, not to mention you'll get a place where all of these queries are stored, so you always know where to go to like update your queries if you need to update them, right? You don't have to like think about it. So let's go over both of those things really quick. Consistency. You can get consistency in the fields that get returned to you. You know, with this selector, every single query that I do, I'm going to get these fields returned to me. Uh, you can get consistency in your ordering. So for instance, if I wanted uh, all of my queries, or the vast majority anyway, of my queries to be ordered in a specific way. I can set the default ordering to order by name, order by created date, order by whatever. So I know that my results get returned to me in a very specific way. Um, so you're going to gain a lot of like query consistency by using a selector layer if you use it the way that it should be used. Um, and then the second piece of this, which I guess really there's three things, not two, but the second part of this is you get to house all of your object-specific queries in one place, right? So I know that if there's all of a sudden a problem with one of my case queries, I can come right back here to this case selector and update that case query, right? I know where it lives. Um, it's entirely possible. In fact, in my experience, it's more than entirely possible <laughs> that you have the exact same query 15 places in your system. You're querying for cases 10 different times in 10 different scenarios. Well, in the event that you need that query to change uh, in a uniform way for all those 10 different places, you would have to go to all 10 places and update that query, right? So two things there. Number one, uh, you by using a selector layer for those uh, queries, right, you've now significantly reduced your code. You only have to write that query in one place instead of ten places. And you've simplified your updates to that, making it much easier to deal with in the future. If all of a sudden that query needs a couple of new fields added to it or it needs to be filtered by a new thing, um, you can just go to that one place in your code, fix that one query, and then everywhere will be good to go. So it makes managing, you know, your queries considerably simpler. Um, and you might be in a small org now and you might think, mm, no big deal, but if you really do have plans to grow, this will eventually, um, you'll eventually see that this has an, an extremely huge benefit to your org in the, the long run there. 
Um, all right. So as far as when you should create a selector, uh, you're basically going to create a selector class anytime that you need to do a SQL query or a social query or an aggregate query um, on an object, right? As soon as you need to do that, on just a single query on any of your objects, you would create a new selector class. So you have a selector class for each object in your system that you're querying on. That's basically when you create a selector. Um, yeah, I think that's that's covering most of the things. An important piece about the selector class, uh, it's the same kind of thing in the domain class. I hope I went over it in the domain video. I'm not sure I did. But selector classes and domain classes should always use inherited sharing. The reason that they should use inherited sharing is because we don't really like want them to control the sharing. We want the calling classes to control the sharing that they should should um, have. So if for some reason you were just calling your case selector, uh, well, it's really never going to happen. It could happen for the domain layer, but inherited sharing by default is really with sharing. Right, so if you were just messing with this class and this class wasn't being called from any anywhere specifically, this will run as with sharing. If you were calling this from a class that had without sharing um, declared, then inherited sharing would basically end up as without sharing. So these should really run in the context of the calling class, ideally. Um, yeah, I think those are are those those are really the the major things uh, if you check out the wiki there's a couple other things that I go over like my suggested naming convention for selector classes which is just um, count selector method signatures basically that they should be uh, bulkified you should have bulkified method signatures for your um, different selector methods uh, or the different methods in your selector class also that you should call them or start them with select right select by account ID select by ID select by last modified date so that you know that you're selecting or querying now these are just my suggestions some of them stem from um, suggestions that have been passed on to me some of them are my own like I personally like to put underscore selector. Some people don't so much. Um, these are just personal opinions. You are welcome to define your own personal opinions for these if you, if you have different ideas. Um, the only other thing that I'll go over is that there are only really two libraries for this that I could find uh, in my many, many hours investigating these uh, you know, how, how to implement a good selector layer. Um, there are only two libraries that I would say are worth your time to look at. Um, there's the Apex Common Library, which of course we're going to go over in the next video, and there's the Query.Apex Library, which is also pretty great. Now, the difference between these two, right, the, the core difference, and the reason that I I guess um, I've decided I'm going to push Apex Common a little bit more, is that you've got query.apex, right? And it is a great tool. Dude, don't get me wrong at all. Uh, it is pretty great. But query.apex is literally just for a selector layer. That's it, right? It's, it's built for selecting, and that's great, and it does do a wonderful job. Um, but the Apex Common library is, in my opinion, equally great. Uh, there are some differences between the two. Some things query.apex supports that uh, Apex Common doesn't like inherently give you. But for the most part, they're pretty similar. And Apex Common contains all of the frameworks for all of the layers that it can, right? So say I was using query.apex, that's great. But now I have to find something for my domain layer. I'd have to pick out a new trigger handler class, and I'd have to hope that that trigger handler class has good support and a dedicated author that's going to keep it updated and dedicated community. 
Um, and then the other thing is, okay, you know, maybe I want frameworks for a unit of work, right? Great. Apex Common already has unit of work in here. Query.apex doesn't. But I guess what I'm saying is then you have to go find a third library to do that unit of work stuff. So if you want to if you want to do all these things you have to mesh together all these libraries and all these libraries you have to hope one of two things um, one that you have enough time personally to upkeep them if you need new things or something's broken or whatever else or two that the author in the community of these different libraries has time to upkeep them when all the new features of Salesforce come out and things get deprecated whatever right so that is one thing that you do not have to worry about with Apex Common. <laughs> you can see there's an enormous amount of people that are invested in this library. This is huge for the Salesforce community, 542 people, and a huge number of contributors, right? 36 is pretty huge for, for Salesforce. Um, you, won't, you won't find that level of contribution on anything else. Um, Query.apex does have better support than I would say the majority of places, but uh, anyway, those are my thoughts on these libraries, and these are my thoughts on why Apex Common is, in my opinion, about as good as you could ever ask for. Um, I keep saying it. I didn't think I was going to push this library as much as I'm ending up pushing it in this series, but it's uh, really well built. It's got great support, and I hope that with this tutorial series, it'll make it easier for a lot more people to, to, I guess, start leveraging. Because, right, honestly, we're very lucky it exists. <laughs> um, all right, that's it. That's it. That's enough of that rant. Next uh, video, we're gonna go over how to implement the selector layer using the Apex Common Library. So, um, yeah, stick with me and uh, we'll uh, figure this out together. <laughs> All right, I'll see you next time. All right, guys, so welcome to this 14th episode of the uh, Separation of Concerns and Apex Common tutorial series. In this episode, we're gonna go over how to implement the selector layer using the Apex Common library. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. I mean, what we're gonna go over is uh, a few things. Obviously, we're gonna create an example together of how to do this. Um, we're going to go over some uh, how to create custom queries, how to use uh, some of the pre-built methods, and you know the typical thing I always do which is why you would choose to use the Apex Common Library to do this. So um, yeah let's get started well we'll start like I typically do. Why would you decide to use the Apex Common Library? I've said this a few times in several of the videos now, <laughs> but as far as why you would choose to use the Apex Common Library, it's really well built. It handles all of the different layers, a selector layer, service layer, unit of work, which isn't technically a layer, but um, it's important that you use something like it. And um, the uh, domain layer. <laughs> forgot where I was. So it's got uh, selector, service, unit of work, domain layer, all of those things thought out really well. Not to mention it also integrates well with the Apex Mox, which is also a pretty great library, which we're going to go over in the next three episodes, 15, 16, and 17. Um, cool. So as far as why, I really just think um, after spending a lot of time with this library and looking through all of the code in it, that it is uh, extremely well built, not to mention there's a lot of people that are invested in it that are upkeeping it. Um, so, yeah, those are my feelings. <laughs> You're free to, to have your own, of course. Um, definitely do your own research. I'm, I'm just a guy. I've spent my own time here. Um, but feel free to make your own decisions on what you think is best for you. Those are just that's just how I feel. It's a well-built library, great support, um, and it handles all the different layers, so you don't have to go 
mix and match a bunch of libraries together to handle all all those layers or roll your own for every single one which i can tell you is an undertaking i've attempted it it's probably yeah you probably don't want to <laughs> all right so let's figure out how to to um implement the selector layer with the apex common library um so i don't think i have an account selector yet let's um create an account selector and uh, I'll move that one over there just like I always do to make sure I don't do anything really dumb uh, when I'm trying to teach you guys this stuff because uh, you know you probably don't need that in your life M more time wasted listening to me so <laughs> the first thing that we're gonna want to do is extend the fflib um, S object selector class for our selectors that we want to um, build using the Apex Common Library. That way we'll be able to use all the functionality from the FFLib S object creator class. That's what that extends means. Um, we'll go over it a little bit more in a bit, and I've gone over it in a couple of videos in the past, I think, uh, for this series. There are a handful of things that you should know about. The first thing is the the methods that you need to implement despite it not forcing you to implement these methods. It is important. Um, so the first one that we need to implement is this public list schema ooh, schema subject field and we'll this method is called um, should be called s object field list cool and what it will return is a new list of schema s object and I'll explain what this method is doing here in just a moment so bear with me okay so what is this method for. Basically this method is um, going to grab these fields for every query that you do. So for every query that you make with your account selector, um, which we'll create a query in a bit and just prove that this is true, you are going to select, it, the selector is going to automatically select these fields for you in the query. So say for instance I want my account ID to be selected. I would put account.id. Maybe I want the account name. Uh, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's all I want in all my queries is, is that to be returned to me. Um, <clears throat> what's this complaining about now? Uh, it'll figure itself out. Um, I needed a semicolon, that's important. <laughs> okay, um, so basically what it's gonna do now is every single time I make a query, it's going to always select the ID and the name. Now, you might be like, why would I want that? But chances are, even if you haven't ever thought about it, chances are a lot of your queries on an object are querying for very similar fields. Like, it's very possible that well, number one, 100% of the time, if you didn't know, the uh, ID field is queried for. Salesforce does that in the background. Even if you don't explicitly add that to your query, it's doing that. Um, and it's better to explicitly add it than to not, in my opinion. Otherwise, you get for some very confusing code. Um, probably a lot of your queries are, are querying for name, maybe created date things along those lines. So if your queries are consistently calling or querying for these um, fields, you'd ideally want to put them here, right? Okay, so that's what this method is going to do if you set this up. The second thing that you do need to set up in here is public schema s object type get s object And then you would just return count.sObjectType. 
So this is important. You, you do have to implement this even if even though it doesn't force you to. Otherwise, there's going to be you're going to run into some issues. It's used in uh, several places behind the scenes. Uh, so it is important that you you do implement this method. Otherwise, the FFLib best object creator is eventually going to cry about it and be like, <laughs> but you didn't tell me what the object type is. So um, <laughs> just make sure that you implement this method. Okay. Um, these are the two uh, methods that you definitely need to implement in every selector class that you make. And I don't think I said it in this video, but I said it in my last video. You should make a selector class for every object that you're querying on. And I explained that a lot more in, in depth in the video and in the wiki and I'm or in the previous video and in the previous uh, videos, you know, wiki page that corresponds with it. So I'm not going to go over it more here, but just know you should create a selector class for each class for each object in your system that you are querying on. Okay, the second thing that I want to go over really quick is the constructor. And I'm just going to copy this over so it's a little easier to just go through this really quickly. Um, and this should not be contact, but rather account. So what is this constructor doing? Um, by default, <clears throat> the FFLib S object selector has whoa, 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 several fields that are set um, in a particular way. So let's find this. There we go. Maybe. Let's find the default constructor. So the default constructor is empty, and that's important because a bunch of these variables here can be set if you want them to be set. And I'll go over what these default variables do and their defaults, right? So this include field sets variable allows you to query using field sets if you want to. So if you want your if you want this to change by default in here, you need to send it that parameter in the constructor and we'll go back to that in a second. There's also this a boolean in here that makes it so that your um, selector will enforce field level security for the running user. Uh, this also allows you to enforce CRUD security on your S object selector. Um, and then there's this sort select fields which basically alphabetically sorts your selected fields in the actual query, which that's confusing, but I'll show you what I mean by that in a bit. So if you wanted any of those things to change by default, uh, I believe all of them, so we've got enforce CRUD being true by default, sorting select fields being true, and then FLS is false and including field sets is false. If you wanted to change any of those by default in your account selector, you would call the super methods constructor. So if you don't know what super means, super is referring to this class, the class that is basically the parent or the super of this class that is extending it. So we're calling this super constructor or the FFLibS object selectors constructor and passing it false, true, true, false. And you can see here the parameter one, if you want it to query for field sets, you'd set this to true. If you'd like to enforce CRUD security by default, you'd set this to true. FLS is the third parameter. And if you want to sort your selected queries, or your select selected fields in your query, then you'd set this to, to true as well. You should only do that if you want this to default this way, like always, in your account selector or your whatever selector you're building right uh, otherwise there are other ways to set these values in the class and um, I'll briefly go over it I hope <laughs> I hope I can get to it all right so 
uh, we've got this shell of the um, selector class set up. We know that there are these overrides to set these different, you know, things if we want to leverage them, if we want to leverage field sets, if we want to use uh, CRUD and FLS security, and if we want to sort our selected fields. And really quick, just so I show you what I mean, um, if you didn't sort your selected fields, then maybe you have like select description here, and select name here, select description there, select ID here. But if you do decide to sort your selected fields, it would sort them alphabetically. So it would be ID name like that. So D comes before I and I comes before N. That's all it's doing. <laughs> so if you don't want it to do that, you know, shut that off. It'll save you a, a small amount of processing time. But some people like it that way. Um, and uh, so there's no, there's not a lot of harm in it most of the time. Okay, cool. We've gone over that. What should we go over next? The the next one that is um, useful to to uh, leverage in here is there is a <clears throat> well we'll just write it together. So say you want to select your objects or records rather by ID, and we want to return a list of account and oops, select by ID. And we want to send this a set of IDs and contact IDs. Whoa, I'm not on a contact. I'm on an account. Account IDs. Well, there is a method in the FFLib S object selector class that allows you to do this already. Uh, we can cast this and return it a little to make it a little easier for us in the future. But there's a method called select s objects by ID and we can send it the account IDs. So let me just kind of show you what this ends up doing. It basically queries using oh by the way I hit control B in IntelliJ to go straight to this uh, method declaration in the FFLib S object selector class. So this guy. Control B is pretty cool. Um, all right, so you can see basically it's going to end up querying by ID, which is uh, pretty awesome. It's just going to go on ahead and, and uh, do that query for us because that's an all too common query is to select objects with the ID in this set of IDs, right? Um, yeah. So that's a pretty cool one to leverage, one that I leverage pretty frequently. But let's go over, um, well, okay, first things first. Let's just prove that this selector works, right? We've got this uh, account ID uh, or this account selector and we've got this select by ID method. Let's just prove that it's going to actually return a, re return to us uh, a list of accounts with the ID in the name uh, field in them. So we will do that in the execute, execute anonymous window down here and we'll say account selector select accounts equals new account oh. selector All right and then we uh, are going to need to make a couple of accounts just to prove that we can grab them by ID so we'll say um, account account new equals uh, yeah no I'm right new account and we'll say, uh, I think the only thing you have to fill out on the account is the name. Oh, and I think, I think I've got a couple of things on a trigger. Let me just stop this trigger from running so I don't have to fill out a bunch of stuff.
<laughs> Something failed. Here's what I like to see. Uh, let's see what it was. Some stuff that is probably not important, but let's just first save this guy. Cool. And, oh, it's complaining about this computer creator class. That's it. And we'll save this um, account selector. Cool. That's all working good. And let's uh, head down here and uh, insert our account new and then we'll say select accounts dot select select by ID and pass it our uh, pass it a new set with account new dot ID I do need to make sure though that this set is of type ID. That's important. And uh, we'll have this return to me a list of accounts. Account list equals that. And we will just create a debug of this account list. Cool, 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 cool. So hopefully this should select uh, using this code. We've created a new account, um, and using our selector, we should be able to select this account by its ID. So let's just figure out if it works. And it looks like it probably did. Is, oh, there it is. This is the account list right here. So we've got our ID. I don't know if you guys can read this. It's right here at the bottom. Uh, but our debug statement has grabbed the account, its ID, and its name. So it did select those fields that we put in here. And if we put in something like account.description, and we actually filled out description to say description equals tacos and save this and ran it again we should hopefully see that the description gets added right so you can see that down there the description did indeed get added because we added it here and you can also see, like I was talking about earlier, that it ordered them, ordered those fields in alphabetical order, description, ID, name. So, all right, that's cool, but what about more complicated queries? How do we get into this whole uh, custom query setup? Um, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, actually, really quick, one thing that I do wanna go over before we get into that is to how to how to set your default ordering um, with the apex common s object selector uh, class by default if your object has a name field that you're creating a selector for some don't it will use the um, name field if there is no name field on an object it will use the um, I believe the created date field to order things but if you don't want it to order on that and you wanted it to order on something different you can actually override that uh, by saying public override string get order by and you would have this return the field that you wanted it to order on so maybe I want it to order on the uh, description field right that's how you would change up your order by and if you wanted it to be on multiple fields you can also do that too so if you wanted it to order on description and name and ID you would just comma separate them out like that and then you'd get your you know the ordering that you wanted pretty cool
and pretty simple. So this is how you set it for your default, right, for the majority of your queries. But we'll go over how to, to change that up for custom queries that you want it to order in a different way, right? All right, so say we don't want one of these simplified um, select, you know, select methods that are pre-built for us. We want to make our own select method. Well, we do that by adding a new method in here, say select by name or something. Select account or accounts, really, by name. And <clears throat> we'd send it in a set of strings, potentially, and it would be uh, account names. Cool. Now, what is it, you know, what are, what are we going to do next to build this query? Um, what we're going to do is the following. We are going to say new query factory. And the query factory effectively ends up being an implementation of this class, or like an instance, not an implementation, but an instance of this FFlib query factory class. So we're saying new query factory, and this is a method that is accessible to us through the FFlib S object selector class, right? That's what this new query factory is. There's a couple of overloads for it, so if you wanted to, um, for your query factory, add FLS for this specific query or CRUD or whatever else, there are overloads to allow you to set those different things if you want to change them up for this particular query. So if I wanted to do that right, I could just put in something like true, false, true, whatever I ended up wanting those to be. If I want to assert CRUD to be true, FLS, include selector fields, etc. Um, I can override those. And the difference, uh, there's one thing I should say there. That boolean includes selector fields if you turn this to false. So by default it's on. But if you turn it to false, what that means is that these fields will no longer be selected. Maybe they're completely irrelevant to this query and you don't want them to show up. Perfectly fine. Just put false in here and they'll go away. Um, and let's see. Say we want a field that we're not selecting in most places on this one. We'd say select field and we'll say account dot um, hmm, I don't know uh, last modified by ID. Um, this is also important uh, because let me just actually before I finish this up you will have to use this for relational fields. So say for instance you wanted like account dot, uh, I don't think I have a, <laughs> well yeah I do. Okay, so say I wanted account owner dot first name or something, right? It's not gonna like this if I try to do this. It won't let me declare this up here because this isn't a field on the account. This is a field on user. First name is a, a field that's on the, the user object. Um, so if I wanted to grab that information, you actually have to do a custom query. So those relationship chain fields, um, or related fields, whatever you want to call them, you'd need to do that. Uh, but the way that you would do that in here is you'd say select field. And you can also select fields by their by a string value. So you'd say um, owner dot name or something like that or owner dot uh, we'll say username because owner is a user. And again you can see how this query factory is using the builder pattern which we went over a couple episodes ago so it's good that we went over that and hopefully you understand it a bit. Okay, so we've got a couple new fields in here that we're querying for. Maybe we, and, and now we need to set a query condition. So what, what should we select this by? So we'd say set condition 
and then we would say something like um, name in count names All right you don't actually want to put the where in here that is uh, no, no bueno. <laughs> Don't put the where in there. Just put all the stuff that comes after the where. Um, the uh, FFLibS object selector, or really the query factory class manages that for you. It's going to automatically put the where in. Uh, maybe you want to change the order. So you could say set ordering. And you would put, oh, i got to double check this. I haven't done this in a bit. But the set ordering wants you to put in the field name in the direction so we'll put in the field name of we want this to order by mm, last actually I think I can do it this way um, account dot last modified by ID and the direction would be ascending. And last but not least, hopefully I'm expecting an argument. Oh, it wants the... Uh, that guy. Um, let me explain this. It's been a bit since I've done this. So set ordering is going to allow you to override the ordering that we put by default up here. Um, what I've passed in is the name of the field that I wanted to order by, so the last modified by ID. And then this, um, basically this uh, variable, this sort order ascending, which we can go check out. They're these enums that are set up in the query factory. So just ascending and descending, right? Um, that's all that ends up being, but it does want you to use those enums for the, the uh, ordering there. Cool, okay, so we've set a new ordering direction. The next thing that we want to maybe do is set a limit. So if we wanted to set a limit, we would say set limit, and we just pass it a number. So maybe we only want 100 accounts returned to us with this query. And last but not least, we would say dot to SoQL. Okay, so a lot is happening here, and let me explain it all. You use the select field to select your new fields. If you want a relational field, you've got to use um, text the text variety of the field name or a string variety really setting a new condition for how I want to select this and then I'm setting a new ordering by telling it which field I want it to order by and um, telling it how I want it to order in an ascending or descending direction then I'm letting it know that I want to set this limit to a hundred and then I'm saying build this SQL query as in actually build this string now that I've set up all these things, build the string from it. And the last thing that we'll want to do is actually return a list of accounts. Right now we're returning a string for a query. So we would do return a, um, whoa, a list of account and database dot query this guy. Now hopefully it'll resolve itself and I didn't screw anything up that I've, uh, you know, because I'm prone to doing that. Uh, yep, there was something. There it is. Okay, so now we're returning this query. So if we wanted to test this out, see how it goes we could do we'll take our execute anonymous that we've already built down here and um, give it a shot so we'll select this by name we will send it in a set of strings this time 
and uh, we'll give it a string called cool account and hopefully we will get this cool account back to us we'll uh, we'll see <laughs> so yeah we got our one account at uh, given back to us we can see it selected the last modified by ID um, up here we can see that it got the cool account we can see it grabbed the owner ID um, so good stuff now you might be like hey uh, Matt it just selected the owner ID where's the owner ID name um, I promise you it selected it it's just uh, it's an interesting thing when you get these returned in a uh, debug log they don't actually show the owner dot whatever they just show that you actually did retrieve the owner ID but let me I guess prove to you really quick that that is the case just so you know you don't think I'm I'm crazy uh, we'll just have this query return to us the actual query that we've built here with our query factory so we'll see that in the debug log and then real quick we'll just see that after doing that selection we can loop through and get the owner name this is the username or owner username rather alright so let's uh, save this and you know uh, give it a whirl anyway I can't wait I'm sorry um, so this is the query we've selected description ID last modified by a name name owner username from account where um, whoa, whoa. where we're ordering by last modified ID uh, we're sending nulls first this is another thing you can override if you want to and a limit of 100 so we did indeed build the query that we anticipated and when we looped through and said this is the username you can see that it does indeed give you access to the username so just in case that's confusing at all it did indeed get that we can use it so no worries all right what else is there to cover um, there's probably plenty more stuff that we could cover uh, when you let's really quick though go over the initialization I guess of a selector using the application factory so if you don't know what the application factory is we went over this way 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 long ago I think in episode three and four or two and yeah it's three and four um, we've got this application class that we made back in episode four I think and we are using the application selector factory selector uh, variable uh, and what we'll need to do now that we've made a new selector is say okay for for our map of s object type to class type we now need to say uh, account dot s object type maps to the account selector class All right so it's important that after you make your selector you go back here to your selector factory and update that and then if I was wanting to grab my selector using the application factory I would and you want to do it in an abstract way you would set it up like this you would say fflib is object selector object select selector equals application dot selector dot new instance object type so you're going to pass it in the type of object and it's going to give you back the selector that you mapped to that object here so if I pass it in account it'll give me my account selector um, class a new instance of it anyway so that's how you would set that up in an abstract fashion for the selector class otherwise you're just going to initialize your account selector like you would normally account selector you know the normal stuff like we just did down here right account selector select accounts equals new account selector cool but if you want that factory which man is it useful uh, that is what you would set that up for um, 
Well, right here. How you would set that up right here. All right, and there's uh, one other thing I want to talk about really quick before we move on to the next video. Um, after you've set this up, right? After you've set up your selector, whether it's this way or it's this way, actually, if it's this way, you're going to have to cast it to to this guy, which you could totally do just this way. If you wanted to, you could say, this is going to end up being a S object selector, so just be cool with it. <laughs> um, what you would end up doing, you, you can't do this if it's an IS object selector, just to be super clear, but if you casted this to the, um, rather the, instead of the interface variety of S object selector, the virtual class, what you'd be able to do now is say S object selector dot enforce FLS. So if you remember way back in the beginning, way, way back at the beginning of this episode, we talked about that, um, those overrides for the constructors, right? Where you could set the FLS security and the CRUD security and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you don't want that to just default that way, but maybe in certain scenarios you, you need to enforce it or something, then you have the object to turn these things on and off. So if you wanted to, uh, where is it? If you wanted to ignore CRUD, you could ignore it. If you wanted to, um, oh, what are the other ones? <laughs> If you wanted to include field sets all of a sudden, you could do that. If you wanted to um, unsort those fields, like you didn't want those query fields to be sorted, you could you could set all that stuff up using these methods too to basically change those booleans at will, right? So those are that's important to know that you can you can do that if you'd like to do that, and it's um, it's pretty useful, right? you can kind of change things on the fly. So, um, there are plenty of things that I do not have time to cover in this video, or it would be like two hours long. But uh, I have made this wiki uh, in my uh, GitHub repo called Salesforce Separation of Concerns in the Apex Common Library. That explains uh, all of this stuff in even greater detail. So if there's anything that you're confused about at all, uh, definitely come in here, uh, check it out, and it should hopefully have that information. Of course, you can always ask me questions if you want to in the comments, and I try to respond to them as quick as I can. Um, but this goes over a bunch of things, like we didn't go over how to do subselect queries or inner queries because they're a little less frequently done, but this tutorial goes over it. Uh, it also goes over how to deal with aggregate queries, and things like that, and, you know, a method cheat sheet like I do for all of the Apex Common, the core Apex Common classes, that um, basically just explain what, you, what each one does, and I also have one for the Query Factory class, so you can see all of the different options that you have with the query factoring with the query factor class so uh, pretty pretty cool stuff I think that's probably plenty for this video I think you can probably make most of what you'd need to create now uh, using the or with a selector class using the s object selector portion of the apex common library so uh, hopefully this was helpful I hope anyway. And in the next episode, whew, we're going to get into unit tests, the difference between unit tests and integration tests, and start getting into Apex mocks. So that is it. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you uh, next time. All right, guys, so welcome to this 15th episode of the Separation of Concerns and Apex Common Tutorial Series, where we are going to go over the difference between integration tests and unit tests. Um, I think a lot of people get really confused about this. What is the difference? You know, like, wh why does it matter to have a unit test as opposed to an integration test? Why would you want one over the other? Blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so let's just uh, go over it. <laughs>
<laughs> hopefully clear it up. Because once somebody explains it to you and you really start to think about it and see some examples in front of you, it gets a little bit easier, I think. But All right. The main difference between a unit test and an integration test is in an integration test, you are actually calling other classes that your class might call or querying the database or inserting things into the database. Whereas in a unit test, instead of actually, I guess, testing that all of your paths throughout, or sorry, testing that all of the other things that your um, class calls to get things done, for instance, by asking uh, to query the database, you're you're really asking the system to do something, not not really your class specifically or this method specifically. You're asking the system to return you a bunch of cases, or whenever you're doing an update call, you're asking the system to do an update for you. Or for instance, if I was calling another class and I was saying something like, um, I don't know, uh, accounts account domain equals new accounts um, then I'd have to send it in some stuff for this to actually be legal but then we'd say account domain dot you know get us object type or something right so three different things uh, that we'll give as an example here if I was doing an integration test and uh, basically what I would end up doing is actually testing that not only this method works but that this method truly works like my path from this method to the other one gets called and it truly returns what I want it to and it truly does the things that I'm anticipating it to um, additionally in an integration test I would actually do this query and this query would ask the system to give me records in return for real and I would then actually update those objects, those cases, and ask the system to do that. Now, so in an integration test, I'm actually testing every single thing, like every single class or system call or whatever else that I need to get done. But in a unit test, um, you don't really want to do those things. What you're really looking for is trying to figure out whether your your logic, as in the code you wrote, the logic is actually executing in the way that you want it to. So, um, say for instance, this list here, right? This list of cases actually did return empty right we'd want to make sure that this got skipped right this whole deal got skipped and we actually threw a custom exception whatever that is it's not real in this org but um, you know maybe we could just throw a DML exception um, we'd want to test that this logic is working right and we'd want to test that if we did get objects returned to us or we did get cases returned to us that we got in here and that this actually did set the subject and the status to panther and chocolate <laughs> um, but what we don't really want to test is whether or not the system is cool doing these updates or that the system is cool querying for these things or that this call to this method is you know working right because in a unit test the goal isn't to test that all these other things are working it's to test whether or not you know uh, that your logic is operating as expected and you might wonder like why you know why would I choose to do a unit test instead of just a bunch of integration tests well here's the thing um, most methods, uh, well not most, but a lot of methods will have the need for you to test, I don't know, 
15 different logic scenarios. Maybe, you know, there's a whole bunch of different conditions that could be true or could be false and lead down to path A or B or C or D. And you'd want to check that those conditions are true in all scenarios. So like, you know, maybe you could say something like and account domain dot get s object type uh, is not equal to case or something like that, right? Case dot s object type. Maybe you'd want to test that, and then you'd have two scenarios. What well, really you'd have uh, several scenarios to test now, right? You'd have to to test whether or not when this is not empty and this is not a case object, then you'd get in here, and then you'd have to test when this is not empty and when this is a case uh, object, then you'd bail out to go in here. And you can see how, like, you know, if you're really testing all of your logic, that can become a lot of different tests. And ideally, you want those tests, but you don't want to have to query for real and do real inserts of data and all that stuff just to test that your logic that you built is really doing what you thought it would do. And the reason that you don't want to do that is, uh, well, for several reasons. Number one, it's completely irrelevant, honestly, whether this truly does its job uh, when you're doing a unit test like I was just describing. But more specifically, uh, even maybe even more important than that, is that if you are doing these SQL calls and these update calls, if you didn't know, these are the most expensive operations right so if you did you know six different tests just to test these different if scenarios and making sure that your logic is truly doing what you want it to in these different scenarios then you would start to see over time your tests take longer and longer and longer and longer to operate and um, eventually that becomes detrimental, especially when your org gets uh, to a decent size, because then you'll start looking at things like, instead of deploying in half an hour, it takes you six and a half hours to deploy, because you've got all these tests testing all these different scenarios. And if you're thinking, uh, well, I don't want to do these tests, why would I even do these tests to begin with? You gotta just, just change your mind. And here's why you should change your mind about doing unit testing and testing in general if you aren't. If you don't do these tests, two things eventually happen. Number one, you can't know for sure that whatever small change you made isn't going to impact something else down the line, right? You can't know for sure that this one little change you made doesn't break some other scenario that you forgot to take into consideration. And what that in turn ends up doing is creating more bugs in your ecosystem and then your product owners and the business people that don't have anything to do with code start to trust you less and then you're not able to make as many code updates and do as much interesting stuff as you once were able to because you had no tests to back you up you made too many mistakes and now uh, everybody is freaked out about making any changes to the system so make those tests they are important even if they're not fun they're almost more important than the code <laughs> um, so anyway integration test test all the things all the way through unit test just test the logic and it tests it quick and it just cares about the logic in your class making the right decisions um, nothing else not the logic in other classes not whether or not the system likes you uh, all that kind of stuff so um, important differentiation um, as far as when you should use unit testing over integration tests uh, I still I'm not saying that you don't want to do an integration test you absolutely should um, but like I was saying, you probably only need, you know, a couple of integration tests, right, that maybe prove out a positive and a negative scenario. And then 
you need unit tests to test all the other permutations that are less important after that to do an integration test with. So say, for instance, um, you know, I was testing all of the scenarios for this. We've got one, two, three, four, five. We've got five different scenarios for just this one if statement. So you can imagine if there were more ifs in here, um, that could get even crazier. So for those different permutations of your logic, I would make unit tests to test out those you know, different variations. And then you can trust, now that you have all these quick unit tests, that your logic is remain the same, nothing is changing despite whatever little tweak you had to do with your last story or for some bug fix. Uh, you now know that your logic that you had previously is all operating the way that you designed it so um, yeah I think that's mostly it in the next episode we're gonna go over in episode 16 we're gonna go over how separation of concerns fits into um, unit testing as you can kind of see from this class this is an example of a no separation of concerns class and um, well we'll see that unit testing is basically impossible without separation of concerns so that's kind of why it fits into this whole discussion because you need separation of concerns and these different layers in your system to be able to really properly unit test so we'll go over that next hopefully this kind of clears up why you would use a unit test and when you would right it is to test the logic specific to your class's method and not the logic in all the other methods or places that you know you could be dealing with you know you could be calling five different classes in this one method I don't know but you don't care about that logic you're just trying in a unit test to test if your logic is doing what you anticipate it to right um, and hopefully you're grasping that integration st tests are still important. It's just that you don't want to use them to test all the different hundreds potentially of permutations of your logic um, because that would really slow down your testing effort and it's not really at all necessary at a certain point. You just you just don't need it. So, um, all right, next episode, episode 16. We'll get into how separation of concerns fits into this. And, uh, yeah, that ought to do it. <laughs> I'll see you guys in the next episode. All right, guys, so welcome to this 16th episode of the Separation of Concerns in Apex Common Tutorial Series, where we are going to go over the importance of separation of concerns as it relates to being able to do unit testing in your org. So, um... This is pretty simple. Without the concept of separation of concerns, unit testing really can't be brought into play. It can't be made a reality. And um, the reason that this is the case is because unit testing depends on the concept of uh, mocking or creating fake versions of classes to pass to the class that you're actually testing, right? So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, there, are, there are ways to create fake versions of your uh, class. Like, say for instance, let me just explain this a bit. The separation of concerns class is the one that we're actually going to be testing for real. The class that we want to actually test the logic of. But this separation of concerns class depends on this domain layer class and this selector layer class to get its job done. Well, um, what we can do to make sure that we're not also testing the logic in these classes, so we're not doing a, a, uh, an integration test, what we can do is use the concept of dependency injection, or basically just passing in 
instances of this class through the constructor. Um, and what that in turn allows us to do is pass in for tests fake versions of these classes that will return fake results to uh, or for our unit tests. So uh, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail. And if you're confused why you would want to do fake versions of these classes, go back one episode, really listen to it, and then come back to this one because it's going to make a whole lot more sense. Um, but without separation of concerns and without separating out you know, your different layers, uh, the selector layer, the domain layer, all that kind of stuff, this you just can't do you really just can't do unit testing it's not possible so let me show you what I mean by you can't do unit testing I've got this no separation no separation of concerns class right and in this class I have literally the same going same thing going on I've got an update accounts method there I've got an update accounts method here but this one just calls a couple of it calls a selector layer to select things, and it calls a domain layer class to update the account type. And in this one, we're doing it all here in this one class, right? So I don't call this a selector layer. I just select my my um, list of accounts inline, and then I make my updates to the account inline, and that's it, right? All of my stuff is housed here in this one class. If I want to reuse it, I've just got to come to this class and deal with it that way. Um, well, if I want to reuse it, I basically can't. Anyway, there's no depend there's no way to do a dependency injection here. There's no separation of layers or anything. None of that. So if we go take a look at its test class over here, um, you can see that there's there's no unit testing. If you've never done unit testing right, you're probably like, well, what? I don't even know what it is yet, but we'll see. We'll see it in just a second. Um, you're actually having to create a real new account and insert it into the database in the test setup, and then you're actually having to query for that account, and then you basically call that no SOC update accounts class where you're actually querying again and you're actually updating again for real and that's it there's no there's no concept of mocking or just doing the unit tests we're testing all the things right we're testing whether or not this query to the system actually works we're testing this update to the system is truly working and really that's not what we're trying to test in a unit test we're trying to test you know does this logic does this logical path make sense or like will this happen in given scenario A, B, C, right? We're not really trying to test whether or not this query reaches out to the system and gives us real results or whether this update does. Um, but in our separation of concerns class where we have this, uh, these um, concerns separated out into the different layers, so we've got a domain layer, we've got a selector layer, and then where where we're using this dependency injection where this is a little confusing a normal implementation of this class outside the context of a of a um, test doesn't really need dependency injection so we just have this empty constructor that then calls the private one this test visible one and um, sets the class basically sets up a new instance of those classes and <clears throat> through the use of this private um, constructor here we can we can leverage dependency injection and set up fake versions of our classes uh, and then those fake versions of our classes when we actually test this method here in just a bit this they will return fake results that will allow us to test whether if this was empty, it threw an exception, or if this wasn't empty, did it actually return a list, right? So it'll allow us to test our just our logical paths within this method and not whether or not 
we selected things truly successfully or we um, updated things successfully because they're, they're not actually relevant for this unit test. So um, over here, we have a separation of, separation of concerns class test. And we're going to go over this a whole lot more in detail in the next episode. Um, so if you're a little lost here, don't, don't worry too much about it. But I just want to show you what's going on so you kind of understand how this works. Um, we're creating a fake ID for an account object. Then we're creating a new list of accounts using that fake ID. And then we're creating a fake updated list of accounts to have returned to us as well. <clears throat> so um, after we create our fake data so that we're never actually truly inserting anything and taking a whole bunch of time, uh, the next thing that we will do is create our mocks or our fake versions of our classes. So we've got our um, fake accounts domain class and basically here more or less we're creating a fake instance of that class to use. And then we've got a fake instance of our selector class doing the same thing. And then we use this concept of stubbing and stubbing just means hey I'm gonna create fake return responses from methods um, so that when our class that we're actually testing calls these methods it gets something returned to it. So um, we can say when the mock selector select by ID method is called which it gets called right here in the class that we're gonna test then return this fake list of accounts and when the mock domains update account type account list is called then return this updated account list and then stop stubbing so stop creating those fake responses for the time being <laughs> then we are going to actually do our real test where we call the real uh, this real method in this class so this isn't fake this is the real one that we're truly testing the logic of and um, then we're going to be able to do a bunch of things like we can still do system asserts to see if the prospect you know got updated uh, appropriately and then we can do new things that we are not able to do in a normal test like verify whether a method um, on a fake class was ever called or verify that this method was indeed called. Um, so there's a lot of interesting new things you can do to verify all these logical paths and we'll go over more of them in depth but as you can see right um, without going too far in depth we have to have this ability to make fake versions of our classes that we're dependent on to be able to do unit testing um, and you can see here that we are using that concept of dependency injection where we pass in our fake mock domain and our fake selector right which that ends up being sent here to this private test visible constructor where we assign this domain layer class and selector layer class the um, fake instances of them right so I know that this is maybe difficult to understand uh, at this moment in time but to be able to create fake results and to be able to focus solely on the logic of our method in this class instead of the logic of these other classes we have to have a way to do, you know, some kind of dependency injection to pass in these fake versions of the class, that, these classes that um, the separation of concerns class depends on to get its job done. If you don't have that kind of stuff set up, then as you can see, there's no way to pass in fake versions of anything or fake anything. So uh, you're just kind of stuck with integration tests forever and um, you'll see that eventually that will slow you down quite a bit. 
Um, I think that's mostly it. There's one thing that's worth mentioning here. I'm showing you how to do this for unit testing in general, but if you're using the Apex Common Library, you actually, as we'll see in the next episode, you are not required to do dependency injection. So this whole thing just disappears. And you use this application factory here to set your mock. Um, and we'll go over that a bit in the next episode. But I just wanted to point that out. If you're not using Apex Common, uh, the Apex Common Library, and you want to use different things, then you do have to do dependency injection for every class. If you are using Apex Common, and you are using this application factory, then the, you have a, another option that's uh, quite a bit easier to deal with. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that ought to do it. Um, if you want more information on this stuff, like I've said in the last handful of uh, episodes, definitely check out the uh, wiki article that I've got going over this, or the blog post, because I made blog posts for all these two. Uh, there's also some tips, I guess, on how to transition your existing code base to start leveraging separation of concerns and, and unit test mocking. Um, because the older your org is, if you didn't do this to begin with, the harder it is to transition to something like this. So, yeah. Um, that's got to be it. Now, we've got one more episode left. Hopefully I've answered most of your questions and everything's starting to fall into place. If I haven't, then I'm sorry. Feel free to ask me more questions. Or submit an issue here and tell me that I suck and I need to put more information in one of these. Um, <laughs> in the last video, our last episode of this series, we are going to go over implementing mock unit tests with the Apex Mocks library. And we'll also go over how to, um, you know, the special scenarios that you can use with if you also use the Apex Common library. So that's it. Hopefully all this made sense. If it didn't, certainly leave me comments, and I will try to get to them and answer them as soon as I can. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. All right, guys. So on this 17th and final episode of the Separation of Concerns in Apex Common tutorial series, we are going to go over how to implement unit testing using the Apex Mox library. So... Um, if you don't know what Apex Mox is, basically it is a mocking framework that allows you to create mock uh, instances of classes for unit tests. And uh, it's, uh, as it states here, derives its inf inspiration from the uh, Mockito framework, which is very popular in, in the Java language. So, um, why is it beneficial for you to potentially leverage Apex Mox instead of other mocking frameworks that are out there like universal mocks or whatever else there's a handful of pretty good ones out there uh, well if you are using the apex common library you have to install apex mocks as the apex common library has some dependencies on apex mocks um, and it's a pretty inclusive mocking framework i mean you can pretty much do anything you want to want to do on it so it's not like you're really selling yourself short or or anything along those lines not to mention it uh, again has probably the most support at this you know at this time for any mocking framework and the most contributors so you can you know <laughs> count on it being up to date with the newest things that Salesforce makes available to you so that this you know you know that this mocking framework is is uh, leveraging the tools that it should be, I guess. I know that there's also, uh, before we get into an actual example of building a mock class, or sorry, building a unit test using Apex mocks, I also want to just state there seems to be a lot of confusion whether or not Apex mocks uses the stub API. It does, and it has pretty much since the stub API came out. So, 
Apex Marks was made way before the Stub API existed, and so in its original implementation, um, it didn't use the Stub API. Now it does. This is very important. You don't want to use. Uh, you really don't want to use a mocking framework that doesn't leverage the Stub API. Then um, I'm not gonna get into that, but just know that that's important, and know that Apex Marks does. Some people seem to, to think that I've that I've spoken with in the past that it doesn't leverage it, and that's just simply untrue. So, all right, we've gone over why. Um, we've gone over a couple other things. So let's go on ahead and um, build a mock, or basically a unit test using Apex Mocks. Now, if you don't know what a unit test is, or you're confused about unit tests and mocking and all that kind of stuff, please go watch the previous two videos, episodes 15, 15 and 16, where I go over those things. Um, that way, hopefully, you won't be as confused. <laughs> hopefully. I mean, no promises. <laughs> but I, I'm trying. I promise. Um, all right. So we've got this task service implementation class that I feel like I've gone over before, but maybe I haven't. We'll just go over it briefly. Basically, it's an abstract task service that allows you to create tasks for any object, and um, it leverages the application factory that we've built and talked about in episodes four and five, the selector layer, a unit of work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And basically, what it ends up doing is it ends up um, <clears throat> creating tasks for whatever object it is that we are currently working with in this task service. So we want to make a unit test for this class and uh, we're going to make it using the Apex Mox library and go through kind of how it works. So we're going to call this class task service impl test and I'm going to call it two because I already have one and I've got it over here so I can look at it and make sure I'm not saying anything ridiculous just like with all my other videos to hopefully speed this up and save you some time <laughs> uh, all right um, so the first thing we're going to go over is how to actually create a mock class now, if you didn't watch the last episode, you should, because it goes over the need for separation of concerns to do mocking. But we will go over that a bit more <clears throat> while we work through this. So first things first, we need to make sure that we mark this as a test. And we're going to create a test method, and we'll call it... Um, whatever the name of that method was, private static void, create tasks. And then I like to name my test this way. This has nothing to do with this video, but basically we'll say case task success underscore unit test. So that way when I come back in here, I know that I'm calling the create tasks method, like I'm testing that create task method. I'm testing a success for the case object, and this is a unit test, it's not an integration test. For me, that works. For some people, it might be too long of a name. Either way, it's irrelevant. Just know that's my thought process. Um, so, the first thing that we will need, I'm going to close a bunch of these windows because they are not super important, I don't think. Uh, the first thing that we need is to create some cases, right? Because the first thing that we do is we actually select objects that qualify for tasks, more or less. And so we're going to set up a case object for this. So uh, for a case to already have theoretically existed, we need an ID. And so we're going to create a mock case ID. And this is the first thing that we're going to leverage. Huh, lose. Hmm. This is the first thing that we're going to leverage in the Apex Mocks library. It's called the FFLib ID generator. 
And basically, what it's going to do for you, if you call the generate method in it, is create a legal ID for the S object type that you pass. So I want to create an ID for a case, so I pass it case dot S object type. This could be any of the objects in your org, um, whether they're standard objects or custom, right? You'll just pass it the name of the object dot S object type, and it'll give you a legal ID to use for everything else. The next thing that we're going to create is a set of IDs. And the reason that we're going to create a set of IDs is because we pass that in to this create tasks method. So that's important. So we'll create a set of IDs called case IDs. And we will, whoo, uh, you know, maybe I can type today, but there's no promises. And we'll give it the mock case ID. And last but not least, we're going to make a list of existing cases that we can have fake returned from our selector layer. And um, we're going to go over everything in great detail, I promise, but one thing at a time. We'll set the ID to the mock case ID. And we will set the, we'll just set some other random fields. We'll set this to high. We'll set the status to new. And we'll set the origin equal to email. Cool. So now we've got a list, or sorry, a set of IDs, a list of cases, and a mock ID, which is all good stuff because we are going to need that in just a moment. So the first thing that we need to do now that we've got our fake ID set up. <laughs> Sorry, that's just... Anyway, uh, we, now that we've got our fake ID set up and um, we've got our set that we're going to pass to our method and our uh, case list, we're going to go ahead and create our mock instances of our classes. So basically, we what we're about to do next is actually create the fake instances of our class classes that the task service impl class actually depends on. So our... Um, object domain, our selector, our unit of work, all those things. All right, so let's check it out. So we're going to say fflib uh, apex mocks, and you can, of course, name this whatever you like. Is call, is a, let's make a new instance of the apex mocks class. Boom. Now, we need to basically create a fake version of our class. So let's see how we do that. For our unit of work, we'll say fflib um, s object unit of work equals a mock oh, unit of work. That's equal to our, mm, there it is, mocks.mock efflib s object in a unit of work class. So without going into extremely great detail, basically what this does is it says we want to mock, create a fake instance of this fflib s object unit of work class, right? That's effectively what we're doing. We're creating a fake instance of this s object unit of work class, and then we're assigning it to an actual instance of a unit of work, which is pretty cool. Now we're going to do that for the other classes that we are also going to leverage here, which is the um, cases domain or the case domain. Cases mock case domain equals cases mocks dot mock. Again, here we're making the through that mocks.mock .mock call, we are making our fake uh, instance of the class. And we're going to do that one more time for the selector layer. 
So we'll call this a mock case selector and set that equal to case selector mox dot mock case selector dot class. Oh. Okay. I'll just do that. Okay. So now we have a mock version of all of the classes that the task service impl depends on. Our S object domain class. So our our cases domain is what would dynamically get instantiated here. Our selector layer and our unit of work. The next thing that we need to do after we create the mock instances of these classes is create basically fake returns from these classes. So from these classes methods. So whenever the class that we're really testing, this task service impl class, whenever the class that we're really testing actually calls these fake classes methods, something is returned um, to them. So let's check out how to do that. Creating fake return results from methods is called stubbing. So what you'll see next is us creating stubs for our classes or for our classes methods. So we're going to say mox dot start stubbing. And just to be super safe, I always do this immediately where I say mox dot stop stubbing because you need a start stubbing and a stop stubbing. If you don't stop your stubbing, you'll be in trouble. Things won't work. So we want um, two calls here, one to start stubbing, one to stop stubbing. And now what we're going to do is for these fake versions of our classes here, we're going to create fake return results for those classes by using what's called stubbing. So <clears throat> the next thing that we'll do is we'll say, uh, this gets a little confusing, so bear with me. I'll try and explain it the best I can. We'll say mox win mock case selector dot s object type then then return case dot s object type all right so let's just break this down basically what we're saying is for our mock class when for sorry for our mocked classes when the mock case selectors s object type method is called we need to return the case s object type that's all it's saying so effectively what will happen is when this method gets called by the task service impl class it will just immediately return this result of case s object type if I wanted it to return a count as object type, then I could do that. Um, the code won't operate in this case. Well, it could, depending on our scenario. But um, Anyway, so that's all it's doing. It's saying when we call this method, then return this value, more or less. So the next thing that we'll want to do is set these fake returns up for everything. So we'll say when <clears throat> mock case selector dot select s objects by ID case IDs then return our case list. So in this instance, when we call the select s object by IDs by IDs with the case IDs, these guys that we set up these fake this fake um, set of case IDs then we should return our case list so that fake case list we set up <clears throat> so now this basically um, this mocked class is prepped to respond when this select s object by ID method is called to return a case list if these case IDs are passed to it. 
right? Uh, again, <clears throat> we're just setting up fake return results for these different methods that are called by our class that we're truly testing. So we'll keep working through these. <clears throat> um, I like to indent these. There's no reason that you need to, but um, I, I just like things in a very particular way, I guess. Select S object or select records for tasks <clears throat> is eventually called. Then return our case list again. And oh my gosh, I just used spaces. Then mox dot when mock case domain dot s object type. Turn case dot s object type slowly but surely we'll make our way through this um, this one okay actually this next one that I'm gonna do um, we should talk through a little bit all right so a couple things that are important here if you're using the apex common library um, when you initialize a selector class, it's going to call this S object type. If you're doing it through the, well, actually we'll come back to this. <laughs> Let me go one step at a time. But basically, you're going to need to mock these two methods, regardless of if your class that you're actually um, testing implements these methods like outright. <clears throat> There's some stuff in the background that fires these two methods for the case selector or for the selector layer um, Just to prep it for what might come in the future or what it needs information about in the future and then this uh, Case domain or sorry the domain layer. It's also going to need you to prep this s object type um Class, or sorry method here so <clears throat> make sure that you do that if you're using those layers and you're using the apex common framework or else you're going to get a bunch of weird errors that say hey this method had no return result and I'm getting no and you'll end up getting no pointers everywhere if you don't stub these three methods that I have here <clears throat> very important stuff extremely frustrating if you've used apex mocks and you're like what the hell is happening right now <laughs> why am I getting null pointers everywhere when I try to use uh, apex mocks with um, apex common but that's really it those those are the these three weird um, these three weird um, methods I guess they're not really weird if you go look at the code but these three methods have to be stubbed or you're gonna get null pointers and be very frustrated and I just did it again okay um, the last stubbing scenario that I want to show you guys is how to um, basically create fake exceptions being thrown right and this is super useful because in regular test classes in integration tests ones where you don't fake return results or anything like that this can be borderline impossible sometimes to test all of the exception handling that you might be doing. So one great example that I like to bring up is every once in a while there are scenarios where you actually have to catch record locking errors. You know, there's there's just nothing else you can do except for prep your code for the scenario where it might every once in a while hit a record locking error. And if you're trying to test for that, it's basically impossible to reproduce. So um, Mocking comes in a lot of handy when you have to deal with like testing that yeah my Exception that I'm theoretically gonna throw have thrown at some point is gonna be caught And I'm gonna actually handle it the way I anticipate it. So the way that we do that Well, I'll show you two different ways one for a Method that returns void to you and then one that actually returns results like the ones that we've been looking at here just uh, these guys uh, but let's take a look at how to throw a fake error or stub a fake error 
explore a, a void method first because this one is is very <laughs> confusing. It took me a, a little bit of time to figure out, to be honest with you. Um, and again, I don't think that's because this is all that confusing. Actually, it's just more because there's not a ton of like excellent documentation on this library. So, if I am doing um, error, wanting to throw a fake error on a method that returns a void, I'll do mox do throw win, and then I'll pass it the exception that I want to throw. And the um, class that I'm going to be doing this throw, 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 error throwing situation. My gosh, can I speak today? I'm not really sure. And then at the end here, I'm going to call commit work. All right, I think. I maybe did this right. FFLib S object unit of work. I'm not sure why it doesn't think it knows what this is. Um, unless I just initialized it wrong. No, there we go. I typed something wrong. Um, so basically, what we're doing is we are casting this mock, this mock version of our class, uh, telling it that when um, this class is called we want to throw this exception and specifically we want to throw that exception when the commit work uh, method is being called so this is a very confusing setup and I'm not gonna go into the technical details of it because it would take a while to explain at least from me and basically what you need to know here is you need to call the mox method or use the the apex mox instance that you have mox right this guy and on it you need to call the do throw win method throw whatever except pass in whatever exception you think you want to throw pass in the mock class that this is relevant for then you need to cast this as a whatever the object is you're basically eventually going to come back with so for us for a unit of work that's fflib s object unit of work if it was the case selector it would be case selector in here then you wrap this whole thing in parentheses and call the commit work class or commit work method in the mock unit of work class this is super confusing but basically this stubbing situation going on here records that more or less when you call the mock unit of work class and you decide to call the commit work method it's going to throw a DML exception. Let's just make it simplified like that. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Just worry about the fact that when you call this met when you call this commit work method it's now going to throw a DML exception. Cool. <laughs> the other stuff is considerably less confusing. Oh my gosh, I don't know why I like to do that when I'm doing videos. Um, it's pretty much the same as the other stuff. So if you're actually, if you actually have a return for your method, this is way less confusing to do. You just say mox win. We'll say um, mock case selector dot select uh, well, oh it did domain mock case selector dot select records for tasks then you just say then throw and then you could do a new DML exception or whatever exception it is you wanted to do so this is way simpler right if you're returning something from your method and you want to throw an error this is a lot more straightforward of a, a setup. But if it's void, you've got to do this weird, weird thing. So I just wanted to point that out because it is kind of confusing, especially 
if you've not done mocking a lot, especially even if you do this in a, other mocking frameworks, I think this I will say is one of the more confusing setups for for this scenario, but it still works just as well. So, um, okay, so we've got everything set up. I'm going to comment this line out because I don't want that to actually run. And the next thing that we're going to do is see how we use Apex, or really how we use mocking with the uh, application factory class that we set up way back in episode three and four. This is when we talked about this guy, the application factory, unit of work factory, all that kind of magical stuff. Uh, if you're using the Apex Common Library, you have this at your disposal to use, and it is well worth the time and investment to use it. It makes your code very abstract, and um, it's just a magical thing. <laughs> um, so we're going to see how to set it up using the application class. And it's pretty easy, right? Uh, we'll just say application dot unit of work dot set mock, and we'll set the mock with the mock unit of work that we created up top here. That guy, and that's it. Um, you're going to do that for each of your layers. So you'd say application dot um, selector dot set mock mock selector same situation for each layer that you're wanting to set a mock for mock case domain and then what will happen is whenever these get called over here in the create tasks method that we're we're going to end up testing in the task service impl class you're going to have this call return to you a mock that's this new instance is just going to return a mock instance of the class that you've set up for it here. And that's it. Pretty simple. Uh, if you didn't watch the last episode, uh, you should, because you can see how much easier this makes it for your class setup than if you had to do dependency injection in every single class. If you don't use this application factory that that we've set up here, then you have to do dependency injection for all your classes and it requires a bunch of um, restructuring and stuff like that not that this doesn't but uh, it's just you know it's a lot of extra work I guess than going down this path so a couple things I want to point out you need to make your fake data that you want to use first then you need to make the fake mock instances of your class then you need to make the fake returns, basically, for your class's methods that will be called. And then, and only after those are all set up, do you set the mocks in your application uh, class. If you do this before the stubbing, then these stubs will not be a part of these mocks that you set up. And you'll be very confused and frustrated. So make sure it's in this particular order or you might be pretty sad eventually. <laughs> Very frustrated. All right, so we are faking a an error being thrown. So I just want to set this up to deal with it. If you've never done um, errors being thrown, or you know, testing for errors to be thrown, then I guess you wouldn't know that you should probably wrap that in a try catch because when you call the class it's actually going to throw the error and you know bomb but uh, if you're testing for an error throwing situation make sure that you wrap your actual method call in a try catch so what we're about to do next is actually do the real test for our real non fake or non mocked class and that will be the task service impl dot oh wait I need to do sorry new task service impl dot, dot create tasks and I'll pass it my whatever I call that case IDs case IDs cool and then I will do a test 
dot stop test in catch catch our exception and we will assert that we actually threw the exception that we wanted to so we are throwing a real exception even though it's you know faked so we still want to know right that e is an instance of the dml exception that we said we wanted to throw um, so we'll assert that and figure out if it is if it isn't it'll fail and cry and say you know get it together this method also takes an s object type so i'm going to add that there and the next thing that we're going to do well actually before we get into the verification methods in apex mocks and how you can verify that methods were called or they weren't called and a lot of other cool stuff let's just go over or let's just test this and see if it works hopefully it does but you know as we've seen plenty of times when I code in front of you all you never know what's gonna happen <laughs> so we'll run this test see if it works out and it did which is cool um, and so what does that mean exactly it means that all of these methods were stubbed successfully that um, our assertion down here actually worked uh, we can further prove that by saying system debug we're whoa, we're oh boy no, I'm gonna keep this simple we're catching <laughs> since my fingers can't type an exception and save this and run it again just to prove that our error throwing is actually occurring and hopefully somewhere in here we are catching an exception right and uh, I've also got some other things in here for debugging but that's less important so you can see that we actually caught an exception but you know if we commented out this line and decided we didn't want to actually catch that exception anymore then we could run this test again and we're not going to have caught that exception right no more exception in the debug logs uh, which you can hopefully see no exception caught this time so uh, pretty cool stuff that you have the ability to to mock all this stuff out and you know throw these fake exceptions if you wanted to or needed to rather so the next thing that we are going to check out are the uh, different ways that you can verify that methods were called that um, things were done so we'll look at verification matchers and um, counters which are pretty cool so let's start with uh, something simple we'll say maybe we want to test to make sure that in this 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 uh, unit test scenario that a method was not called we will say cases maybe we want to make sure that a, a method on our um, domain class was not called <clears throat> so we'll say cases mocks verify so right now we're going to verify on our mock case domain that we never called this method and uh, let's see what method should we call here handle after insert we should have never called the handle after insert method right that definitely shouldn't have happened so hopefully it didn't and if this setup here is called a counter so I'm, right now I'm saying I I'm hopefully never calling this class if I or sorry this method in this class and if I did then 
there's probably something wrong. I can also, for counters, add descriptions that say, hey, you weren't supposed to call this class, bruh. <laughs> and then when, when I get, when, you know, if I accidentally call this class, or call this method, call this method, my goodness. If I accidentally call this method, um, then it's gonna, in the error logs down here, give me that description or in the log files, rather. It's gonna give me that description, so it's a little easier, maybe, for me to figure that out. Figure out what's gone wrong, anyway. The next thing I wanna do is verify that we actually called the register dirty method, which we should, um, because we've got a register dirty call here for cases. Uh, not to mention in the create tasks, uh, well, actually in create tasks, we don't do that. It we would call the uh, register new. So we want to make sure that because we're an instance of cases, that we actually had that register dirty method called. So let's check that out and make sure that that actually happened. And to do that, we're going to set this up in a very similar way where we say fflib. Uh, I s object unit of work mox dot verify not verifying but verify that for the mock unit of work class we called it mock times we called it once and <clears throat> and we want to register dirty method with the case list. So what is this doing? Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty similar. We're just saying that for this uh, mock unit of work class, we only called this register dirty class with the case list attached to it or sent to it one time that's it so that what that mox times is is just the amount of times it was called um, <clears throat> there's also a bunch of other things you could do uh, like less than I think it's something along these lines let me double check my uh, notes here and give you all the other it's like, oh, that's what it is. There's at least, you could say it's called at least once, or you could, you know, you could say at most once, or three times, or 20 times. Um, you could say mocks between one and five times, or something like that. So um, there's a bunch of different ways to use the counters, I guess. Typically, the only two that I use are times and never, though, if I'm being completely honest. I very rarely, if ever, use this whole um, between situation, or the at most or at least. <clears throat> anyway, that's what this mocks times does. It says, for the mock unit of work, let's verify that the register dirty uh, method was called one time with the case list attached to it. Cool. And you could also add a description here if you wanted to. I'm not going to, to maybe save you a few minutes. And last but not least, let's uh, do a verification on the create task method, the kind of star of the show, hopefully. And we'll say mox dot verify mock domain is called mox dot times one. It's also worth noting you don't technically have to do this. If you leave that blank, it's going to assume you only wanted it to be called once. And if it gets called more than once, it'll complain. And if not, it'll be cool. You also have the option to just do that. 
and uh, then you don't have to use that mocks.times setup either. Got a bunch of different options if you want to use them. And we'll call the create task method <clears throat> and pass it the case list and the mock unit of work. So, pending everything goes okay, and we've mocked this out the way that we wanted it to be mocked out, these uh, should all come back true. But I will show you in a second what would happen if they failed. You know, pending I didn't screw something up already. So we'll save this, and as soon as it's saved, we'll run this. Oh boy, I guess I clicked something quick enough. Uh, so it ran that test. I'm going to run it one more time since that was super fast. But it ran that test and seemed to handle it okay. So it looks like all of our verifications were good. But say, for instance, this one that I wanted to call never, I called it once. I wanted to see if I called it once. Um, or rather, I expected it to be called once. But it shouldn't have ever been called, and it isn't. So in the case that that happens, what you'll end up seeing is the case uh, or sorry, this test method fails. And it's failing because it expected a count of one, but we actually only called this method zero times, right? And we got our description back that says, hey, you weren't supposed to call this method, bruh. <laughs> right? Um, so in the case that one of these actually does fail, you will your test will actually fail. And um, you know, you'll get some information about what it was expecting as opposed to what it actually did find for the handle after insert method, right? Pretty cool stuff. All right, so one last thing that I want to go over. Uh, there's a lot of other cool things in Apex Mocks, but one more thing that I want to go over is the matching that you can do with Mocks, and it's a, kind of a confusing name, if I'm being totally honest with you. Um, it's a little confusing, but it's very useful. Uh, there's a lot of things in mocks that are that are useful, but they have a little less like you know benefit to them than this. But this one is a um, pretty pretty powerful thing, I think. And I don't think a lot of people that even use this actually know how to use matching. So let's go over this. If we go back to my task service implementation class, back up here, you can see that if I'm a list of cases before I actually um, call this register dirty method in the unit of work I'm supposed to have updated the subject from whatever it is to buy right and I'm only doing this as an example for the, for this um, video but uh, <clears throat> you'll notice that I'm verifying that I called this with the case list, right? This case list up here. And that's fine and wonderful, but the subject is high. And I changed it to buy up here. So the question is, I guess, how do I know for sure that by the time this register dirty method was called here, that I actually had the subject updated, right? And that's where matchers comes in. Because what it allows you to do is, is uh, identify whether or not you could verify that the class, or sorry, the method in this unit of work class uh, was called with that updated information. So let's, let me just show you how this works. You have to basically create a new list of cases, and uh, we'll, we'll call it the case matching list. And we'll set it equal to a list of case. And we'll call the fflib underscore match s object with and we're going to pass this a, uh, well, we're going to pass it a list 
with a map in it, basically. So we'll say new list map schema dot s object field to object and then we are going to create this map which I think we need one more bracket for all right uh, sk skimda new list map schema s object field object let's make sure I didn't do anything too crazy nope 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 I just need to now in here say new map s object field object oh boy all right I think that's it <laughs> we'll see if I screwed this up um, okay so what does this do exactly this is going to basically record a matching scenario um, for eh, how do I say this in regular words this is always the tricky part basically this is this matcher that we're creating this this thing right here is going to allow us to pass in to this verification method down here <clears throat> this updated you know this updated list of cases that is that are going to have the actual values that they should have by the time that uh, register dirty method is called so let's just give it a shot see what we get here I'm gonna say oops, mock case ID and this should be case dot subject equals by case dot status equals new case dot origin equals or is map to email really all right let's see what I messed up here if anything fflib match s object with new list map schema s object field object boom, boom. new map of s object field object I think we're good I think it's just confused we'll save it and see who's right and who's wrong probably me but me uh, what is it complaining about method does not exist or oh correct yes objects with Whew. it's a tricky one <laughs> all right so you can see that more or less what we're doing is creating a case that has these fields mapped with these values so the case ID is mapped to the to the mock case ID um, case subject is mocked with the uh, or is mapped to this by which is what it should end up with here and then we've got status origin etc and now what we can do is here where we look for this register dirty method and verify that it was called once we can also verify now that it was called after the updates happened, right? Uh, before we weren't really like verifying that this was that this was indeed called after the updates happened. Um, now we can do that. So um, before I move on, I want to, or before I press the test button and and we watch this fail, I want to explain what's about to happen next. Um, matchers are great, but they're a little bit frustrating, at least with this library. Um, <laughs> or maybe I just have a misunderstanding, and someone feel free to, to, to correct me if I'm wrong here. But because this um, verification call here is using now a matcher, right, this matcher that we've defined, 
these other um, verification methods are going to fail. And they're going to fail because I'm not using matchers in them. Um, so if I run this now, you should see, yeah, you'll see a complain about the fact that I'm not using matchers. It's going to tell me that somewhere in here, the number of matchers defined does not match the number of expected. If you're using matchers, all arguments must be passed in as matchers. Blah, 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 blah. And it gives you an example and some stuff. Now, you'll notice that if I comment out these two methods um, that aren't using matchers, and I save this, then if I run this again, it'll be good to go. <laughs> So if you are using matchers, um, just know that uh, while they are very useful, they can make your other verification methods fail. So um, normally, to be honest, a lot of the time I will split these into different things. If I need a matcher scenario, I'll put it in its own unit, unit test method um, to make it a little easier on myself. But um, now you can see, like, so if I change this and I passed in the matcher high, which is what we were looking for before, right? It'll tell me, uh, no, that's incorrect because it was actually modified before then, right? So now I'm putting in the word high, which, as you can see, originally is what it was declared as up here. But our test method failed because the matcher was like, nope. Uh, the actual arguments were subject by, and you passed in a subject of high. So it does indeed verify, despite the minor frustration, that um, you know we actually updated this those cases before we called this register dirt method as we expected over here right so pretty cool stuff um, now this is definitely by no means the only stuff in apex mocks there's a lot and I mean a lot of useful stuff in here um, so if you want any more information about apex mocks then definitely head over to this uh, wiki page that I've made for it in this uh, Salesforce separation of concerns in the Apex Common Library Git repo. And it's got more information on a whole bunch of other things. Um, so, you know, more information on stubbing, which we went over earlier, uh, verification methods, ma matchers, which we just went over, um, exceptions being thrown, how to mock those, answering, I did not feel like I needed to write up a new thing. There is a pretty good blog post about answering that I've linked out here, how to check method call order. Also, there was a surprisingly good um, blog post about that, so I'm linking you out there so you can get more information about method call order if you want to check that your methods were called in order A, B, C, D, E. Uh, more information on counters and more information on how to generate fake data in different situations. So, uh, and then there's of course this impl test that we just built together that is in this library too that you can reference later. So, lots of good stuff. If you're lost or you want to learn more about Apex Mox, it's all in here. I hope, at least the majority of it. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully you guys find it useful. That I think <laughs> finally wraps up this series and uh, you can go on with your life and I can go on with my life and it's great two months of work finally over <laughs> alright guys uh, I hope you enjoyed this video I hope you enjoyed the series hopefully it has helped you on uh, in multiple areas you know what separation of concerns is, how to use the Apex Common Library, different patterns that are useful um, to you for not just the Apex Common Library, but other places, mocking, whatever else. 
all that kind of stuff. Hopefully it helped. Um, I know I learned plenty. So, uh, anyway, guys, that's it. Thanks for sticking with me. If you really watched every single one of these episodes, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. So, I will see you all in the next regular episode because I don't think I'm doing a series for a while. <laughs> all right. See you guys later.